The Committee of Finance is hereby called to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, can I have a roll call, please? Senator Marvin A. Blyden. Senator Blyden, absent. No, he, he's there in the well. Is he? Okay. Senator Blyden, present. Senator Samuel Carillon. Senator Carillon, absent. Senator Dwayne M. DeGraff. Senator DeGraff, absent. Senator Donna A. Fred Gregory. Senator Fred Gregory, absent. Senator Javon E. James, Sr. Senator James, Sr., present. Senator Janelle K. Saru. Senator Saru, absent. Senator Kurt A. Vialet. Senator Vialet, present. Mr. Chair, you have three present, four absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We're having some technical difficulties, so we're going to take a two-minute recess. The committee stands in recess. Present. The Committee of Finance is back on the record. Uh, Madam Clerk, please mark Senator Donna Fred Gregory as present. Mr. Chair, you have four present, two absent. Thank um, you. You have four present, three absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Can you place any correspondence on the record? Do you have correspondence? Yes, Mr. Chair. You may proceed. The Honorable Kurt A. Vialet, Chairman, Committee on Finance, 34th Legislature of the Virgin Islands, 3022 Estate Golden Rock, St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. Dear Chairman Vialet, Please excuse my absence from today's April 22nd, 2022 Committee on Finance hearing as I am an, unable to attend due to a medical appointment. Therefore, I am respectfully asking that I be excused from today's hearing. Thank you for your consideration and understanding. Sincerely, Samuel Carillon, Senator, 34th Legislature of the Virgin Islands. Please mark Senator Carrion as excuse. Mr. Chair, you have four present, two absent, one excused. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I'm going to ask that you repeat the roll call. Um, we were not, they were not hearing on St. Thomas, so the court reporter when I was not able to record the data. So please I'll call the roll call again. Repeat the roll call. No, with the names. Okay. Senator Marvin A. Blyden. Senator Blyden, present. Senator Samuel Carillon, excused. Senator Dwayne M. DeGraff, absent. Senator Donna A. Fred Gregory, present. Here. Senator Fred Gregory, present. Senator Javon E. James, Sr., Senator Javon E. James, Sr., present. Senator Janelle K. Saro. Senator Saro, absent. Senator Kurt A. Vialet. Here. Senator Vialet, present. Mr. Chair, you have four present, two absent, one excused. Okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. You may proceed and read the agenda into the record. 
the Committee on Finance for Friday, April 22nd, 2022, in the Fritz E. Lewetz Legislative Conference Room, Christiansted St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. The Committee on Finance will consider the following. In Block 1, the Committee on Finance will receive a status update from the Virgin Islands Public Finance Authority on the Special Purpose Vehicle Utilization of the Internal Revenue Matching Fund Bond Offering. Invited testifiers, Nathan Simmons, Director of Finance and Administration, Virgin Islands Public Finance Authority. In Block 2, Bill Number 34-0205, an act amending Title 33, Virgin Islands Code, Chapter 111, relating to the Virgin Islands Veterans Emergency Transportation Fund to make health care more accessible to veterans in the Virgin Islands by enacting the Veterans Medical Transportation Act, proposed by Senator Stephen D. Payne, Sr. Invited testifiers, Patrick Farrell, Director, Office of Veterans Affairs. Jennifer O'Neill, Director, Office of Management and Budget. Harry Daniel, Private Citizen, Former Director of Veterans Affairs. Joel Gift, Private Citizen, I'm sorry, Private Citizen Veteran. John Schulzebrandt, Private Citizen Veteran. Bill number 34-0226, an act amending Act Numbers 8474, 8479, 8486, 8494, and 8496. And 8498 to adjust the fiscal year 2022 budget to appropriate funds to the Casino Control Commission for capital outlay, WTJX for capital outlay and satellite uplink respectively, elections systems of the Virgin Islands for general election, Virgin Islands Cricket Board, Department of Tourism for personnel and fringe benefits, Virgin Islands Board of Nurse Licensure for Personnel and Fringe Benefits and 8% Salary Restoration, Social Security, and Medicare Taxes Reimbursement to the Economic Development Authority, Governor Wong F. Louis Hospital and Medical Center, and the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority, proposed by Senators Kurt A. Vialet and Donna A. Fred Gregory. Invited testifiers, Jennifer O'Neill, Director, Office of Management and Budget. Bill number 34-0197, an act amending Title 33, Virgin Islands Code, Subtitle 1, Part I, Chapter 3, Section 43, Subsection E, relating to the submittal of bills or invoices that separately state gross receipt taxes to account for the receipt and distribution of federal assistance to the government of the Virgin Islands and related payments to its contractors, proposed by Senator Marvin A. Blyden. Invited testifiers, Dana Clendenin, Interim Executive Director, Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority. Joel Lee, Director, Virgin Islands Bureau of Internal Revenue. Adrian Dudley, Partner, Dudley Rich, LLP, Scott Edelman, Sr., Senior Vice President, AECOM, John Grant, Chief Financial Officer, APTIM, Geraldine McGrath, Holland, Business Administrative Director, Falcon USVI, Claude Shack Hawkins, Executive Director, Polaris Engineering Company, Miguel Quinones, Managing Partner, Island Services Group. Charisma Elian, Disaster Recovery Specialist, AECOM. And Dr. Rashida Harris, Chief Operating Af Officer, Impact Construction. Mr. Chair, this concludes the reading of today's agenda. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And good afternoon to the people of the Virgin Islands. Good afternoon, colleagues, and good afternoon to the testifiers. 
Uh, we're going to change the agenda a bit. Uh, Mr. Nathan Simmons of the Public Finance Authority um, he sent us no notice that he has a personal emergency and won't be able to provide testimony or answer questions. However, he did um, send us a testimony and we're going to read it at the end of this particular meeting along with some additional correspondence that we requested. So at this point, we're going to hear bill number 34-0205. So I'm asking those individuals on the island of St. Thomas that will be providing testimony that they be escorted into the well. And we're going to take a one minute recess to get that set. This committee stands in recess for one minute.
the Committee of Finance is back on the record. We're going to hear bill number 34-0205. Who speaks to this bill? Before I go um, to the sponsor of this particular Morning. measure. Morning, Mr. Chair. I am afternoon and present. Okay, thank you so much. Madam Clerk will mark Senator Saru as present. I'm going to have a point of information by Senator James before I proceed to offering of this measure. And Senator DeGraff is also uh, present. Yes, uh, good, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman, for the point of information. I'm a bit curious here when it comes to the bill before us, Bill number 34-0205. I just want to know at some point if an amendment will be offered in the Committee on Finance or the Committee on Rules and Judiciary, because based on the drafter's note, it is saying a veteran's bur burial fund has not been codified in the Virgin Islands Code. Its existence is unclear, so I just need at some point for somebody to clarify that if we pass in a measure that speaks to a fund that doesn't exist. So I just want to place that on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Senator James, the sponsor of the bill, can speak to that particular concern. Senator Stephen Payne, you recognize for bill number 34-0205. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the time, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Good, good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, me for one quick second. I thought we were number two on the block. Okay. Uh, I introduced bill number 34, that's 0205, an act amending title 33, Virgin Islands Code, chapter 111, relating to the Virgin Islands Veterans Emergency Transportation Fund to make healthcare more accessible to veterans in the Virgin Islands by enacting the Veterans Medical Transportation Act, proposed by yours truly, Senator Stephen DePayne, Sr. Colleagues and Senator, um, co sponsored by Senator Marvin Blyden. Colleagues, I am introducing this measure as I have personally spoken with several veterans, some locally and some who reside on the mainland, in order to ascertain to what extent, if any, if they experience the same treatment as it relates to their medical treatment and or services received. As a veteran who is from the Virgin Islands, is no less of a veteran when compared to a veteran who was born on the U.S. mainland. Whereas clauses in this measure speaks volumes. Whereas the veterans of the Virgin Islands have sacrificed their bodies in service and to the benefit of all the residents of the Virgin Islands and as well as the United States. Whereas the veterans who reside in the Virgin Islands do not enjoy the benefit of having a VA hospital or medical facility in the territory. Whereas the lack of a qualified Veterans Administration VA hospital or medical facility in the territory creates unique challenges for veterans for them to um, access critical health care. Whereas the VA hospital in Puerto Rico also presents unique challenges in helping our veterans gain access to quality health care due to language barriers, a shortage of critical staff in certain medical disciplines, complaints about how patients from the Virgin Islands are treated, the extended length of time required to secure and receive appointments, and the reality that Puerto Rico, like the Virgin Islands, has previously been hit by natural disasters that rendered the VA hospital and the medical facilities inoperable. Whereas the veterans who reside in the Virgin Islands, they deserve to have healthcare options that are equal to their mainland counterparts in terms of being able to access choices based on what they determine is best for their specific needs. This measure simply seeks to address two concerns. One, separating the funding for the veterans medical services that were lumped into one fund that will make it much more easier for the Director of Veterans Affairs or his or her designee to track how the funds are being spent, as well as having an accurate accounting of expenditures and fund balances. And two, giving our veterans the opportunity to seek medical treatment with a physician at a facility of their choice, 
by providing a refund for an airline ticket only, only after they have provided all pertinent paperwork that verifies that they have a scheduled medical appointment at a VA hospital on the mainland. Those who require to use services at Puerto Rico, they could still go to Puerto Rico if they see fit. All of us know the importance of having a doctor who knows your medical history so that when there are changes in your medical condition, your main health care provider can immediately address your health care concern because he or she is very familiar with you as their patient. We also know the importance of having family members close to you when you need medical attention. The veterans are simply asking to seek services in a state where they have a family member residing where they can stay for an extended period if necessary. What the military did to our veterans was either an oversight or maybe they are not aware that Puerto Ricans and Virgin Islands speak different languages. They assigned our veterans to seek medical services at a VA hospital in Puerto Rico where the primary language is not English. Imagine if you had to travel to a medical facility where the doctor spoke a language that you didn't speak and you couldn't communicate the exact symptoms that you were experiencing. Well, colleagues, one of the main cries when it comes to our veterans is not being able to communicate with the staff in Puerto Rico. Several weeks ago, I received a call where, excuse me, <clears throat> um, a family was in Puerto Rico seeking assistance for a family member. They couldn't find a nurse that spoke English. They reached out to me. I don't speak Spanish, so I called Commissioner Encarnacion. She, in turn, was passionate to the call, and we are transferred almost 15 times to different persons and stations in the, in the, in the, in the hospital. And every time they said, no habla inglés, un momento, we couldn't get through. So she had to hang up and call somebody in Washington to relay the information to them so they could be passionate to the call to offer them assistance. Those are some of the things that our veterans go through. Another cry is having to wait sometimes for months to be seen as certain specialists do not reside in Puerto Rico and they have to be flown in from time to time. I'll let you hear from one of the testifiers about his experience uh, with not being able to be seen in a, by a specialist in a timely manner that almost caused him his life. Mr. Chair and colleagues, I am hopeful that at the end of this hearing today, that you all can see fit to support this measure on behalf of our beloved veterans who have been fighting for healthcare services for what seems like all of their lives after serving a country that they love. My staff has already reached out to um, to legal counsel to, to the to council for the amendment to, um, to address the funding the, the, fund, the funding source, and we have an amendment coming forward today that will be able to address that issue. We've spoken to legal counsel as well as as well as OMB. So that will be forthcoming today as an amendment to be to be brought forward. Mr. Chair and colleagues, thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Senator Payne. Uh, we'll now go to the testifiers. We have uh, Mr. Director Farrell, um, who's here with us. And we're also supposed to have um, OMB Director Jennifer O'Neill, she is on in the chambers. Uh, Mr. Daniel, Mr. Giff, and Mr. Schulterbrand. So I'll begin with those individuals who are in the well on St. Thomas, if you can put your name and title on the record. Starting with Ms. O'Neill and then going straight across. Good afternoon, Jennifer O'Neill, Director, Office of Management and Budget. Next. Joel Giff, veteran. Next. In the chambers in St. Thomas? That's it, Mr. Chair. Okay. Isn't there three individuals there? There's only two plus me, so three in total. <laughs> I only heard two names. I heard Mr. Giff and yourself. Who's the who's next person? Mr. Schulterbrand. Mr. Schulterbrand didn't put his name Mr. on the record. Mr. Schulterbrand. My mic now. Thank you, and Director? Good morning, Director Farrell. 
Office of Veterans Affairs. And thank you so much. I think <laughs> of the veterans that are there, only one person have, has a testimony, and that's Mr. Giff. So, Mr. Giff, I'm Mr. going to Giff and Mr. Schulteburn. Mr. Schulteburn, do you have a written testimony? No, I don't. Okay, so you will be there to answer questions. So I'm going to allow Mr. Giff to put his written testimony on the record. Mr. Giff? Good morning, Honorable Kurt Bailey, Senator Pres uh, Senators that is present this committee finance, the sponsor of the bill, Senator at Large, Stephen Payne Sr., co sponsor, uh, Mr. Ma the Senator Marvin Blyden, and the other members of the 34th legislature, other testifiers and listeners and viewing audience. My name is Joel Giff. I was born and raised right here in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. I'm the last of four siblings. I attended Charlotte Amali High School, and in 1968, I was drafted into the United States Army. And I'll mention at the age of 18, a little child. During my military tour in Vietnam, I contact, <clears throat> got in contact with Agent Orange and suffered from its painful effect to this very day. I returned back home in 1970, worked with my father, James Giff, and his company, James Giff and Sons, learned the trade of plumbing, heavy equipment. As I had just been being back on the rock, I, due to these injuries, I incur, incur overseas in war. My statues was service-connected. I utilized a veteran health care in 1970 to San Juan, Puerto Rico. I also had treatment in Atlanta, New York, and Miami. I'm here this morning to thank Senator Payne Sr. and his staff for assisting the veterans here in the territory in the past in the quest to obtain medical travel benefits. I'm in support of this bill 340205, which enabled the veterans to go to the mainland to serve medical serve for medical treatment that they need. All US veterans on the mainland have multiple options available to find the right VA facility that meets their unique health care needs. <clears throat> I would like to say that right here, before I go a little farther with my, tes with my testimony, um, I didn't read, this was not written, but I've been going to my, uh, San Juan Puerto Rico Veteran Hospital from 1970. I end up with a situation where they did not have the facility to take care of my needs. And they suggest that I go to Miami, Florida. I went there, got into the, the, the treatment, and I did well. It was such a difference to be among the health care, doctors, nurses, hospital facility that speaks my language. I understand what they were saying to me. They kept me in that program. I'm still a member of that program to continue to treat me. I would interject right here, I am suffering Suffer rain from Agent Orange. This is chemicals that they sprayed on me and have messed my life completely up. I just came out of the hospital three weeks ago with my third stroke. Yes, third. Don't look at this body and thinking that it didn't, it's not going through stuff. The good Lord has been taking good care of me to keep me looking good, but not, I'm not I'm still suffering from Agent Ari. I get the best care for this problem in Miami, 
veteran hospital. I'm not going to outside help. I'm still in a veteran <clears throat> in a veteran facility. I would like to interject here also. That I, I miss, told Mr. Mr. Gift, one, one second, you need to. I am hurting. Mr. Gift? And I need to go to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Mr. Gift. I don't want to go there. Mr. Gift. I prefer going to Miami. Mr. Giff, you need to go back yes. to your written testimony. I'm sure in the phase of questioning that you'll be able to put a lot of those concerns on the record. But we do have a written testimony before us, yes, if you can conclude All right, with the testimony. But you have access to the clinics here in both districts. But those clinics are not equipped to handle serious medical treatment for veterans who suffer from chronic issues like myself. Because there's no veteran hospital in the territory, the Federal Office of Veterans Affairs designate Puerto Rico, San Juan, that they will do the treatment for the veterans in the Virgin Islands because of its closest proximity. But veterans residing here can go to any veteran hospital of their choosing to get treatment for their needs. Veterans have encountered many issues over the years in their treatment in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Language barrier, delay of appointments, lack of specialists prone to suffer from disaster from weather events, and chronic transportation issue from Puerto Rico VA hospital. This bill will help all veterans who have risked their lives to have an option for their medical treatment because we serve to deserve. I'm here to answer any question that you may have. To God be the glory and all veterans' lives matter. Thank you, sir. And thank you so much, Mr. Giff. Director O'Neill, you may proceed. Good day, Chairman Kurt Viole and other members of the Committee on Finance of the 34th Legislature of the U.S. Virgin Islands, other senators present, and members of the listening and viewing audience. I am Jennifer O'Neill, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and I appear pursuant to your invitation to testify on Bill Number 34-0205, an act amending Title 33, Virgin Islands Code, Chapter 111, relating to the Virgin Islands Veterans Emergency Transportation Fund to make healthcare more accessible to veterans in the Virgin Islands by enacting the Virgin Islands Medical Transportation Act. This bill calls for $150,000 to be appropriated from the Veterans Burial Fund to the Veterans Medical Transportation Fund, currently known as the Veterans Emergency Transportation Fund. It is important to note that there is no fund established by any legislative body known as the Veterans Burial Fund. However, Act 8474 does appropriate $450,000 from the general fund to the Office of Veteran Affairs to address medical and burial expenses for veterans. This amount is available until expended, and thus far, $212,774 has been expended and there remains $237,226 for this line item. Given that these funds were budgeted for the purpose of medical and burial expenses, the allocation of these funds to a medical transportation fund would be in line with the intended use of said appropriation. However, please note that as this was the original intent of these funds, and per a cursory review of the expenses to date, this is in fact what most of the funding is being utilized for in its current state. As such, segmenting $150,000 only for this particular purpose may not be a sufficient amount, and I would encourage additional analysis to identify what is necessary to execute the goals of this effectively. Mr. Chair, this concludes my testimony, and I remain available to answer any questions that you may have.
Thank you, Director O'Neill. Director Farrell. Honorable Senator Kurt Avelli, Chairman of the Committee on Finance, and other distinguished senators of the 34th Legislature of the Virgin Islands of the United States, a most pleasant good day to you. Additional greetings to all that are physically present, viewing via the legislature's legit TV or their favorite social media outlet. To my comrades in and out of uniform, better known as the veterans of this beloved territory, I say thank you once again for your service to our country and for your continuous unwavering support. Last but certainly not least, pleasant good afternoon to the staff of the Virgin Islands Office of Veterans Affairs, whom I refer to as the pillars of the Virgin Islands Office of Veterans Affairs. I am Patrick D. Farrell, the director of the Virgin Islands Office of Veterans Affairs. Today, I am here to provide testimony on bill number 34-0205, an act amending title 33, Virgin Islands Code, chapter 111, relating to the Virgin Islands Emergency Transportation Fund to make healthcare more accessible to veterans in the Virgin Islands by enacting the Veterans Medical Transportation Act proposed by Senator Stephen D. Payne, Sr. After reading the whereas clauses of this proposed legislation, I feel obligated to bring to the bill sponsor's attention some of the things that I know to be different than stated. These corrections may or may not help those with the authority to vote on this measure in making an informed decision. Line number three through four reads, whereas the veterans who reside in the Virgin Islands do not enjoy the benefit of having a VA hospital or medical facility in the territory. Mr. Chairman, there are two VA medical facilities in the Virgin Islands, one on the island of St. Croix, or on the island of St. Croix, the VA community-based outpatient clinic is housed within the village mall in Barron Spa. On the island of St. Thomas, the CBAC is housed within the Medical Foundation building in Estate Thomas. Line number five through seven reads, whereas the lack of a qualified veterans administration, hospital or medical facility in the territory creates unique challenges for veterans to navigate for them to access critical health care. Mr. Chairman, both VA CBOX within the Virgin Islands are federally certified healthcare facilities. Line number eight through 11 on page one, continued on page two, lines one and two reads. Whereas the VA hospital in Puerto Rico also presents unique challenges in helping our veterans gain access to quality health care due to language barriers, a shortage of critical staff in certain medical disciplines, complaints about how patients from the Virgin Islands are treated, the extended length of time required to secure and receive appointments, and the reality that Puerto Rico, like the Virgin Islands, has previously been hit by natural disasters that rendered the VA hospital and the medical facility inoperable. Mr. Chairman, None of these are isolated to the Virgin Islands. In addition, the Sangwang VA Medical Center is 100% operational currently and has been this way for some time now. Well, this legislation seeks to strike the freeze, provided, however, that disbursements from this fund shall be authorized only when veterans administration funds are not available in paying said transportation costs or when funds made available by the Veterans Administrations are inadequate to cover all or a portion of said costs, as determined by the Director of the Office of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Chairman, I submit to you that the VA Caribbean healthcare system is not perfect. However, their decision to fund the total costs of emergency transportation of any qualified veteran to the closest VA medical facility when the need arises has saved the lives of over 30 veterans of the Virgin Islands. Striking this phrase will create an unnecessary financial burden on the government of the Virgin Islands. This leg legislation also seeks to strike, provided, however, that disbursements from this fund shall be authorized only when veteran administration funds are not available in paying said transportation costs or when funds made available by the Veterans Administration are inadequate to cover all 
or a portion of said costs as determined by the director of the Office of Veterans Affairs. Very often, we speak of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs not owning up to their responsibilities as it relates to our veterans. Here lies a perfect example of them stepping up to the plate. I am not sure why we as a government would want to take over such an obligation from the responsible entity. The current legislation in its unamended form holds this same entity responsible. This legislation also seeks to accomplish the following. The director of the Office of Veterans Affairs shall submit a report semi-annually to the Committee of Finance of the legislature to disclose how funds from the Veterans Medical Transportation Fund were spent from the prior fiscal year and to review the regulations promulgated in conjunction with the commissions of the Department of Finance and the Department of Health as they relate to the Veterans Medical Transportation Fund. Mr. Chairman, the Office of Veterans Affairs, uh, the Office of Veterans Affairs reports this information to the Committee on Finance every year as a part of our budget presentation. Based on my understanding of this legislation, in accordance with page three, line number 11 through 14, also seeks to remove the authority of the Director of Veterans Affairs from being able to craft policies and promulgate rules within the Office of Veterans Affairs. If accomplished, there is no need for a director of this agency. Further, this legislation also seeks to allow the following. Reimbursements of funds is available for medical services received at a veteran hospital in the U.S. mainland and not Puerto Rico. Mr. Chairman, service-connected veterans do not pay for service-connected visits to the hospital. Non-service-connected veterans pay a very minimal cost for medical services, nothing compared to someone outside of the VA. Important to note, currently, any qualified veteran located in the Virgin Islands that is deemed to be needing emergency medical transportation and elects for the United States Department of Veterans Affairs to provide the needed treatment will be transported via air ambulance to the closest VA medical facility, which is the VA Medical Center in San Juan, Puerto Rico. The transportation of any veteran in such a case is funded completely by the United States Department of Veterans Affairs via the VA Caribbean Healthcare System. For situational awareness, a transfer of this kind only takes place after a conversation and agreement of need between the attending emergency room physician on St. Thomas or St. Croix, wherever the situation is taking place, and the administrative officer of the day at the VA Medical Center in San Juan, Puerto Rico. In the event a veteran becomes in need of another level of care, not available at the VA Medical Center in San Juan, the VA Caribbean Healthcare System is the responsible entity for connecting the veteran to that care. I submit to you that the only situation I have known the VA Medical Care in San Juan not being able to handle is trauma situations. If they are presented with such a situation, there is a memorandum of agreement in place between the VA Caribbean Healthcare System and Central Medical in San Juan, Puerto Rico to assume care of that veteran. Central Medical is less than five minutes with traffic from the VA Medical Center in San Juan. Because of the reasons stated earlier in my testimony, I am not in favor of this piece of legislation. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to place my testimony and position on the record as it relates to address bill number 34-0205, an act amending title 33, Virgin Islands Code, chapter 111, relating to the Virgin Islands Veteran Emergency Transportation Fund to make healthcare more accessible to veterans in the Virgin Islands by enacting the Veterans Medical Transportation Act, proposed by Senator Stephen D. Payne Sr. I am available for your questions that you or any other member of this body may have. Thank you. Thank you Thank for your you. testimony. Um, the sponsor of the bill have told me that Mr. Shelterbrandt would like to put something on the record. I'm going to give you a minute and a half, 90 seconds, to put a short statement on the record, uh, Mr. Shelterbrandt. Ready for me? Yes, you yes, may proceed. Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon, Senator Vale, Senator of the Finance Committee, audience, listening, public. 
My name is John E. Schulterbrand. My only issue with this, I, re I really figured that this should have never came to you all after the Senate had put that bill forward. You know, as a veteran, we have been, we are very much disrespected with my government, the Virgin Islands government. And <clears throat> I really feel, to be honest with you, uh, Senator Bailey, that you all got to be very careful how you're dealing with this situation. There are about 10,000 veterans in these Virgin Islands, and we need to be respected. You know, this is not really my issue I want to talk about, because as far as I'm concerned, this is my issue. I had some other issues I wanted to bring up about veterans, how we have been treated in these islands. But you give me a minute and a half or 90 seconds or whatever it was, so I can, <clears throat> I read, can relay that. But I hope that in the near future, the y'all would invite some veterans to really see what the veterans are going through. And for you, um, Director Farrell, you're pretty well out of place. You need, really, a need to have some of the experiences that these veterans are going through. With the sickness and dealing with Puerto Rico, with the long-term appointments, some of us died, some of us was able to make it because we was able to travel out. So you really need to check yourself and stop playing games with the veterans. And if you, the director, push forward for us instead of trying to block us. Thank Time. you. Thank you, Mr. Schulterbrand. The sponsor of this bill, Senator Stephen Payne, is the chair of the committee that has oversight over veterans. So if he wants to call a meeting with veterans um, in the legislature, he has the authority to do such. Uh, the finance deals with bills that are related um, to monies. I just want to... Um, Mr. Chair? Get recognized, point of information. Yes, um, just for your, the edification of the listener of your audience, uh, the Office of Veteran Affairs is not under the purview of the Committee of Homeland Security. That's actually under Senator Joseph's committee. Fine. Thank you so much for uh, that. Government operations. Go thank, government operations, sir. Thank you so much for that correction. So I will restate my statement. If there is a need to have a meeting with, with veterans so that they can get their concerns across, then it falls under government operations, uh, Senator uh, Carla Joseph. Um, but before we begin with a short round of questioning, uh, Senators, you're going to go to a three-minute round. I just want to put it on the record that there is no intention of this committee to disrespect veterans. My father is a veteran. My father-in-law is a veteran. My brother is a veteran. We're having a discussion in reference to the allocation of monies and how we will proceed to make sure that uh, veterans are able to get to be provided with services. So I'll begin with a three minute round and I'll begin with um, Senator Blyden, you recognize. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, my colleagues. Good morning to the viewing and listening audiences, staff, central staff. Good morning, testifiers, and thank you so much for your testimonies. Um, first, I want to commend a sponsor um, the bill for trying to find out to assist um, our veterans when it comes to um, them having a choice of traveling to the medical provider of Ireland that doesn't include Puerto Rico. Uh, I, he I heard the director of Veterans Affairs, Director Farrell, mm -hmm. Good to see him, Director Farrell. Um, I heard his testimony and his concerns um, in respect to the bill, so I'm gonna put my line of questioning all of it to Director Farrell since I only have three minutes. Director, you spoke in respect to um, the VA hospital um, and having that choice here in the St. Thomas District and St. Croix, and that it's federally certified, a federally certified healthcare facility and that they, they, so are you saying they can basically handle any type of situation, including um, Agent Orange? Um, is that what you stated on the record for us? Can you clarify that for me, please? That's uh, not what I said at all, Senator. Can you clarify for me, please? The facilities on St. Thomas and St. Croix are community-based outpatient clinics, 
There is not a hospital, full fledged hospital. There, there is a primary care provider there who could, based on the condition, refer the veterans out for further care. And it, it could mean outside of the territory as well. Very well. I, I think that's what um, the testifier was stating that based on his situation, that he had to go to Miami because he was referred, as you stated, by um, the V in Puerto Rico to go to Miami. So um, let One me ask minute. you then, also based on your testimony, you stated that um, as a result of having those facilities on both islands uh, here for our veterans, you, 30 lives were saved, 30 veteran lives were saved. But at the same time, you, state, you stated also um, in order for individuals to be transported to Puerto Rico or elsewhere, it's based on an agreement and a conversation between both parties? The, this conversation has to take place between two parties, yes. The emergency room physician on either St. Thomas or St. Croix and the doctor at whatever accepting facility uh, the veteran is trying to be medevac to. And that's simply because you must make sure that the services are available at that particular facility that you're trying to medevac the, the veteran to. Time. Based on your, st based on your statement, Mr. Chair, um, basically it's not agreed upon both party and the one say, well, you know, I, I, I don't agree, I'm going, I need to go elsewhere. You're, are, you're basically saying that the VA will not cover that expense? What other situation in terms of the travel? It's not based on the the choice of, of the, well, let me craft my words carefully. The conversation is between two physicians, the physician in the Virgin Islands and the physician that is outside of the territory. The physician outside of the territory basically states whether or not the hospital or the facility has the services to accommodate the medical condition of the veteran. Well, my time was called, but um. Go ahead and ask a question, Senator. Okay, uh, in, in, in closing, then, because you, you, you spoke to being very careful as senators um, with this piece of legislation, because you, we, you don't want the bill to fall on the local government. So you're saying, as as amended, because remember there's an amendment coming, you're saying it still would affect the way uh, business is done at the um, department. The, at your department, and also you're saying that it will affect the funding of the local funds because they will not qualify for the VA funds. Are you saying that's your statement? Yeah, as you're closing out. That's not what I said at all, Senator. I, oh, I, alluded, me, please. I alluded to the fact that right now, emergency medical transportation for any veteran within the Virgin Islands is paid for 100% by the federal government via the VA Caribbean healthcare system in San Juan. There was verbiage in the whereas clause to strike that. If we strike that information from the legislation, then the cost will now fall on the Virgin Islands government. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time, and thank you for your responses. Thank you, uh, Senator Blyden. As we go along, I, I, I do have concern with section two, subsection two, mm -hmm. which states strike the, free, the phrase provided, however, that disbursements from this fund shall be authorized only when veteran administration funds are not available in pain. So what we're literally doing is that we are saying that we don't want the federal funds, if it's available, and we'll be utilizing funds from the, from the general fund, why would we strike that particular portion? Um, and I don't want to ask the veterans a question, but is that a, a correct analysis that we are literally striking a portion that says if we can be reimbursed or, or if those costs can be passed on to the veteran administration, that that will no longer be a requirement that we just said you can go straight to the general fund? Safaril? Well, Senator, it seems, uh, in my opinion, that this is what the, the bill sponsor is proposing. 
Okay. And F on the two, and that was 2A. Section 2, subsection 2F. Reimbursement of funds available for medical service. So that means the government would become the, the copay if there's any other additional costs, then the government of the Virgin Islands would have to assume those costs? But with services are not, um, and I think I alluded to this in my testimony, services that are provided are not really, it doesn't really cost a veteran, especially if it's a service connected uh, an appointment. The service connected veteran does not pay for that. A non service connected veteran may have to pay a copay, but is very minimal. What is a non service connected veteran? A non service connected veteran, by definition, is a veteran that um, is seeking medical treatment, okay, through the VA, but the injury or what they are seeking care for was not as is not a part of something that took place in the military. It was not as a result of military service. Okay, thank you so much. Senator Javon James, you may proceed. Good afternoon yeah. to the people of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Yeah. I just wanna say thank you to all who have served this country. Uh, my wife served six years in the military. My brother served Oi. six years in the military. So I do understand the importance of supporting our veterans, and I had a short stint in the United, Air, United Airports as well. But what I want to make sure is that we pass a bill that is fair. So my question to Mr. Giff, currently, how much debt have you accumulated and what is currently owed to you if this bill was passed as is? Say that again, sir. I'm sorry. How much? debt have you accumulated with medical services as of today and if you were to get in reimbursed based on this legislation what would that cost be this bill that we are discussing today my understanding is for medical travel for reimbursement of the ticket to go to the facility we as veterans and and, and please let Mr. Giff, Mr. Giff, I have the utmost respect okay. for my veterans. I just asked a simple question. How much has been accumulated based on what you said with the tickets and what have you? You have to ask Director Farrell that. Okay, so we're going to play games today. All right. The reason why I'm asking that question, right? We have over 10,000 veterans based off of what Mr. Schulterbrand said. Is that through through Mr. Farrell, Director Farrell? That, that could very well be true, um, Senator, because some veterans are not registered within the system. And if we were to subtract 150,000 divided by 10,000, that's approximately, hold on, divided by 15,000, $6.66, if I'm not mistaken. 100,000 divided by 15,000? I mean, I got it wrong, hold on. 100,000 divided by 10,000. That's approximately $10 for every veteran in the U.S. Virgin Islands. $10, colleagues. 10,000 times 10. That's approximately, no, it's 150. $15, $15, it's uncorrected. Messing up with my math here today. 150,000 divided by 10,000. That's $15 for every veteran in the territory. And the reason why I'm telling you this, we all know a round trip flight coming out to the US Virgin Islands doesn't cost $15. So we have to be realistic here and we have to be fair. I would support this measure if we bring in the necessary stakeholders, because I think it's unfair that when we have in the whereas clauses talking about the VA community-based outpatient clinic that we have both on St. Croix and St. Thomas, we have the whereas clauses throwing them under the bus. I'm, I'm calling on the Committee on Government Operations to bring in those entities along with Director Farrell to have a true conversation on what services are needed and are not provided in the territory. 
I would like to support this bill, but we need to bring in more stakeholders. We need to find out, based on what Director Farrell said, what services are being provided at the VA community-based outpatient clinic. Like he mentioned, is at the Village Mall in Barron Spot and is at the Medical Foundation building in Estate Thomas. So my question to Director Farrell, with the $150,000 that this proposed bill is going to appropriate, how long would that last in an annual year? For the year, how long do you think that would last? For what would it, what would it be appropriated for specifically? If, if, if it was to pass as is, yeah. based on the, the yeah. legislation yeah. and the yeah. language, how long will that amount of money last? Based on your experiences going through with these veterans who are saying that they're lacking services in the territory and need to be flown out. For emergency transportation, but I don't think this bill speaks to us emergency transportation. Uh, I think piece of the confusion is I think the, the uh, bill sponsor is trying to say that this legislation needs to be have money available for medical appointments on the mainland, not emergency transportation, because emergency transportation is already paid for 100% by the federal government. Now, if we're talking about appointments, I would say to you that there are a few veterans right now that we know of that will be seeking reimbursement to travel to appointments on the mainland. But yeah. the day that we make an appropriation and codify the fact that veterans are able to travel to the mainland for medical appointments, they will come out of the woodworks to take advantage of the benefit, which will be the correct thing to do because then it's a law. But there are many veterans right now that travel um, and, and don't seek for reimbursement because they use that. That's their choice to do so. And my question to you, based on your numbers, what would a number look like based on what you said? You said you have individuals right now who are eligible for reimbursement. What are those numbers looking like? Is above 150,000? Right now, we only have about four individuals that try to seek reimbursement for appointments on the mainland. In a total of how much? I, I really cannot tell you how much uh, veterans travel to the yeah, mainland for, for appointments. And, and that's the problem we have in here. The, 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 I know the intent of the legislation is good, but it's a fee good legislation. We need to drill down some more and have the necessary conversations, bring them into the Committee on Government Operations and find out what is really yeah. going on. I, I would like to support a measure, but I want to make sure when we pass this measure yeah. that it suffice and we don't have to go back to the drawing board saying, oh, we need funds, and then the government is blamed for not having the necessary funding in there. But uh, my colleagues will ask more questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Point of inquiry. Thank you so much, Senator James. Point of inquiry, Senator Fred Gregory. Hey, good afternoon, colleagues, and good afternoon to the testifiers. Um, just picking back very quickly on what the previous um, speaker asked. Uh, Director Farrell, you continue. Point of inquiry? Yes, I just want to make sure. Director Go ahead, Farrell, sorry. You, you continue to say that you don't know the aggregate within the territory, but what is the aggregate within your database? I think that's important information. Those that have signed up with Veterans Affairs what is that number? That's the information that we need to get. We have 8,000 veterans that are registered in our office. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Fred Gregory. Senator DeGraff, you call for a point of inquiry? Well, Senator, uh, Senator Heilig, Francis Heilig, I call for a point of inquiry before. We're trying to get your attention. So after her, I'll go. Go ahead. Senator Francis Heilig, are you If you don't mind, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Um, I am going to make a request that media please be mindful of all the senators that are here because I requested a point of inquiry at least five times since I've been sitting here, okay? Thank you. I wanted to do a point of inquiry to the chair to Mr. Farrell when he was referencing um, state of a, um, an emergency and the federal government would reimburse those funds. If if it's an emergency in regards to the federal government paying for that, it, 
do you consider it separate from what this piece of legislation is doing if we take out the word emergency and just replace it with medical for them to take appointments? Or is that lumped into one whole category? A local law versus what the federal government is going to do considering it's an emergency? If it's medical appointments, then it becomes something totally separate and apart. So our local law would interfere with the rules and regulations of what the federal government would consider a, 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 a emergency? Nope. I, I don't think I'm getting confused. Question. So you're saying our local law would interfere because that's what I'm understanding you're saying. Uh, our local law will, will not interfere with the federal law, but it's okay. very important to note that what I've been saying from the beginning is as it relates to emergencies, the federal government pays 100% for emergency medevac of any veteran within the territory. I think this bill is seeking to allow veterans to travel to, for medical appointments and be reimbursed for their travel. And I, I, I stand corrected if, if I'm wrong. Okay, thank you very much for that clarity because how it, how it was coming across, it, it, it seemed like the local law would have intervened with what the federal government is saying, but you cleared it up that it really doesn't. Thank it you doesn't. so much. Absolutely doesn't. Thank you, Senator Francis Seiliger. Senator DeGraff. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, point information, basically. Uh, w w when I heard a feel-good bill, it's not a feel-good bill. It it's, it's what veterans, I I'm a veteran, we are war veterans. We flew into, uh, these gentlemen flew into Vietnam, I flew into Iraq. We know what it's about. So it's not a feel-good bill, uh, j j just to, to say for my colleague, I couldn't sit down a little one go. When my three minutes come, I'll say my say, but it's not a feel good bill. Be gentlemen and, and ladies who've served have served well. And you know, let, let's keep that for in the forefront. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator DeGraff. Senator James, point of information. Yes, I, I'm not gonna do the back and forth today, but I wanna make it very clear. My wife served in the military. My brother serves in the military. I once solve. It feels good, but it's not adequate funding. We have to be real. And that's why the government of the Virgin Islands is in the situation it is today. We had other senators in the past who passed legislation to make people feel good and put us in an unfunded mandate. And we have to be very careful. So I just want to make it very clear when I said feel good legislation. Thank you so much, Senator James. We, we're going to move on to the other senators. Senator, let's concentrate on the language of the bill and not just continue to say that veteran, okay. veteran, let, let's, let's look at the Let me go back to my specific no, really language nice. of the bill and make a determination as to whether or not the bill is moving in the right direction. Section 3038 is entitled uh, in, in Title 33, Chapter 111, Subsection 3038, is named a Veteran Emergency transportation fund and this bill seeks to strike emergency and replace it with the word uh, medical and it transfers hundred and fifty thousand dollars from the burial is in here um, the veterans burial fund there is no um, such fund there is an allocation under veteran affairs as a line item that appropriates money for veterans medical and burial expenses. And those monies remain available until expended in the sum of $450,000. So I just wanted to put some clarity there. Senator DeGraff, now Senator Fred Gregory, you recognize. Colleagues and good afternoon to the testifiers, particularly Mr. Schulte and uh, Mr. Gibbs. Now, you know, when, when we have this, having this discussion, we really need to ask ourselves, why are we having this conversation? And, you know, the, the recent uh, court ruling 
that territories uh, to be excluded or continue to be excluded from the supplemental security income has a lot to do with this conversation as well, because our veterans throughout the contiguous the United States, they have the opportunity to visit uh, hospitals that can really provide them with specialists and give them the proper medical treatment. Now, of course, the, 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 this bill is really changing the, um, and this is based on my perspective, is, is, is trying to, to, to lump everything in one and move away from the medical component, the, the emergency component, and just saying a medical, um, a, a medical appointment. And I believe that could present some problems. So the language needs to, to really be cleaned up to ensure that we are not impacting the ability or the requirement for the federal government to provide um, the medical emergency services to um, veterans here in the Virgin Islands. So I, I, I too believe that there is some additional work that needs to go into the legislation. So I want to ask legal counsel a question to the chair at the appropriate time, Mr. Chair, regarding that. But let me ask uh, Director Farrell, um, did you ever or do you allow veterans to travel off island for medical appointments now? Any veteran that travels One minute. to and from. Non-emergency non -emergency medical appointments. Right. Any veteran, any veteran that travels for medical appointments to and from San Juan or St. Thomas to St. Croix or St. Croix to St. Thomas, uh, I'll reimburse 100%. Did we ever allow them to travel off island? When I first came in to this office, it was taking place. After I did my analysis, I then... What was the impetus for the removal? Second. What was the impetus One minute. for the removal? Because we had this conversation before, and I agree that we really need to flesh this out some more in a government operations discussion, because we've had this discussion previously that perhaps we could have put a cap and say, well, you're allowed two medical appointments, you're allowed one, whatever that number is. But what was the impetus for making that change? The impetus was lack of funds. And based on a recommendation by, by you, um, Senator Fred Gregory, I did put a policy in place to allow up to four, uh, those veterans that have up to 40% service-connected disabilities to get up to $250 reimbursement back on their tickets. Uh, and of course, like I said before, that was based okay. on uh, recommendation slash position. My time is running. Um, so I really think that we need to revisit the policy. But let me ask you, because we are looking to, to remove our money from the burial fund to place it in another fund that I guess an amendment is coming, but how much on an average and aggregate, how much money do we spend on the burial fund annually or from the burial fund annually? If you have that information, you could provide uh, just time. Time. For this fiscal year, mm -hmm. uh, to date, we have exhausted $182,277. Okay, so that's a significant amount of money. So it, what we're going to do is find ourselves in an unbalanced situation. So we really need to figure out whether, Mr. Chair, whether or not we're going to, um, you know, I don't know if it's a policy or whether we should set it in law, but something has to give um, that we allow the veterans because the economies of scale as it relates to um, the specialists and those opportunities here in the territory is lacking. And if our veterans are crying out and saying, look, we have a language barrier issue. We have a, a, a appointment, um, getting appointments. We have to hear their cry, but I believe we need to do it in a very structured and concentrated way. I don't know that the approach that we have today, because I'm reading the legislation, honestly, I'm a little confused about the, the way the legislation is drafted, if I'm going to be very frank about the conversation. But I believe that it is something that we can really make happen, but we have to be um, specific as, a, as to how we are going to do this. I don't know that our approach is the right approach based on what is presented in the current um, the, the, the legislation as before. But through the chair, as I asked Mr. Chair, I, I need to ask, I think Mr. Chair, you touched on it earlier, 
um, where you spoke about the provided, and I want to ask the legal counsel through the chair, if we take away the provided responsibility of the Veterans Administration, does that take away their responsibility? If it's, I think it's 2B, strike the phrase provided. And then, um, and, and also the impact of striking the word emergency and inserting medical, because then everything is a free for all. So we need to understand what we're doing here. This is, I, I have to go back and harking back to my, um, the, 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 the millennial colleague in the island of the St. Croix district. We can create an unfunded mandate here. That's why I asked the question about how many do we have in our database. So Trudy Chair, if we could get legal counsel to answer those good questions, I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. I know um, Chief Counsel Carty has been assigned to the meeting. If you can come upstairs and um, answer that particular question. As soon as he arrives upstairs, I'll have him put the answer. I'm on seeing the him record. on the camera. Oh, go ahead, Council. You may proceed. To the chair. To the chair, to Senator Fred Gregory. Um, with respect to your first part of your question, uh, as it relates to Section 2 of the bill, B, that's striking that provision, the way that I read the provision that's currently um, in the law is that um, to the extent that disbursements from this fund are being made, they would only be, or I should say the current law says that these disbursements are only authorized when Veterans Administration funds, federal funds, are not available um, in paying transportation costs or when funds made available by the Veterans Administration are inadequate to cover a portion of the cost. So by removing that, it would then become the responsibility of the Virgin Islands government um, to then, to the extent that there are disbursements or to expense or funds are necessary for the purposes that is being established in this act, it would then become the responsibility, the primary responsibility of the um, government of the Virgin Islands because the current language um, allows for disbursement from the Veterans Emergency Transportation Fund um, to the extent that Veterans Administration funds are either not available or insufficient to meet um, the needs or the, the requests um, as it relates to Veterans Emergency Transportation. That's the first part of your question. And then section two one. And if I recall your question, whether or not changing it from emergency to medical um, would have an impact. It, it was that your question. I want to make sure I understand your question correctly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I know the answer, but I want to make sure that we place it on the record. What what does striking the word emergency and inserting medical means for this? legislation, what does it mean for the responsibility of the territory? Well, it, it means now that you're, you, you are taking a, uh, a fund that's titled Emergency Transportation Fund and making it, calling it um, a, a, a medical fund, a veterans medical transportation fund. The title would now suggest that um, this fund would be utilized for um, medical transportation purposes. That's what we, we'd be now saying, as opposed to um, emergency transportation. So I, I'm not, I, I'm not, a, I'm not sure beyond um, when a when a veteran requires funds for transportation, it is my presumption that any sort of transportation is medically related. So that that is my presumption, but I don't want to read anything more in the bill that's there. So now what, what we're saying is that it is Veterans Medical Transportation Fund, um, which essentially would then mean that it's specifically related to anything related to uh, medical transportation. That's the effect of the change of the title. But I think even mm -hmm. more importantly, and I think it's been alluded to, is what we have to do with respect to the substance of the bill, which is really the critical um, deliberation of this committee and ultimately this body. Mr. Chair, you, if you would allow me, I think I misspoke when I asked for section one, I meant section three. Oh. In subsection C, after the word term strike emergency and insert medical instead. 
it is in both sections. It's also in section oh. one. So you you were right. Oh. It's in one okay. and three. Aye. Okay, well, I, I think the the striking of the word uh, medical in, in my reading of, of the bill, the striking of the word emergency and using the word medical would broaden the scope. Um, emergency is limited and, and medical would be um, any appointments. So it, it would broaden the particular scope that we're looking at. Senator DeGraff, you recognize. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, testifiers. All of you and listeners present. Uh, we, we heard this bill in the 33rd, and Director Farrell, have you met with uh, Senator Payne in regards to us making this bill uh, what it should be? Yeah. Have you had a chance to meet with him? Not, not that I didn't have a chance, but I, I was not um, information or any recommendations was not asked of me. I, I had no... Okay. Uh, Wait, I was not okay. I, 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 again, um, I, I, as a veteran, all of us, uh, would you be amenable to we all of us getting together and making this bill with with the ideas and amendments that my colleagues have spoken, get this bill done because we heard it uh, o over two years ago and we hear now again, and it, it is not right for us to be going at each other. You're veteran, we veterans. The, uh, everyone here who are veterans, you know, it, it, it should be where we get together, we sit down, because the intent of that uh, 450 was in the 33rd, Senator Payne pushed to get $150,000 added for that transportation. And because it was not an account set up, and all the, the factors that you are mentioning now, I think we could sit down, let cooler heads prevail, uh, and fix this bill how we have done other bills in the finance committee. So if one committee could get it done, I, I know finance can. Uh, so um, once you're amenable to it, I think we could do that, fix this bill and get it done because we do understand what the intent of the bill is. And I, uh, you know, so it doesn't become a feel good bill, but I know that $150,000 was put in the budget for that. It was added to the burial. We added it there because there was not a specific account to put it in. And that was a conversation back then. So it's for us to do what needs to be done and get it uh, passed and made into law. And if we have to put the, the basic promulgation of the rules into the, the law itself, so any director coming forth after would, would be operate uh, accordingly to the to the law rather than if is if it, so veterans don't feel is a personality of that particular director so i think um we could if, if we could move this bill forward to rules and fix it have some of these meetings that we have these constructive meetings and fix this bill and get it done um how it's supposed to be done because over two years i think have passed and you know, um, hearing the, 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 the pain and, and, and agony that, that veterans have to go through in traveling, you know, getting all the numbers and all the factors and everything, I agree with, fine, but, you know, I think we need to come together um, comprehensively and get it done as opposed to probably, you know, as if we, we fighting each other because I, I, I know it's not for veterans to be fighting each other and showing that out to the public. You know, we, we've served this country well and... You know, we deserve to get what, what needs to be done and find the proper funding to address it. Time. So uh, th that would be my take on it. And uh, thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator DeGraff. And before I go on to the next senator, um, Director Farrell, the way the bill is written, um, does it? require that if you're not going to Puerto Rico that you go to the nearest facility on the mainland to offer the service? Not to my understanding. Okay. And perhaps when the sponsor uh, comes up, they can address that. One of my concerns on the last time we had the meeting was that somebody can say, I'm going to California, I'm going to Seattle, Washington, I'm going to the farthest spot. So if you don't have a language um, that clearly 
delineates as to um, what is considered um, a spot on the mainland, which more than likely would be the closest geographic area um, to the Virgin Islands, then it really opens the door in terms of um, what individuals can, can request. So those are some of the stuff that need to be included in the bill. Uh, Senator Saro. You recognize. And Senator Genevieve Whitaker, Thank you. welcome. Thank you, everybody, and good afternoon to those listening and testifying, and good afternoon to the testifiers. Um, I don't want to belabor the issue today. Um, Mr. Giff and Mr. Shelterbrand, uh, I agree with the intent of the legislation. I agree that veterans should be given the utmost respect and care when needed. So thank you for your service. Uh, my dad is a Vietnam War vet, and I have benefited from his service, and so has the country. And of course, you served in one of the most unpopular wars in our nation's history that did tremendous damage. And we cut our little boys off to war, and the Vietnam was the last draft that we had. And you fought for the country, and we're still unable to vote for the commander in chief or vote in Congress. And the Supreme Court's ruling also dealt a dagger in blow to the, the territories. So I agree with the intent of the legislation. I do believe the legislation does need tremendous amendments. But when the bill comes back with the appropriate amendments, I will support the legislation. But it's also important that we hold ourselves accountable. We drafted a legislation appropriating funds from a fund that does not exist. That can't work. We control the power strings of this government. And I do agree with the St. Corey Senator that it is an unfunded mandate. And if we vote for this today, you're going to feel good. But you won't reap the benefits of what's before us. You won't be able to reap the benefits of what you actually want, which is funding for your travel. One minute. So I don't want you to leave here today thinking that we are in objection to your, that we are against what you're going through. We don't, we don't empathize with you, because we do. But this document before us, I cannot vote in the affirmative for. And I, the, the sentiments have been stated earlier, but how this is written is problematic. Section two, section three, we don't even have the fund, the fund don't exist. And we did this over two years ago. And if this was, we discussed this two years ago, because I was right in here discussing the same legislation and it, it's incumbent upon us and the bill sponsors to go back and thoroughly come back with a bill that we could work on. And this bill doesn't need one amendment or a line to be struck. It needs comprehensive change to accomplish what is it that we want to accomplish to benefit all veterans. Time. So I will not vote in the affirmative today, but I will support the legislation at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and thank you, Senator Sorrow. Uh, Senator Francis Hagler, you recognize. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to my colleagues, to the testifiers, to the people of the territory. Um, first, I would like to say I am in support of this piece of legislation, and as we keep our dialogue and conversation, I am sure as a body we'll be able to hash it out in a way that it actually execute what needs to be executed. Um, the first question I would like to ask is of Director Farrell. What, on average, how many requests for reimbursements do you have on an annual basis at cost-wise? Senator, the cost may vary, but uh, if I could put it into context, uh, like you mentioned earlier, there's only about, if you're speaking of reimbursements for travel to the mainland, is, is that what you're speaking of, or in totality? 
totality and specifically where they want to go to the mainland? Okay. As it relates to the mainland, there's only about four veterans that seek reimbursement. I'm not worried about the amount because four people could travel 100 times. I'm asking, do you have a dollar amount that you keep track of as to what these reimbursements would require? I, I do not have that amount in front of me right now. So. Okay. Well, through the chair, um, that is... Um, through the chair, I would like to request that information from Director um, Farrell in regards to, on an annual basis, how much does it cost for reimbursement, specifically from the two categories to include headed to the mainland. Um, one of the things that we all discussed here today had to do with changing and eliminating the word emergency and putting in the word medical. Now, by putting that word in there, we now open this up for actually everything. Um, if you have a dentist appointment, that's medical. Chiropractor, heart issues, all of these things are medical. One so minute. one of the things we, we're talking about here is potentially amending this piece of legislation. What I would like to know from you, Director Farrell, do you have any policies in place that would come up with a specific rationale as to how these monies would be expended? Or do you think this body needs to put it directly into the legislation so that there would not be any issues as to who would be able to access these funds and have some kind of balance when it comes to disbursement? The Office of Veterans Affairs does have a policy in place. Um, like mentioned earlier, it covers anyone that has a 0% up to 40% service-connected or non-service-connected disability. Thank you. Um, Mr. Giff, could you share your thoughts on whether you believe that something must or should be put into the legislation to guarantee how the disbursements would be? Or do you think veterans are comfortable with how the policy is set up through the VA? Time. Yes. Um... And I'm working also on that. I have formed a, a veteran group. I had a couple of meetings. I got sick, so everything is on hold right now. But we are planning on going to Washington and get this bill that they have straightened up. We have to go to San Juan, Puerto Rico. We have to, San Juan, Puerto Rico is the closest veteran hospital. Listen, we need to be treated as every other veteran. We are here today because of Director Farrell, you know. You keep asking him all the time, how many veterans has traveled? And his answer is four. I gave Mr. Farrell a, a reimbursement uh, uh, application for $161, and he refused to pay it. You are telling me that you are not helping the veterans? Your job is supposed to help the veterans. We are here because he asked, and, 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 and the senators that was there in the 33rd, he asked that they, this bill be changed, take out emergency. That's right, Director Farrell. He says that bill needs to be changed. When he came in his first four years, he was reimbursing us to go to the states coming back. It was no problem. When he shifted over to the new administration, he cut it off. I said to uh, so, um, Director Farrell, what is the reason for you stopping us, the veteran who is going to the states to get better treatment? Uh, I just stop it. Then he comes with a policy that if you are making 40% more, for, sorry more than 40% of your army benefits, meaning for myself, I served and got hurt and suffering from Agent Orange. The government, federal government, is certifying that they pay me for my pain and suffering. I cannot work anymore, so they're taking care of me. That money may look like a lot of money, but I have to take care of myself with everything. With that 100%. So the, the money for me to go to the States to get 
treatment was a great help. Okay. It, I, I just want to say, you can see I'm compassionate. I'm ready to break down and cry because I can't believe a veteran in charge of veterans who make a statement that he is not going to support this when he know he asked for it and never came into the office to talk to um, Senator Payne so okay. that he could work this thing out for the Can betterment you... of all veterans. Mr. Thank Gip, you. if you could wrap I it up, you can send it to time cry, but Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the additional time. Thank you, Senator Francis Ayalaga. Senator Whitaker, you recognize. Good afternoon, Chairman. Good afternoon to my colleagues. Good afternoon to the testifiers, and good afternoon to the people of the Virgin Islands. Uh, I want to first off, um, as we just left off from the last testifier, um, express to you I very heartfelt. Um, take in, take into account what you expressed and what I would suggest. Um, I think um, this hearing has kind of turned into what I deem as a constituent matter. And what I suggest is that um, we, a meeting be called between the, the parties. I'm certainly willing to help support that in any way um, because there, some of the issues brought, I think, need to be dealt with also internally. So, um, and, you know, of course, it's expressed here publicly, but I think we need to look at it internally. Director Farrell, I want to turn to you concerning um, how have you engaged, um, particularly the, even the Interior Department? I've done some research around maybe funding support. Um, how are you in terms of you know, working on attaining additional funding to support the, the office? I know, of course, you've reached out consistently to this body um, asking for support um, for our veterans. How are you in terms of getting additional support for the office? And what supports do you need there? Um, I have personally, within the last couple of years, have not reached out to the Interior Department. I have reached out to them previously on a project which we were working on together, but recently I have not reached out to the Interior Department for any funding availabilities. Well, in, in that regard, I know that there's a lot of issues with our federal relations uh, and much of what we're dealing with today has a lot to do with our efforts needed to take up what Mr. Giff is expressing. Um, we're gonna really need to work on a federal lobby. Um, I have on the international level. Um, One minute. Address the issue of our denial of human rights, SSI, um, the fact that that denial of right, right to the president, our economic oppression, and I think this is one example of what we need to do in getting together and doing that kind of federal lobby because some of the changes that we need to, that we're seeking are going to really require um, um, federal legislation uh, to address. Specifically, though, for this measure, uh, Director Farrell, um, how are, are your, your commitment to seeing this legislation tr through, what would you suggest in terms of us moving forward? Um, I, for one, believe in the stakeholders being part of a bill drafting process. How have you engaged the stakeholders in the process of any bills coming to the committee and, and how we can develop a better working relationship to get the support for our veterans that we need. If I, if I may send a place on the record um, yet again that I, the intent of this bill, um, I, I applaud the intent of the bill. Time. My concern is, like was mentioned earlier, going into an unfunded mandate. I would definitely support the bill of its kind, but with the right funding available. If we have, I would love for every, all eight to 10,000 veterans of the Virgin Islands to be able to go to California, Texas, Mexico, wherever they would like to go. I just cannot in good conscience obligate the government of the Virgin Islands knowing the funds are not available in my particular agency. If the funds are appropriated, we, I will do everything that our veterans would love for us to do. It's a funding issue, Senator. Thank you. 
You have one closing question? You're good. Oh, just wanted to, well, just wanted to conclude by just of stating that um, we, just as a conclusion, that I want to see that the next step really be solving some of the constituent issues uh, that we that were on display today, uh, and secondarily, how we can work between the parties involved so we can move the legislation forward. I hear about the unfunded mandate, um, but I also know that we have to move the marker. We, we have to get the support they need because it's unfortunate what our veterans go through just to seek the basic treatment that they need and for, for serving country, for, for the sacrifice that they made, which you know, of course, directly, Director Farrell, as well as the veterans who are there today. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Whitaker. Senator Payne. I don't think I'm not seeing him on the screen. I'm just I'm looking at the bill. The, the, the intent is is good, but the language doesn't match the intent, and we we need to redefine a, a lot of the language. There's no reason to strike the freeze, um, provided that the federal government does not provide reimbursement. There's no logical reason to strike that, free, that, that particular freeze. You can still achieve um, the intent of the bill if, if the language um, is correct. I am reading it, and the language is very broad. Um, there's not a lot of uh, definition as to exactly uh, what would take place if the bill it is enacted, it's just saying that you literally can just submit your paperwork and you can um, go um, any place. So we, I think we need to sit down. The, the, the sponsor of the bill needs to sit, the, the director, and a working group, perhaps through um, the Committee of Jurisdiction, which is uh, Senator Carla Joseph, and work on some of the, the language for the particular bill and then uh, move the bill forward. That would be... Uh, my uh, recommendation. I think we have concluded testimony on this particular bill. I'm going to give um, all of the testifiers an opportunity to put a, a short closing statement. I'm going to give third, no more than 30 seconds for a closing statement on the bill, beginning with you, uh, Mr. Giff, and then Mr. Schulterbrand. Thank you, sir, for invitation to come and testify uh, I myself glad to see the way that it went, that we need to sit down. Uh, Senator um, Salo, uh, speak on it, that we need to sit down and work this thing out. It can be worked out. You know how we feel? Let's work on it. Let's get it done. Veterans should not be whole in the place that they are in the Virgin Islands. It's wrong. We fight for our country. We give our life for our country. And now we come back to get treatment for our health and it becomes a big issue. The government of the Virgin Islands is not broke. We are the less paying uh, budget that it have, veterans. And we always say, if it wasn't for you guys, we'll never be here. Then why are we being treated this way? I mean, I could go on and on. I'm not going to say I, I'm, I'm glad that we are going to work this thing out, uh, Senator Belly. I'm really glad. Because director, senators, governor, we all need to sit down and work this thing out for us. When I get my group back on track, we're going to Washington to fight Washington for the, the, the policies that they have in place. It can be done. And thank you, Mr. Giff. And I'm glad you say you're going to Washington because we do realize that this is a federal issue that we're dealing with, that the local government is trying to complement and solve. But it is an issue um, that the federal government should be addressing. And I would um, be very happy. I'm very happy to know that um, that is one of the approach to be able to have a discussion with the federal government in reference to our location and proximity, et cetera, and what should be provided for the veterans of the Virgin Islands. Ms. O'Neill? Are you a just budget? Uh, thank you. 
<laughs> thank you, Senator. Um, again, I, I, I would just like to say thank you again for uh, the opportunity to testify on this bill. This has been a number of years in the making. Um, and I, I, as uh, Director Farrell stated, and a number of senators, the bill does need some work. It would be an unfunded mandate. Uh, and, and of major concern is the fact that that one fund that was referenced is does not exist. So with amendments, I'm sure we would all uh, be happy to support the intent of the measure. Uh, and with that, I say thank you again. Thank you so much, Director Farrell. Thank you, Senator. Um, I would just like to say that I, again, I'm in favor of the intent, but it is just not, um, right now it is not drafted properly and, and saying the right things and the money is not there. Uh, I am in favor for any veteran getting the care that they need. Any and every veteran within the, the Virgin Islands. And being that everybody else put on the record about their time in service, I am a two-time combat veteran, 20 years in the United States Army. So I know the trials and tribulations of our veterans on the territory. It, that makes me even want to push more. I am not totally happy with everything that the, the veterans get and receive. However, there's a way and a process that we have to accomplish things. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. The testifiers are uh, dismissed. I'm going to call a one minute recess and we're going to vote on this measure. This committee stands in recess for one minute.
the Committee of Finance is back on the record. Uh, do I hear a motion on bill number 34.0205? A motion. Motion, Senator DeGraff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move bill number 34-0205, an act amending Title 33, Virgin Islands Code, Chapter 111, relating to the Virgin Islands Veterans Emergency Transportation Fund to make health care more accessible to veterans in the Virgin Islands by enacting the Veteran Medical Transportation Act be held in committee at the call of the chair. I so move. Motion made by Senator DeGraff. Second. Is there a second? Sure. Seconded by Senator, Senator Blyden. Roll call. Yeah. Senator Marvin A. Blyden. Yeah. Senator Blyden, yay. Senator Samuel Carillon. Senator Carillon, absent. Senator Dwayne M. DeGraff. Yes. Senator DeGraff, yay. Senator Donna A. Fred Gregory. Yes. Senator Fred Gregory, yay. Senator Javon E. James Sr. Senator James Sr., yay. Senator Janelle K. Saro. Senator Saro. Senator Saro not voting. Senator Kurt A. Vialet. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Senator Saro, yay. Senator Kurt A. Vialet. Yes. Senator Vialet, yay. Mr. Chair, you have six yays, one absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Bill number 34-0205. And I commend in Title 33, Virgin Islands Code, Chapter 111, relating to the Virgin Islands Veterans Emergency Transportation Fund to make health care more accessible to veterans in the Virgin Islands by enacting the Veterans Medical Transportation Act will be held in this committee at the call of the chair. <laughs> Madam Clerk, can you read the next item on the agenda? Bill number 34-0226, an act amending Act Numbers 8474, 8479, 8486, 8494, 8496, and 8498 to adjust the fiscal year 2022 budget to appropriate funds to the Casino Control Commission for Capital Outlay, WTJX for Capital Outlay and Satellite Uplink, respectively, Elections Systems of the Virgin Islands for General Election, Virgin Islands Cricket Board, Department of Tourism for Personnel and Fringe Benefits, Virgin Islands Board of Nurse Licensure for Personnel and Fringe Benefits, and 8% Salary Restoration, Social Security, and Medicare Taxes Reimbursement to the Economic Development Authority, Governor Wang F. Louis Hospital and Medical Center, and the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority, proposed by Senators Kurt A. Viale and Donna A. Fred Gregory. Invited testifiers, Jennifer O'Neill, Director, Office of Management and Budget. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And before I go to this particular bill, colleagues, please be aware that Amendment number 34-535 have been circulated in reference to this particular bill and that corrects some of the concerns that were listed by the Director of OMB. Uh, who speaks to this particular bill? Senator Donna Fred Gregory, recognized. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair um, I speak to this particular measure, and I just want to make sure that I put on record that I am the sponsor on this measure because um, the satellite uplink for the, um, the WTJX in particular was left off in our previous, when we moved our bills for the 2022 uh, budget. Um, I will oblige the chair and bring this measure forward. And uh, basically this measure is asking to adjust uh, several acts 
within the 2022 uh, budget for fiscal year 2022 and to appropriate additional resources funds to the Casino Control Commission, uh, funds, as I indicated earlier, to the WTJX, um, the election system for the general election, uh, the and a number of other uh, nonprofit entities within the territory, and um, the restoration of the 8% uh, salary. I think there was some ancillary uh, uh, expenses around that associated with uh, Social Security and Medicare taxes, and as well that also occurred with both the um, Wang F. Louis Hospital, based on what I'm seeing here, and uh, the Economic Development Authority and the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. We're going to allow the Director of the Office of Management and Budget to put a testimony on the record. And then there are some individuals who are standing by to answer questions. However, I'll just give them a brief, uh, maybe one minute, to uh, speak to how they're included in, in this particular supplement uh, so we can clear up some of the questions before we go to the wrong of questioning by the testifiers. Director O'Neill, you recognize. Thank you. Uh, good day, Chairman Kurt Vealey and other members of the Committee on Finance of the 34th Legislature of the U.S. Virgin Islands, other senators present, and members of the listening and viewing audience. I am Jennifer O'Neill, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and I appear pursuant to your invitation to testify on Bill Number 34-0226, an act amending Act, number, act Numbers 8474-8479-8486, 8494, 8496, and 8498 to adjust the fiscal year 2022 budget to appropriate funds to the Casino Control Commission for capital outlay, WTJX for capital outlay and satellite uplink respectively, election system of the Virgin Islands for general election, Virgin Islands Cricket Board, Department of Tourism for personnel and fringe benefits, Virgin Islands Board of Nurse Licensure for personnel and fringe benefits, and 8% salary restoration, Social Security and Medicare taxes reimbursement to the Economic Development Authority, Governor Wong F. Louis Hospital and Medical Center and the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority. This bill addresses several supplemental requests on behalf of various agencies. Principally, similar to fiscal year 2021, it is the intent of the executive branch to request a supplemental budget once actual revenue and, and expenses provide favorable circumstances to do so. At this time, however, this is undetermined as we have not had the opportunity to fully assess the revenues that have been collected through tax day, April 19th, 2022. Through April 8th, 2022, collections were 6% lower than revenue projections. And while we remain cognizant that this is typical for this time of year, I would like to note here that fiscal year 2022 collections are 4.1% higher than fiscal year 2021, 5.9% lower than fiscal year 2020, and 5.5% higher than fiscal year 2019 for this same period. In total, this bill calls for an additional $1,333,372 in additional general fund appropriations. Some of the expenses indicated in this bill are for personnel and fringe and will have to be accommodated within the ceilings for fiscal year 2023 and beyond and have not to date been included even by the agencies who've made these requests. Furthermore, it is worth noting that these requests were not appropriately submitted to, reviewed or vetted by OMB as is protocol. And in fact, every request outlined in this bill required outreach to the agencies to better understand the requests and determine the true needs of these agencies. You will appreciate that we are currently working to finalize the fiscal year 2023 and 24 budgets. 
and ensure balanced budgets are submitted to this body for consideration. Based on the research and analysis conducted by my office, the following notes additional reasons why I am unable to support specific line items indicated in this bill for general fund appropriation. Section one, Department of Licensing and Consumer Affairs, $120,000 for a hearing appeals officer with an $80,000 salary and approximately $40,000 needed for French. First, this bill appropriates the entire $120,000 on the personnel services, whereas personnel and fringe would have to be budgeted separately. Second, while there is a legitimate need for this position, which will allow DLCA to meet its mandates and experience cost savings, we are more than 50% into the fiscal year, and this annual amount is not what is required to bring an individual into the position for the remainder of the fiscal year. Given the requisite recruitment, hiring, and onboarding process, Conservatively, this individual would likely not start before June 1st, 2022, leaving approximately four months left in the fiscal year, and at which time only a total of $40,000 would be required. It is the determination of my office that this amount can be accommodated within DLCA's current fiscal year 2022 budget due to vacancy savings. The total amount for this position will also need to be added to the fiscal year 23-24 budgets, which are currently under preparation. Casino Control Commission. It is my understanding that the Casino Control Commission currently is seeking $152,532, of which $72,532 has been requested through this bill for capital outlay expenses to include technology upgrades and mold remediation. Given the revenue generating functions of this agency, I encourage the thoughtful consideration of the agency to identify opportunities to accommodate requests through their own collected funds. Additionally, there are numerous federal grant opportunities that may be able to address these requests. WTJX Virgin Islands Public Broadcasting System. This bill seeks to appropriate a total of $400,000 for WTJX. However, it is my understanding that only $100,000 is being requested to purchase a satellite uplink for additional mobile connectivity and broadcasting capabilities. I am unclear as to the rationale for the additional $300,000 being proposed. VI election. $150,000 has been appropriated to the Board of Elections for the execution of the upcoming primary election efforts in fiscal year 22. This bill seeks to add an additional $200,000, again, to my understanding, to support the VI election system related to the convening of a sixth constitutional convention, which has been proposed through bill number 34-0153. As this bill has not yet been enacted, limited general fund resources should not be obligated for something that is currently a possibility. Should this bill be passed, that would be the appropriate time to seek appropriation of these funds. And uh, just as an aside, I think it said something about the general election. General election will be funded in the fiscal year 2023 budget as it happens in November. The Virgin Islands National Guard, Inc. The Office of the Adjutant General, or OTAG, which oversees the Virgin Islands National Guard, is not currently aware of this request. Therefore, I am uncertain as to the intent of these funds and which organization has requested and would receive said funds. Section two, we are unclear as to the purpose of the African Population Project and as such, we cannot support the $64,000 proposed appropriation to amend Act 8479 in favor of the, of the University of the Virgin Islands. Section three, I am unaware of the need for this proposed $126,178 to JFL for outstanding FICA related to the 8% repayment. Consequently, I am also unable to support this. Section four. This bill also seeks to appropriate $62,000 from the Tourism Advertising Revolving Fund to the Department of Tourism for staffing. 
I am unaware of this request to hire additional staffing and the purpose. Additionally, $10,000 is being proposed for road signage through the Department of Public Works. While there is some correlation with road signage and tourism within the islands, these funds are intended for the promotion of the territory as a tourist destination and to conduct related studies and surveys related to territorial visitors. As such, this is not an appropriate use of these funds. Section five, through research, we've been informed that the actual amount being requested by the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority for the FICA that was not included in the initial 8% reimbursement appropriation is $199,799, but only $57,674 is being proposed in this bill from the general fund. We do not have any other data relative to this re request and its actual need at this time, considering the payments were made many months ago. Section six. I may have a number wrong here, but anyway, $57,674 is being proposed from the general fund to the Board of Nurse Licensure. Like many others already referenced, we have no information relative to the purpose or need for this funding. Section seven, just over $33,799 has been proposed from the Casino Control Revolving Fund for salary increases of gaming enforcement officers within the Department of Justice. While the requested salary increases are allowable expenses within these funds, these requests were not submitted through OMB as is required. Section one also seeks to appropriate $28,634 to the Economic Development Authority or EDA for FICA taxes not included as part of the 8% repayment appropriation. EDA, however, is seeking a total of $39,870 to include $11,236 for an employee who was inadvertently omitted from the initial calculation that was submitted by EDA. The total appropriation for EDA for fiscal year 2022 would therefore be $5,652,870. I have no objection to this request or for the proposed $41,854 appropriation for the 10 sleepless nights or the proposed $41,000 for the Virgin Islands Cricket Board. I strongly advise against the approval of the other request as these proposed appropriations within this bill would set a bad precedent of circumventing the processes that are currently in place to vet and approve such requests appropriately. In conclusion, while I understand that the needs of agencies are ever changing, requests such as these do require larger evaluation such as equal consideration across all entities with needs. My team continues to support agencies in identifying creative ways to address current needs while balancing current obligations and sustainability considerations. While the needs of the respective agencies are duly recognized, it is with this lens that I am unable to support a number of the requests being made today. I do take the opportunity, however, to remind this body that we continue to work on a full fiscal year 2022 supplemental budget request to address Governor Bryan's initiatives while simultaneously working to complete the upcoming fiscal year's budgets. Mr. Chair, this concludes my testimony and I remain available to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your um, testimony, uh, Director O'Neill. We have a number of individuals who are on virtually that represent um, the some of the entities uh, that are named in this uh, supplemental budget. I know that uh, this has been drafted for quite a while. Uh, some, I think it's over two months, and we did um, share a copy with you, Director O'Neill, so that you would have the opportunity to reach out to all of these different entities that have made a request and find out exactly um, how those monies are, are going to be spent. We did not come up with these amounts um, 
He didn't pull it out of the sky. It, it was submission um, to the office, and then being a team player with the executive branch, we decided that we wanted to um, make sure that we formulate a bill um, that would be able to meet some of the concerns that were expressed to us, um, to include um, uh, one or two language change that was needed. Uh, well, we have a number of individuals who are on the screen, so I would ask for them to just give a brief synopsis, not long, uh, we're within um, 60 seconds as to the money for that particular um, entity. And I'll begin with uh, Mr. Pickering or Mr. David, whichever one of you are going to speak to the money for the Casino Commission. Uh Mr. David? Yes, go ahead, Mr. David. Yes, thank you. This is uh, with regard to the the request for the um, for, for the transfer of funds from the Casino Control Revolving Fund to the, to the Department of Justice for salary adjustment. As I indicated that um, we have three employees in the Department of Justice, and they're trying to basically have some kind of equity with regard to the pay of the employees. What happened is that um, when one uh, last last fiscal year, the Department of Justice indicated that salaries would be adjusted for the two employees that we had at that point in time. Unfortunately, they could not, um, it, it was not done and only one, one employee salary was adjusted, though that the promise that it would have been done in the, in the current fiscal year. And unfortunately that was not done. We have requested that um, what we have is a disparity because we have the employee, all of the employees are doing practically the same type of work and the disparity of, of one employee is um, in, in terms of the salary that, that she is receiving is just way out of line with the other two employees. Time. And with regard to the, to the funding, the, the money as we indicated would be a transfer from the Casino Control Commission Revolving Fund, which is for the use of the gaming enforcement and and the the that's the control commission. So we're just asking that a small amount be transferred to take care of that, so that we'll have the employees, all employees, basically on par with each other in terms of um of salaries. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Evangelista. Good, uh, good afternoon, I'm, sure. oh, I'm sorry. Yes, one yeah. minute. Oh. Is that? Director O'Neill. Uh, sorry, Senator, that was the uh, conversation that I would send it to Graf. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, Senator Verde? Yes, uh, Mr. Pickering? Yes, Director uh, uh, good afternoon to you and to, good afternoon to the, to the uh, members of the committee and the uh, testifiers and all others present. Um, at our budget hearing, Last, uh, last August, um, during our testimony, we indicated to the uh, committee our need for um, funding to primarily to, to, to improve our IT uh, infrastructure. Um, you and uh, Senate President uh, Donna Fred Gregory encouraged us to submit uh, a supplemental um, our request uh, to, to your office or to, or to the committee, which we did. We submitted a total of 152,000 plus. Uh, in, um, and we noted that uh, in your uh, submission, you eliminated uh, approximately 80,000, which we had paid for, for, for vehicles. The bulk of our request, again, is to um, improve our IT infrastructure and uh, for um, Approximately half of that would be for um, our fire room and uh, uh, improvements and uh, mold remediation. I must note that the um, mold remediation is part of our um, uh, PW worksheet, uh, but as you know, the, um, it's, um, it's a reimbursable process, um, shared 90-10, and we, did not, we do not currently have the funding to proceed with that. Time. And we wanted to, uh, I, I want to thank you for um, for your consideration of our request. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pickering. Commissioner Evangelista. Hi, good afternoon, Senator Vialet 
and other members of the Committee on Finance and the members of the 34th Legislature. Good afternoon. I would like to share, first of all, and thank both you, Senator Villay and Senator Donna Fred Gregory, for bringing forth this measure that would address an issue that I have been discussing at every budget hearing since I came on board. What I'd also like to share with you, though, is that at this time, you can stand down because after conferring with Director O'Neill, she has assured me that the concerns that I have voiced can actually be addressed with some current vacancies that I have. And she has also assured me that once I get it done post haste, which we have already done, that we will actually be stronger than ever so that all the constituents who have been waiting to have their cases heard will have them heard because, as you know, justice delayed is justice denied. So I just want to thank you um, for the efforts that you've put forth. Um, Director O'Neill and I have actually met and conferred since this was um, brought forward, and um, I'm happy to report to you that hopefully this will um, be addressed. and. I'll have a different need at a different time, but for now, um, we are prepared and we will be stronger than ever. Thank you. Time. Thank you, Commissioner Evangelista. So you're saying we just go ahead and strike your request? Uh, yes, Senator. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Singh? Good afternoon, Senator Vealey. Good afternoon to all the senators. Um, uh, Donna, President Donna Fred Gregory came to visit us at our St. Croix office, I believe last year, and to see our new production vehicle over there. And I'm in St. Thomas today. And after seeing the capacity of the vehicle, she asked why we didn't have a satellite uplink on our St. Thomas vehicle. And that was a case of lack of funding. Um, just to give you an example of why the satellite uplink um, is needed, I just have to point to last November where we supported Paradise uh, Gems and we streamed, we broadcast the games to ESPN using internet and there were dropouts. If we had the dish, we would have had a smooth um, broadcast. So um, this is not only important to us locally, but for when we uh, broadcast to other jurisdictions, to other places around the world. And of course, in an emergency where internet is down, we can broadcast messages to the mainland and around the world using this vehicle. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think is... Um, Senator Vielle, can I add one more thing? Yes, you can. Um, our initial uh, request was for $100,000, not for $400,000. Okay, thank you so much. And we did make the correction. There is an amendment that um, it, it was a mistake. So it is 110,000 missing. You did make a request for 10,000 for shipping, correct? Delivery and installation. Okay, so the amount is 110,000 and the amendment reflects that. Uh, Mr. Christopher? Yeah, Mr. Christopher, you can unmute your device and go ahead. Good afternoon, Senator um, VLA and corresponding senators. Yes, this request was made because of the, like, like um, Attorney David was stating, <clears throat> disparity among his um, employees as far as the position. And because of the monies that are given from the Casino Control Commission to the Department of Justice, specifically the Gaming Enforcement Division. It, the request was made through access to this body here 
to use the money specifically for personnel to help build up the salaries in his division and hopefully to get other employees so they, their unit can be stronger to do the job that they have to do. Thank you so much, Mr. Christopher. Um, Pro President Hall, the African Population Project, if you can give a brief description. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair and other senators present. Uh, as some of you are aware, uh, Dr. George Tyson um, <clears throat> has been collecting data on the African population in St. Croix going uh, back uh, through uh, the slavery period uh, because of the extensive records that uh, the Danes kept. Uh, uh, however, he has been doing this more as a hobby or as a part of the landmark society. He had reached out to us some time ago about trying to house this database at the university and to enhance it so that it could be more available to the public so that people can better trace their ancestry uh, so that individuals will have a richer understanding of the life of our ancestors. Uh, and <clears throat> the university has been very open uh, to being the permanent home for uh, this resource. Uh, it is valuable and it should be in the public domain, uh, not uh, something that just an individual uh, has, and he has always uh, shared that uh, belief. Uh, former Senator Myron Jackson, uh, who has been a strong component of this uh, transition, uh, began to meet with us to talk about how this could come about, and he indicated that he would try to uh, secure some support from uh, the legislature to start this process. So I think the amount that was requested here uh, was an attempt to at least start the process so that we could over time move Dying. that database, enhance that database, and make it available to the public. The last thing I would say is that what he has collected and pulled together is information about the African population on St. Croix. Ultimately, we want to expand that so it covers St. Thomas, St. Croix as well. And so that certainly will uh, require additional resources in the future. But from the university's perspective, this is a very important and meaningful project uh, to the history and culture of the Virgin Islands. Thank you so much, President Hall. The original request was $32,000, and we doubled it to $64,000 so that we can include uh, St. Thomas and St. John, we didn't want to isolate the project to one island. So we uh, doubled the appropriation so we can expand it out to St. Thomas and St. John to get this uh, well-needed information. Nurse Vanderpool, Board of Nurse Licensure, the request. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Senator Kurt Bailey, Chairman of the Finance Committee and other members. Um, the, the Virgin Islands Board of Nursing recently was um, tasked with many demands and also with new legislation. After the passing of the budget last year, we noted that we had the need to get an accountant because of our uh, needs for uh, a fiscal person in the office. With that, we requested just a small amount for the fi uh, fiscal officer for the coming year. And this would have been a new position on the board because currently there's no fiscal officer on the board to do our accounting stuff, uh, do the accounting for the board. So we requested the supplemental in the budget. And this was to get an experienced accountant with the knowledge of accounting to help us with our financial advisement 
and improving the cost and in to improve, sorry, to improve to improve and ensure that the cash flow and the management at the board is done sufficiently and effectively with all the current mandates that are that we have currently and to ensure that the operations and management of the board is carried out as the mandates are set forth to us. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Nurse Vanderpool. Uh, colleagues, he's going to go to uh, three minutes. A round of questioning. If you need the three minutes, you can use it. If not, uh, if it's shorter, that is fine. Center of Lighting, you recognize. Point of inquiry, Senator, Senator Frederick. Um, I know there's a, a request here from four other, the OTAG. Is there anybody on the line for OTAG? I can try and get somebody on the line. They um, did send correspondence to your office in reference to that particular request, Madam President. I can read the letter on the record if you so desire. I think that would be appropriate. Okay, I, I, I will get the letter. We'll read it in one second. Let's go ahead to a round of questioning. And um, right after you, Senator Blyden, I will read the letter. Let me proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon again to my colleagues. Good afternoon, Director O'Neill, and thank you for your testimony. Well, I was very smiling because you know, you stated in your testimony that you strongly advise against us approving any of the other requests, all except the one for EDA. Now, uh, I know Commissioner Evangelista stated that you guys spoke and he can actually fund that position for the um, vacancies uh, that are there in his department and also um, Director Singh spoke to the amount that you stated was um, incorrect. But have you seen an amendment that um, Senator VLA is proposing? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Blyden. And yes, I actually just saw the amendment which addresses my concern relative to WTJX. And for the record, I am in favor of WTJX. I didn't say no to that. I'm just questioning the additional 300,000 that was there. The 100,000 for the uh, uplink, the satellite uplink, uh, I do not have uh, any objection to, for the record. Understood, and I appreciate that. Um, let me ask, though, another question I have, because, you know, these are different agencies, numerous agencies, as a matter of fact, and the reason for the request of many, of many if not all, is to create more um, capacity and, and also to generate more revenues within those agencies by having the right amount of staff, et cetera. Um, let me ask, in terms of communication, where the communication, and because you're like, I don't know, I don't know, where the communication, what's going on there? So so that that also, that actually is the major concern that I have because these requests did not come through the Office of Management and Budget as is protocol. If you're requesting uh, personnel to hire personnel, that comes through the Office of Management and Budget through a personal requisition form. We do analysis on your existing budgets and tell you whether or not we feel you can accommodate if you have uh, vacancy savings, or if not, then we prepare a supplemental as we are in the middle of doing right now. One um, minute. You know, I, ex I did express this before that I was unaware of any of these requests um, prior to being sent the bill. That is concerning that there are so many entities who basically circumvented the process that is has been established for many years. This isn't new. You have changes that you want to make to your budget. It's sent to the budget office. That's where you start, and then you go from there. So with that being said, um, as the director of OMB, what's, what are you going to do moving forward to assure that did that not happen again from your from your and your department with your colleagues um, in administration? How how do you plan to move forward to assure that did that not happen again? So I, I will say clearly there needs to be uh, an education 
um, some education happening. So we will embark on uh, teaching and and providing information to all entities so they understand what the processes are Time. as we move forward so that we do not have a repeat of this where I am uh, called to testify on things that I'm unaware of. Thank you so much for your response. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. And that's the answer I wanted to hear. Thank you so much. I have another point of inquiry, Senator. Mr. Yes, Chair. Um, I'm going to answer your first one first. Let me let her read the letter, and then I'll go to your second. Well, the two are related. Go ahead. I missed the one for the um for the election. The, the Board of Election uh, monies is uh, for um, the general election. We put in it in advance if we... Wait until um, the next fiscal year budget. It goes into effect October 1st. Stuff don't come online until a period after, I think, this year. Uh, stuff didn't come online until, what, November? So this would ensure that we're able to run the general election. It does not include money for the Constitutional Convention. It just includes money to run the election. Can I answer? Yes, you may. Thank you, Senator Vialli, for that clarification. But the, the normal practice, again, is to include it in the upcoming budget year. This is what we've always done. We never, at least as far as I know, from 2014, uh, being at OMB, have never put uh, funding in a prior year um, to fund the general election. It's always placed in the year where it is. So yeah. we've already included it in the budget that we are preparing now for fiscal year 23 because it is a fiscal year 23 expense. We expect that the budget will be passed on time so we won't have an issue because October 1st that will take effect. And the election I think is November something, whatever that is. <laughs> How long did it take to place a FY22 budget online? Well, this uh, it took about three weeks um, this time, and we have put uh, some measures in place to streamline it, and we've actually upgraded the ERP as well, so it should be a much faster process uh, in this next, in the next uh, fiscal year. Point of information. Point of information, Senator Fred Gregory. Um, I have to agree with the OMB director. You cannot utilize prior funds for a current year activity. That those funds would have expired come 10, 9 30th of 2020. It, it, Senator, it would, ex, it would expire, you are correct, on October 1st. And that is if the money is given to them after October 1st. But the intent isn't for the money to be given to them after Can't October that, 1st. Sister. The money, the intent is to allow the election system to be able to proceed uh, with procuring and purchasing and doing what they, they need to do to get uh, the election Andy. going. And we can put in, if, um, if it's so desire, that the money is remain available until expended. It's nothing that is out of the ordinary that has been done by this body. From accounting practices, you can't do that. What stops you, um, Director O'Neill? from funding the election system before October 1st. But the, the election system is funded currently for the... Uh, the primary. What, what stops you? The, the, the pr primary elections in August, which, is, which takes place within this fiscal year. Uh, 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 the general election takes place in fiscal year 23. So uh, whatever costs are incurred, um, the election system would continue to pay whatever it is from their funds until they have the 23 appropriation done. And if the budget is passed on time, as is it is in every other election year, there would be no issues. I'm unaware of any issues that any uh, that you know election system has faced with not having uh, funds appropriated in the year prior. Let, let me try and get. Um... Carolyn Fox on the link. I will go ahead to the next uh, senator. No, um, Madam Clerk, go ahead and read the letter into the record. Correspondence from the Virgin Islands National Guard Association, Inc. 
P.O. Box 2460, Kings Hill, Virgin Islands, 00851. The Honorable Donna A. Fred Gregory, Capitol Building, Charlotte Amali, P.O. Box 1690, St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, 00804. Dear Madam President, the Virgin Islands National Guard Association, Inc., is requesting $10,000 for five junior officers to attend Officer Professional Development at the 144th National Guard Association of the United States General Conference and Exhibition in Columbus, Ohio, August 26, 2022 through August 29, 2022. The NGAUS General Conference is the association's annual business meeting. Army and Air National Guard officers from all 50 states, three territories, and the District of Columbia gather to network, set their legislative agenda, and hear from America's civilian and military leaders. Family members, industry representatives, and local officials also attend. The association is a nonprofit corporation and 501c3 tax exempt. It is comprised of active commissioned and warrant officers of the Virgin Islands National Guard and retirees. For additional information, please contact the undersigned at 340-277-9396. Sincerely, Beresford F. Edwards, Lieutenant Colonel, retired, President, V-I-N-G-A. Mr. Chair, this concludes the reading of the correspondence. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. I'm going to go to Senator James. Senator James, James you recognize. Uh, Senator Viole, if I could quickly mention that the issue that I have with that particular one related to the letter that was just read, the bill does not state VI National Guard Association. It just has VI National Guard. And so our contact was made with the VI National Guard or the Office of the Adjutant General who knew nothing about that. It says Virgin Islands National Guard, Inc. It doesn't say Virgin Islands right. National Guard. Right, it does Guard. not state association, so uh, therefore we, we are unaware. I personally am unaware of that association, so, you know, without having the benefit of that letter, Okay. I had nothing else to go off of. Okay. So the word association needs to be inserted. Okay, thank you so much, Senator James. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I must say that um, I understand some of the concerns of Director O'Neill, but as we speak about the problems, I just want to hear about the solution moving forward. And I'm happy to hear that Director O'Neill made mention that I guess there, there will be some conversation that needs to be had. We as a first branch of government, we are in charge of the first strings. And when individuals bring their concerns to us, we try to address them. It's also unfortunate that um, I guess the, the process was circumvented. However, moving forward, I hope this might be the first and last in the 34th legislature of the Virgin Islands. Uh, we are one territory. But at the end of the day, I, I do understand that most of these things need to be addressed. As far as the amendment, I know the, the good finance chair will bring those amendments. And as we know about the process, this bill doesn't go straight to the governor's desk as it, if it was passed as is today. Or even with amendments, they still have to go through the committee on rules and judiciary and still do the full body. So hopefully from now until then, we, we have some backdoor conversations to make sure that these issues are addressed so we have a balanced budget. I really don't have any questions because I think this um, committee did a great job of bringing the necessary stakeholders to this committee to provide their um, testimony on why they are seeking such funding. Um, when it comes to the, the African Population Project, I just want to salute the University of the Virgin Islands and the other stakeholders who are involved with that. Um, of course, anything to do with standing in the 10 sleepless nights, we have to preserve that culture in the territory. 
And the list goes on. It speaks about 8% and what have you. I really don't have any questions, Mr. Chair. It's just unfortunate that one minute conversations were, were not being had. And I, I hope this will not mean that individuals will be punished or be reprimanded, you know. I just hope that moving forward that you guys come with a game plan because we are not in no way, shape, or form trying to undermine the administration. We just want to make sure that we address the needs of the entities and as, as well, they are our constituents. But as far as the, um, the VI election, the $150,000 appropriation, I, I, I do support that when it happens. But I understand the concern of Director O'Neill and the, the concerns or the statement that was made by the Madam President. What I don't know if I would ever live to see this, and I'm just throwing it out there. As we speak about funding the general election, I hope and pray one day where the primary election will no longer need to be funded by the government of the Virgin Islands. And if we come together and choose a slate of seven good representatives, and then the seven representatives throw their support behind of whoever would be the titular head, Time. go straight to the general election, that will make history in the Virgin Islands unless we plan to fund it. And when I say we, meaning... Um, the, the party. But once again, I look forward to the amendments. I look forward to further discussions in the Committee of Jurisdiction. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, Senator James. We are submitting the amendment for association after National Guard. Senator Fred Gregory, you recognize. And Richard, the Vice Senator. I initially looked at this measure as a cleanup measure because I knew that a few things were missed in the 2022 um, budget, i.e., um, the one that I mentioned before, the matter with WTJX in particular, and I believe the um, matter with the casino mold remediation and their capital outlay requests. Of course, um, we may have had to reduce that number because of, you know, what came out of our markup. Um, I have to say that I am concerned. Although I am a sponsor on the legislation, and I was, I made it clear why I was a sponsor on the legislation because of the one hundred thousand dollar matter with WTJX. Um, the I'm concerned only because. So earlier this year, we uh, made a commitment to additional resources to float bonds for um, the government employees retirement system. And that $50 million that we committed for fiscal year 2022 is in fact um, included in our budget already. So I have to agree with Director O'Neill that um, you know it would have been more appropriate for us to have a supplemental budget that we worked on in tandem with the um, executive branch so we could determine how best to balance the 2022 budget. Um, adding these additional ancillary items can present a issue um, because I, I think the director spoke to uh, her revenue projections, et cetera. So I just think that we need to be very careful. One minute. Uh, like, let me ask Director O'Neill before my time runs out, when are we going to see the supplemental um, budget? This is a $1.3 million supplemental that we have in front of us, which concerns me. Um, frankly, we did not um, work on this particular supplemental as a finance committee. Much of what I'm reviewing today, if I would be honest, I, it's, it's, I'm seeing it for the first time. So um, when is the supplemental going to come down to the legislature? Because we've been waiting for it for a while. And just give me a quick date, because I have a, a couple other questions before my time run off. Sure. Thank you, Senator. We are actually actively working on it. We hope to have it ready uh, uh, by mid-June. It would be my uh, estimate. Uh, I, this is a question I have for Dr. Hall. So Dr. Hall, the African Population Project, 
Um, did you request this in the FY22 budget? Uh, <clears throat> no, I did not. This project yeah. and these discussions were not even going on at that time. Uh, this is something that uh, thank occurred. Thank you, thank you, sir. My time is going to run out. So the time. Again, I'm concerned with that. We're looking to a new budget. And these are the things that we should consider in our new budget as we as we grapple with the fact that we have to figure out this additional $50 million. We, we have to be um, fiscally prudent as we have this discussion. Um, and again, I'm definitely not in support of the additional funding that we're proposing for the election system at this time. Um, that should be placed appropriately under the FY2023 budget as we move forward with that budget. Um, the other items are minor. So, I mean, you know, I could most definitely support them. I mean, as Director Anil, you are on the J the, the, the board of the, the hospital's board, and you indicated that you are not aware of the $126,000 for GFL, which also concerns me as a board member. You should be aware of that. So there are things here that concerns me. And again, I think what, what matters is when we have these discussions, we work together so we could, you know, collaborate on, you know, figuring out one, do does the revenues cover what we're trying to do, and where are we with the supplemental in this thank particular you. instance? So All I right, do have a time. concern around. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator. And I know that the budget director is quite concerned about. Um, GFL and, and those monies, or did we get the information from GFL? Nothing here popped out of the sky. This is all information that was relayed um, to the Committee of Finance. The Committee of Finance job isn't to find out as to what was the process within the executive branch. That, that's not the Committee of Finance job to find out if find this out person it. was contacted, if this per that, 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 that's not the Committee of Finance job. Okay. It is here, the, the requests that were made, the money is for tourism. Those are not for additional staffing. Those are uh, for increases that were left out of the budget. It's coming from the Tourism uh, Re Revolving Fund. It's for uh, a limited number of employees. I think the amount is only like $60,000. All of these figures came from those entities. You know, so at, at the end of the day, we make a determination as to uh, whether or not we, we voted up or down, and we move forward. Senator Saru, you are uh, Senator the Graf. I'm sorry, you recognize. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I I have seen supplemental budgets before, and again, I the the process in which it was done shows me that it, it needs some serious conversations in the executive branch, serious conversations. Because again, that's like my children spending my money and don't tell me about it, you know, so it's gonna be a problem. But um, as the finance chair, what I was gonna allude to would have been when we deal with the budgets and we deal with markups and stuff, we deal with requests based on things that were left out of budget. And they may not have had the conversations with you, and it's for us to see if we could find the funding. So that's how I look at this. Um, the money is for the, the, the cricket board. I'm, I'm happy to, to see that. Um, you know, if, if I was aware I'd have taken $150,000 for the veterans to travel in this supplemental too. Yeah, I, I, I just wasn't aware of this in time. I said I put in my amendment to get my money in too for the veterans. But, um, like I say, I, I, I think it's going into the 2022 budget. The 2022 budget is coming to an end now. we processing for the 2023. Incidentally, uh, are you presenting a two-year budget this year? Yes, Senator. And I think that hence, that opens the door. So right up to 2024, whether you got the money or not, I have an idea what you're projecting, so... When I bring a supplemental budget, I basically have brought it off of what you already projected. So if you don't go forward with it, that becomes the issue. So again, you could take up the communication. It, that's your branch. Uh, I could address it. But as for this here, with, with some One of the, the individuals that came before, who came to justify what they needed it for, I could support that. And uh, 
some of the things uh, I, I did have the questions. They were answered as we went on. So um, right now, um, I, again, the process is we are doing the process that we are supposed to do in the legislature. So we are following what we are mandated to do. So uh, thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Senator DeGraff. Uh, Director O'Neill, the supplemental that you're going to be, that you're working on for June, is it going to increase or decrease the budget? I, I don't know if you're speaking, I can't hear you. I, uh, okay, it's back. Yeah. Uh, so it, it will increase uh, the budget. Um, the reason why I have not brought it yet, again, is because I needed to that's, have verification on funding. That's uh, fine. I just wanted to see know. exactly what we've collected so I just, far. I just wanted to know if it would be an increase or decrease. So <laughs> we're looking at a supplemental before the legislature or sent down sometime in June, maybe pass in a session July with, with two months left that would increase the budget. And Senator, to, to, to be clear, it may be just like last year where we did uh, some reductions because of savings to different departments and we did a lot of reprogramming. It would be along those same lines. There may okay. be a slight increase, but we are looking at re reprogramming as well. Okay, so if we have some reprogramming and savings, I think we just found the million dollars that this budget is going to increase by because you're going to be reprogramming and saving. We're going to look at all of the vacant positions, et cetera. So I know right within the budget that we have, we'll be able to find this particular million dollars. Senator Saro, you recognize? Well, not necessarily, Senator. They, we remember, you. this is something outside of what we're already working on. So this would be in addition to the other things that are needed. So... Just, uh, we don't, I don't, I cannot say that we would have this funding at, at this point. Okay, thank you. I just asked for Ms. Fox uh, to come on the line, colleagues, before we move on to the next person. Um, Ms. Fox, can you speak to the justification for the monies that you requested? And it was 450, but we may, um, cut it to 350 because we're not doing, and I don't think the constitutional issue is going to come up for this budget, for this particular election cycle. Ms. Fox, if you can uh, speak to your request. Good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm trying to be on my way to the airport, so I'm not going to put on my camera. Yes, good afternoon, um, senators and the get, um, guests that's on. Usually, we have tried this process before requesting the money in the year before the cycle. The election starts, the election day is November 8th. And when you start a fiscal year in October, we usually doesn't get the allotment timely in October. In fact, this month, I just got the allotment today, and this is April. So the allotment usually come mid-month or ending of the month. If we're preparing for an election, we have to start doing things, contracts, vendors, etc., prior to November 8th. So we do not do spending on the day of election. All this is done prior to the election. And that's why we requested a budget two years ago that way, and we got that budget in the prior fiscal year. So, Ms. Fox, you're saying that the last election cycle that the monies were given to you before? Yes. Two years ago when we asked for the um, budget, we got it before. Okay, thank you. We got both the primary and the general allotment in the same fiscal year. Thank you so much, and that's why my comment was that it has been... There's nothing illegal in doing it this way um, whatsoever because I'm glad that you're able to confirm that it has been done that way before. So thank you so much. Senator Saro, you recognize. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, Ms. Fox, and she is traveling, so she won't be able to stay on the line. Senator Saro, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm a little peeved. Um, and the election component with a constitutional convention. And the convention was signed on blue in July, performed in November, was heard finally in January, and a committee of the whole has been scheduled for me. There were internal delays in the process. Therefore, the constitutional convention bill won't make it to the election cycle because we delayed this 
in-house. And I don't know what the intent was, but it's finally being, after begging for a committee the whole date, we finally get a date in May, May 10th. Hence why we're discussing this today. Now, um, Dr. Hall. Yes, Sandra. Are you there? Yes, you I were am. Cut off, you were cut off before in answering the African Population Project question. Can you expound on that, please, or what you're saying? I was just indicating that uh, when, <clears throat> in response to the question, that this was not a part of the university's uh, 2022 budget request because the conversations between Sen um, former Senator Myron Jackson, George Tyson, and the university only started a few months ago. Um, <clears throat> and so this was not a part of this, uh, of the university's normal request. This is more, and I take responsibility for this, this is more external entities saying to the university, will you take this on? And <clears throat> the university responding, we think this is of service to the territory. And so if there is funding made available, we would take this on because it's worthy but this is not something that goes through our normal uh, budget request process. One minute. Okay. Because um, I know the African Population Project started about 10 years ago, and um, UVI has been the, the institution of higher learning. The only one that we have um, would be the repository of that information as we are you know, in a strange era discussing identity and um, colonialism and the impacts of that and, you know, from whence we came. So I, I, I if there is funding, then I, I agree that UVI should take that project on. Director O'Neill, how are you this afternoon? Don't give me a I'm side well, eye. thank you. Good. Human services and there are many vacancies. How many unfunded, how many unfilled vacancies do we have right now in this government? That's a great question. Uh, I I do not have an answer for you for what's unfilled. Do you can you human services, for example, have they filled at least a quarter of their vacancies? Time. Uh honestly, Senator, I cannot answer that. They have they they've said yes, but I do not know. You know the answer is yes. I, I don't know, honestly. I just said that to say that we have, year after year, we fund vacancies in this government. And you and I both know that DHS, DOE, and the like come back with the same vacancies that we funded. So I, I think that the budget does have funding for the supplemental budget. Thank you for the time. Mr. Right. So if we allow us to finalize our process so that we can, you know, do some reprogramming of those vacancies, then we can definitely accommodate uh, additional requests that may or have come in. But without having the opportunity to do that, especially past allowing for six months to go by, so I know I have a better idea of what's left, uh, it does put us in a, put me let me put it that way. It does put me in a very uncomfortable position of saying yes to a number of things when I do not know for certain. I like to work from numbers and I like to work from data. And I do not have that at this particular moment, which makes me uncomfortable saying yes to a number of these things. And if I could just say one other thing, uh, relative to increases for uh, salaries, et cetera, there is a process for that. Uh, department heads cannot cannot approve increases for salaries on their own. There's a process, especially if those are exempt employees, namely Department of Tourism. Those employees or letters must be sent to the Office of the Governor for approval before uh, raises can happen. So to, to uh, uh, appropriate funding for raises that may not happen is not the best use of those dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Director O'Neill. Is Senator Francis Heilago? Uh, 
Saint Francis Heiliger, I don't think that she is there in the well. Uh, the committee will take a recess for one minute so that we can vote on this measure. Hold the bill for a minute. Okay. The Committee of Finance is back on the record. Uh, we are going to amend the bill, section one, the section that deals the Department of Licensing and Consumer Affairs to strike A, which would be one and two. That has been submitted and the Virgin Islands National Association Guard Inc. National Guard Association Inc. Association uh, will be inserted. Uh, that amendment has been submitted. Uh, do I hear a motion on Bill Number Thirty Four Zero Two Two Six? Motion. Motion, Senator Saro. Mr. Chair, move that Bill Number Thirty Four Zero Two Two Six, an Act amending Act Numbers Eight Four Seven Four, Eight Four Seven Nine, Eight Four Eight Six, Eight Four Nine Four, Eight Four Nine Six, and Eight Four Nine Eight to adjust the fiscal year 2022 budget to appropriate funds to the Casino Control Commission for capital outlay, WTJX for capital outlay and satellite uplink respectively, election system of the Virgin Islands for general election, Virgin Islands Cricket Board, Department of Tourism for personnel and fringe benefits, Virgin Islands Board of Nurse Licensure for personnel and fringe benefits, an 8% salary restoration, Social Security and Medicare taxes reimbursement to the Economic Development Authority, Governor Wang F. Louis Hospital and Medical Center, and the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority be favorably approved by this committee and forwarded to the Committee on Rules and Judiciary for further consideration. I so move. Motion made by Senator Saro. Do I hear a second? Second. Um, motion seconded by Senator Second, Blyden. Senator Bielen. Thank you so much. Motion seconded by Senator Blyden. Our roll call. Senator Marvin A. Blyden. Yay. Yeah. Senator Blyden, yay. Senator Samuel Carillon. Senator Carillon, absent. Senator Dwayne M. DeGraff. Yes. Senator DeGraff, <clears throat> yay. Senator Donna A. Fred Gregory. No. Senator Fred Gregory, nay. Senator Javon E. James Sr. Senator James Sr., absent. Senator Janelle K. Saro. Yes. Senator Saro, yay. Senator Kurt A. Viale. Senator Viale, yay. Mr. Chair, you have four yays, one nay, two absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Bill number 34 that's 0226, and I come in then acts number 8474, 8478, 8486, 8494, 8496, and the one was 86 before, and 8498 to adjust the fiscal year 2022 budget to appropriate funds to the Casino Control Commission for Capital Outlay, WTGX or Capital Outlay and Satellite Uplink, respectively, 
Elections System of the Virgin Islands for the General Election, Virgin Islands Cricket Board Department of Tourism for Personnel and Fringe Benefits, Virgin Islands Board of Nurse Licensure for Personnel and Fringe Benefits, and 8% Salary Restoration, Social Security and Medicare Taxes, Reimbursement uh, to the Economic Development Authority, Governor Wang and Fluey Hospital and Medical Center, and the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority has received a favorable vote in this committee and will be sent to the committee of rules and judiciary for further consideration. I want to thank everyone that testified on this particular measure. We're going to go straight into the next measure, colleagues. We're going to take a one minute recess, bring those individuals into the well, and then we hit the last bill on the agenda. This committee stands at recess for one minute.
The Committee of Finance is back on the record. Madam Clerk, read the last item on the agenda. Bill number 34-0197, an act amending Title 33, Virgin Islands Code, Subtitle 1, Part I, Chapter 3, Section 43, Subsection E, relating to the submittal of bills or invoices that separately state Gross receipt, gross receipt taxes to account for the receipt, for the receipt and, distribution and distribution of federal assistance, of federal assistance to the government of the Virgin Islands and related payments to its contractors, proposed by Senator Marvin A. Blyden. Invited testifiers, Dana Clendenin, Interim Executive Director, Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority. Joel Lee, Director, Virgin Islands Bureau of Internal Revenue, Adrian Dudley, partner Dudley Rich LLP, Scott Edelman Sr., Senior Vice President, AECOM, John Grant, Chief Financial Officer, APTIM, Geraldine McGrath Holland, Business Administrative Director, Falcon USVI, Claude Shaq Hawkins, Executive Director, Polaris Engineering Company. Miguel Quinones, Managing Partner, Island Services Group. Charisma Elin, Disaster Recovery Specialist, AECOM. And Dr. Rashida Harris, Chief Operating Officer, Impact Construction. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Who speaks to Bill Number Thirty Four Zero One Nine Seven? I do. I do, Mr. Chair. Proceed, Senator Blyden. Thank you. I would like to introduce Bill Number Thirty Four Zero One Nine Seven, an Act amending Title Thirty Three, Virgin Islands Code, Subtitle One, Part One, Chapter Three, Section Forty Three. Subsection E, relating to the submittal of bills or invoices that separately that separately state gross receipt taxes to account for the receipt and distribution of federal assistance to the government of the Virgin Islands and related payments to its contractors. Mr. Chair, I have a four-point presentation that's going to explain the intent and the purpose and understanding of this bill. And media, put up the PowerPoint presentation, please begin. Bill number 34.0197, a path to maximizing value of federal disaster assistance. Next. Understanding bill number 34.0197. What does this legislation do? The legislation allows road receipt tax to be itemized on invoices in specific situations for federally funded projects. The legislation brings an immediate benefit to the government of the Virgin Islands of at least $3 million with additional revenues going forward. Why do we need this legislation? FEMA will not reimburse vendors for GRT pay to the GBI without an itemized invoice. Virgin Islands laws forbids itemization of GTR on invoices except for vehicle purchases. This bill fixes the problem by allowing GTR, GRT itemization on contracts that require itemization of pass-through costs. Next slide. Will the legislation reduce GTR collections? No. The proposed legislation will not reduce GTR collection. The proposed legislation could increase GRT collections. GRT will continue to be automatically deducted from any payments made to vendors for Bureau of Internal Revenue guidelines. Next. This is just a flowchart for bill number 34.0197, which is a win-win reform for the VI federally funded projects. Currently, um, bills are padded, you know, are uh, $50 million GRT automatically paid toward the GBI. And say, for instance, if it's a $1 billion contract, 
This is just an example of how it will look. And after the bid is passed, if the bid is passed, um, the bid will be accurate. The state will get their $50 million GRT, which will be paid to the government directly up front. And then the, in a back end, the federal government will reimburse $50 million to the vendor. And the, the government of the Virgin Islands also will collect an additional $2.5 million. Next slide. How Bill number 34.0197 benefits the territory. The government of the Virgin Islands immediate benefit of $3 million in GRT revenues reduced over billing going forward over $20 million in additional revenues in the next five years in disaster relief funds, mitigation hazard funds, etc. And it will actually bring additional honest contractors to come to the table and bid on projects moving forward. Local contractors and subcontractors immediately benefit with over $5 million in reimbursements and going forward, potentially over $100 million in reimbursement over the next five years. The VA economy and workers, due to the multiply effect, hundreds of millions of dollars will circulate in a VI economy, creating jobs and business opportunity for many Virgin Islanders. Next slide. Does bill number 34.0197 create an unusual practice? The federal government reimburses contractors for many pass-through costs, including some travel, security, real property rental, and state tax paid. Because of our local laws, the VI is the only, I repeat, the VI is the only jurisdiction in the U.S. where federal contractors cannot be reimbursed for state taxes paid. VI law requires the itemization of GRT on invoices for vehicle purchases. This ensures that car buyers know exactly what they are paying for. Bill number 34.0197 will establish the same transparency for federally funded contracts. If transparency is important for a transaction of 15 to say 50K when it comes to cars, isn't it much more important for transactions that may involve billions of dollars? Ask yourself that question. Next slide, please. Role of administrative agencies. The mechanics of exactly how invoice will be handled is not legislative, it's legislative in manner, but administrative. We are prepared to add specific language authorizing and directing the Bureau of Internal Review to promulgate rules and regulation governing this process. Next slide. And we may ask the question, what happens if we do nothing. Flows out of contracts, delayed local contractors waiting for payments. Contractors and subcontractors may pursue legal action for breach of contract. Honest and capable contractors will hesitate to bid because they don't want to face this terrible choice. Take the 5% beating or pad their books. The GBI will lose $3 million in revenue this year alone and tens of millions in years to come. Over the next five years, the VI economy will fail to get the benefits of over $100 million in economic activity that would result from the reimbursement of local subcontractors. Colleagues, I'm asking that you listen to the testimony, ask your appropriate question, do your proper betting, and let's give our local small contractors, a piece of the pie. Let's assure that the government of the Virgin Islands gets its fair share of federal dollars and that we can assure that we are on the same playing field as our counterparts in the United States. Thank you so much for the time, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank my team, my capable team, for putting this um, point presentation together over the past several weeks. They did a great job. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Blyden, for that tower explanation. I'm now going to allow the testifiers to put the name and title on the record. I'm going to begin with uh, Director Clendenin, since she's virtual.
Good afternoon. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Dana Clendenin, Interim Executive Director, um, Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority. Thank you so much. Um, St. Croix, starting with... Good day, Senator. My name is Joel Lee. I am the Director of the Bureau of Internal Revenue. Thank you. Next. Good day, Senator. Claude Shack Hawkins. Pull the mic. Good day, Senator. Claude Shack Hawkins, uh, Executive Director of Players Engineering. Thank you so much. St. Thomas, starting with Attorney Dudley, and then going across. Give my voice. Adrian Dudley, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Senator. Just go ahead, Attorney. Adrian Dudley. Nope. You're good. There. Now it's on. Okay. My name is Adrian Dudley, and uh, with me today, my fellow testifiers. I can introduce them to you, please. We would allow them to introduce next. themselves so they could put their name on the record. Uh, next. I'm sorry. We're going to allow them to put the, oh, their name on the course. record. Of course, Senator. I can save my voice. Thank you. Yes. Next. Scott Edelman, Senior Vice President with AECOM. Next. John Grant, Chief Financial Officer of Aptim. Next. Jerry McGrath Holland, HR and Business Administrative Director at Falcon USVI. Next. Jerry McGrath Holland, HR and Business Administrative Director at Falcon USVI. I got you. The next person next to you. Miguel Quinones a project manager and managing partner of Island Services Group. Charisma to Tiny Lean, disaster recovery specialist. Okay, thank you so much. We also have virtually Ms. williams Octoline. Can you put your name and title on the record? Good afternoon, Adrian williams Octoline, Director, Office of Disaster Recovery. Thank you, and Ms. Valdez, Shelford. Good afternoon, Valdez Shelfer, Chief Financial Officer, Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority. Okay, thank you so much. Um, did I miss someone? On St. Thomas? Okay, if anyone else comes in the well, I will allow them to put the name and title on the record after. Okay, we're going to begin with the testimony. I'm, I, I'm going to begin with Acting Director Clendenin. Okay, do we, good afternoon. We, one minute, um, Director. Do we have someone else that needs to put the name on the record? Hello? Yes, you may mm -hmm. proceed. Okay, there we go. Good afternoon. Um, Rasha Harris, I'm Chief Financial, uh, sorry, that's John. I'm Chief Operating Officer of Impact Construction here in St. Thomas. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Clendena, you may proceed. Good day, Kurt VLA, Finance Committee Chair, members of the Finance Committee, other senators present, the listening and viewing audience. I am Dana Clendenin, Interim Executive Director of the Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority. Today, I appear before you accompanied by Ms. Valdez Shelford, Chief Financial Officer, and Ms. Adrian williams Octolin, the Governor's Authorized Representative and the Director of the Office of Disaster Recovery, to provide you with the authority's requested testimony on the proposed legislation, Bill Number 34-0197, an act amending Title 33, Virgin Islands Code, Subtitle 1, Part 1, Chapter 3, Section 43, Subsection E, related to the submittal of bills or invoices that separately state gross receipt taxes to account. From our assessment, this proposed law seeks to, one, allow invoices related to federal assistance to include gross receipt taxes as a separate line item for federal funding invoices going forward, and two, apply this to any matters involving claims for disaster assistance pending on the effective date of the act. 
It appears that the intent of this bill is to right a perceived wrong on behalf of hurricane disaster contractors, ACOM and Aptiv. And it is our position that crafting legislation to benefit two specific companies today may cause irreparable harm tomorrow. Further, this bill does not address how tier three companies, those not directly subcontracted and among them local subcontractors under ACOM and Aptim, who have not been paid yet for their work, can benefit from this legislation. Further, there's no written rule or regulation or letter guaranteeing that the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA in this case, would authorize such reimbursement provided by this proposed bill, since the existing law at the time of the emergency stated that gross receipts cannot be separated. According to FEMA guidelines, the local law existing at the time of the declared disaster is controlling. By way of background, on October 27, 2017, FEMA issued guidance authorizing the execution of the Sheltering and Temporary Essential Power STEP program, known locally as the Emergency Home Repairs Virgin Islands EHRVI program. In addition, the governor appointed the Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority as the lead territorial representative on the United Housing Task Force on December 6, 2017. As the territorial agency assigned to administer the STEP program, VIHFA issued a request for proposals on January 4, 2018, seeking proposals from a qualified general contractor or construction management firm. As a result, two contractors were, two contracts rather were awarded, one to AECOM and one to Apton. The VIHFA formally evaluated and rated each bid according to the same criteria. And in February 2018, the VIHFA awarded ACOM a contract based on its high rank rankings to perform the scope of work identified in the RFP to manage step repairs. Several months later, VIHFA also selected Apton to perform permanent roof repairs under step. GRT was not gross receipt taxes was not explicitly mentioned in the solicitation documents or the final step contracts, although the reimbursement of taxes was included. The VIHFA and ACOM entered into a contract for construction repair services for STEP program in February 2018. Under the contract as amended, VIHFA agreed to compensate ACOM through a combination of unit rate pricing, hourly rate pricing, and reimbursement of pass-through costs. The VIHFA entered into a similar contract with Apton. There are two relevant sections on the bull contracts that need to be brought to your attention. First, ACOM Section 7 Payment Process Subsection B of the contract also states in part, while the remaining pass-through costs will include a 10% administrative handling fee, the components of this fee are not defined in the contract. AECOM has invoiced over $40 million of administrative handling fee costs. Second, AECOM Section 10, Administrative and Compliance Provisions, Subsection E, and Apton Section 11, Administrative and Compliance Provisions, Subsection E, taxes and each state. I'm sorry, taxes each state, contractors responsible for paying all applicable taxes from the funds to be received under this contract. With this in mind, the VI Office of the Attorney General has taken the position that AECOM cannot invoice separately for GRT costs under VI code. VIHFA has contended that it would pay what was legally allowable, defined in the contract, documented, and therefore reimbursable under FEMA's public assistance program. For the public's information, the GRT tax of 5% of all ACOM and Apton invoices has already been remitted to the U.S. Bureau of Internal Revenue, therefore consistent with the VI code. A little over $533 million of ACOM invoices have been paid, 95%. Over $507 million has been remitted to ACOM, while 5% of this amount, a little over $26 million, has been remitted to VIBIR. $142 million of Aptim invoices have been paid.
Uh, 135 million has been remitted to Apton, while 5% of this amount, a little over 7 million, has been remitted to VIBIR. Accordingly, these invoices have already been paid by FEMA and HUD, and the proof of uh, and the proof of payment for both ACOM and VIBIR has been pro been provided to FEMA and HUD. Therefore, there are no known or anticipated compliance concerns regarding payments that have been made and to retroactively implement the proposed provisions may upend FEMA's established determination of what is due. The IHFA has worked through an extensive multi-year exercise to satisfy FEMA that the costs incurred on the STEP program were appropriately documented. FEMA only reimburses expenses that are considered ordinary, necessary, and reasonable. It is important to note that through the lengthy obligation process, FEMA has already established the cost reasonableness of the STEP program without considering a separate 5% reimbursement for GRT. Therefore, it is uncertain how this increase would impact FEMA's determination of cost reasonableness. We understand from VITEMA and the Office of Disaster Recovery that this is the same approach that has been taken with all payments process across all disaster recovery programs. In conclusion, I strongly urge this body to think about the substantial impact changing the existing law for two companies will have, particularly and in this case, when there's no guarantee that FEMA will approve. Such legislation could be interpreted as a violation of Section 8 of the Revised Organic Act of 1954 as amended and federal law made applicable to the U.S. Virgin Islands. Senators Ms. Shelford and I, along with Director williams Octolin, remain available to answer questions. Thank you for your testimony, Director Lee. Greetings, Honorable Kurt Avila, Chairman of the Committee of Finance, and all other honorable members of the 34th Legislature present. Greetings to persons present in the chambers and the listening and viewing audience. I am Joel A. Lee, Director of the Virgin Islands Bureau of Internal Revenue. I appear before you today to offer testimony on Bill Number 34-0197, which seeks to amend Title 33, Chapter 3, Section 43, Subsection E of the Virgin Islands Code by inserting and accept on bills or invoices that separately state gross receipt tax to account for receipts and distribution of federal assistance to the government of the Virgin Islands and related payments to its contractors. The stated purpose of this bill, as indicated by the explanation of the bill, is to allow for gross receipt tax to be displayed as a separate line item only as it pertains to claims for disaster assistance that are pending before the government of the Virgin Islands on or after the effective date of this bill, if it becomes law. Title 33, Section 43, subsection B, defines gross receipts as all receipts, cash or accrued without deduction for taxes. A taxpayer who is a building contractor will pay gross receipts tax on funds received, whether from federal funds, local funds, or from a private homeowner who is rebuilding his or her property. This amendment will not change the amount of tax owed by the contractor, nor will it affect the upfront withholding requirement by government agencies and instrumentalities pursuant to Title 33, Virgin Island Code, Section 43, Subsection C. This bill seeks to permit taxpayers to line item the gross receipts tax on a bill or invoice. Taxpayers will continue to pay gross receipts tax on all funds received as defined by Title 33, Section 43, Subsection E. The general rule is that the gross receipt tax should not be separated on a bill or invoice. The exception to the rule, as anticipated in this bill, will apply to each and every contract of the government who will receive any amount of the billions of federal funding that the government of the Virgin Islands is expected to pay out in future years. The exception, therefore, is extremely broad, and it can technically apply to every construction contractor, subcontractor, or retailer that may receive related payments from the government under our disaster recovery projects. 
Because the language is so broad, the Bureau will be placed in a position of having to police an area of the gross receipts tax law that it did not exist that did not exist before. As you are aware, exceptions are narrowly construed, and it will be the Bureau's job to enforce compliance based on the intent of this body. The words used in the exception are too general and thus much harder to enforce. If these special contractors are permitted to separately identify their gross receipt tax on invoices contrary to the normal provisions of Section 43, subsection E, what is to prevent other local businesses from asking for the same relief and attempting to pass the tax onto the consumer since it will now be separately stated? This will cause chaos to the gross receipt tax system. The last thing the government needs at this point in time is for the tweaking of the gross receipts legislation to be taken by the bondholders as a sign of instability in the law or the imposition of a change that may impair the gross receipt bonds. This section of the bill will not change the definition of gross receipts for the purposes of calculating the gross receipts tax. In addition, Title 33, Section 43, Subsection E, and Section 44 will continue to require that all entities and instrumentalities of the government withhold the 5% and remit it to the Bureau. What this section of the bill will do is, one, open the door to potential lawsuits as it relates to those unknown contractors who can now separately state the gross receipts tax on a bill or invoice. Two, create confusion since it will now cause some contractors to erroneously pass the gross receipts tax onto the consumer in direct contradiction of the law. And three, increase the errors in the calculation of the gross receipts tax the tax is calculated on an amount other than a gross amount. Section 2 states that this change will apply to any claims for disaster assistance presently pending before the government on or after the date of this bill. This language suggests that there must be some form of retroactive application and invoices already submitted for payment should be revised in some fashion. It would appear to open the door for revisions of invoices that may have already been vetted more than four years ago. The Bureau believes that the Office of Disaster Recovery, which is the government's authorized representative for federal funding, should be asked to respond to the practical effects of this change and provide more specific guidance on what is needed to ensure that the government continues to meet its obligations for federal reimbursement. Mr. Chairman, thank you for affording me the opportunity to testify on this bill. I am available to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you, Director. Attorney Dudley. Good afternoon, Chairman VLA and Vice Chair, Senator Brett Gregory and committee members, fellow testifiers, and members of the listening and viewing audience. Once again, my name is Adrian Dudley, and my fellow testifiers have already been introduced to you. What does this bill do, really do? Bill amends the first receipt tax law, yes, because GRT may not be itemized on an invoice. This bill would only create an explicit exception federal contract which require a contract to itemize GRT. Now, why do we need to do this? Typically, GRT is built in. It's not separately identified as a cost in contracts with the government or anybody else. The invoiced amounts of GRT is bundled in. But in some cases, such as with the STEP program, the GRT is articulated in a line item in the contract as a pass-through cost 
when a federally funded contract requires that an invoice itemize all pass-through costs, this legislation would permit that itemization. One case illustrates this point. HFA and A did indeed enter into a contract for construction repair services for the STEP program, sheltering temporary essential power for emergency home repairs. The contract was entered into on February 2nd, 2018. <clears throat> Under the contract as amended, BIHFA agreed to compensate ACOM through, as Director Blendenen pointed out, a combination of unit rate pricing, hourly rate pricing, and reimbursement of pass-through costs. Now, in the contract itself, there is a section to which Director Clendenin referred, but not in whole. It is called payment process. Subsection B of the contract describes how these paths through costs would be itemized in two categories, actual cost or a specific set of costs related to subcontractors that had an administrative handling fee of 10%. This contract states, and I'm gonna give you the exact words, pass through costs may be submitted as incurred. Pass through costs include the items on exhibit seven. There was an exhibit to the contract Exhibit 7, and at the very top, it said taxes. It included builder's risk insurance, bid bonds, performance bonds, and even, because we're here, the social costs of terminating employment of local staff, if as and when that would occur. At the end of a phase of the program, or at the end of the program itself. At the end of the program, actual costs incurred are invoice plus the other costs that were set aside related to the sub. The STEP program did this because the government wanted more residents to be helped. There was a $25,000 cap on repairs under phase one of the STEP program. Had soft costs such as taxes and insurance been factored into the cost of repair materials and the like, fewer residents would have been eligible for the program. That's why we have this unusual situation. Let me emphasize, DRT was included in the contract, but removed at the express request of the agency from the unit prices at the request, at its request, so that more homeowners would benefit under the cap established by FEMA. Why do we have to amend a statute to accomplish the reimbursement of GRT to all of the contractors sitting with me today? The Code of Federal Reg Regulations requires under the terms of this contract that federal grants recipients like Housing Finance Authority 
establish and maintain accurate records for all project costs. The legislation is also necessary because conflicts between Virgin Islands law and federal law with regard to federal funding would be avoided. The Virgin Islands must be able to attract the best companies and the best companies from everywhere, including in the Virgin Islands, to do federally funded work. All companies doing this work seek certainty and confidence that their eligible project costs will be paid and that sufficient transparency exists in their invoicing to allow federal auditors to trace the funds expended. Section two of this bill allows funds to be reimbursed in contracts that have not been closed out, that are still open. That makes this bill not retroactive. These funds are still to be submitted and paid to the Virgin Islands government and then to the contractors to be covered by this amendment. What will happen if we do this? There will be two ways for companies to recover GRT expenses, which are a legitimate cost of doing business in the territory. GRT costs can be incorporated into the contract price of goods and services, as is the typical case. Or, if so required, GRT costs can be separately stated in an invoice if the federally funded contract so requires. Either way, the company providing services recovers the GRT expense and the recipient of the services pays the total contract amount. Let me emphasize, the IRB, as Director Lee just pointed out, will always withhold 5% of invoice payments regardless of whether the GRT costs are incorporated into the pricing or the GRT is separately stated. Either way, the GRT is in there, we all know it is, and the GRT withheld by IRB for the benefit of this territory and its revenues will not be negatively impacted. Is this bill Retroactive. No, this amendment applies to pending and future projects. The amendment does not, by its terms, apply retroactively. Rather, it addresses a legal issue in the territory for documentation of costs necessary to meet a federal contract requirement. Is this bill special legislation? No, it applies to all federal contractors, which require taxes to be itemized. To our knowledge, this step contract is the only such contract today. But many more federal dollars will be coming to the territory not just the remaining funds for this disaster recovery, but for many other projects, such as those to be funded by the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, signed into law just last year on November 15th. Thank you, members of the Finance Committee, for your consideration of this potential legislation. This concludes my prepared testimony, and I turn it over to my colleague, Senior Vice President at ACOM, Scott Edelman, and 
we welcome your questions. Thank you, Attorney Dudley. Uh, Ms. Adelman, you may proceed. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, to committee chairman, Kurt Vile, vice chair, Donna, Fred Gregory, committee members, fellow testifiers, and members of the listening and viewing audience. I am Scott Edelman, Vice President of AECOM. AECOM helped the territory recover from the devastating hurricanes of Irma and Maria. I respectfully submit these remarks today on behalf of AECOM to support Bill Number 340197, which amends the gross receipts tax <laughs> statutes to permit contractors to itemize gross receipt tax expenses on invoices for federally funded reimbursable projects, as may be required. HFA required that GRT be removed from all pricing to maximize the number of homes repaired. This provision was passed down to our contractors. The issue is that HFA has not accepted our invoices for taxes. After four years of trying to fix this problem, in December of 2021, the Attorney General stated that the best way to fix the problem may be to amend the GRT statute. Overall, this is approximately a $60 million issue. I have five points I would like to make today. These are, first, FEMA is anticipating these GRT invoices. The following table in my testimony indicates FEMA anticipates that HFA and ODR firms with FEMA the payment of GRT. February 2018, FEMA generated a funding worksheet that included a line item that said GRT at 5%. In June of 2019, HFA sent a letter to FEMA listing contractually approved items, including taxes. In July of 2019, ODR sent to FEMA a letter to FEMA stating non-construction costs include taxes. October 2020, HFA submitted a cost reasonableness report. This report stated gross receipt tax is excluded from this report and will be discussed with FEMA at a later date. April 2021, FEMA requested additional information and included a new funding sheet that included a row for anticipated GRT to be paid for pending further discussion. The problem is not FEMA reimbursing GRT. The problem is that FEMA has not received any GRT invoices for processing. GRT is a federally fund reimbursable expense. Second, all contractors will continue to pay GRT. There is not one paragraph, one sentence, one word in this legislation that allow anyone from not paying GRT. The AECOM team has and will continue to pay GRT. Third, time is running out for the Virgin Islands to collect money from FEMA. It is likely that late summer or early fall will be the last opportunity for HFA to request reimbursement from FEMA. With this legislative process and then HFA and ODR review of the GRT invoices, time will be very tight. Fourth, what happens if GRT is not paid according to the contract? The GRT provision was passed down to 15 of our subcontractors. It is highly likely that at least one of these subcontractors will file a claim against AECOM for GRT expenses. If and when this happens, the rest of the subcontractors may join in and HFA will be added as a third party defendant. Assuming the courts find that HFA must pay AECOM for its GRT expenses, HFA would be time barred from seeking reimbursement from FEMA. Any judgment against HFA would result in adverse impacts against the territory. Fifth, 
FEMA reimbursing GRT will not take money away from any other Virgin Islands program. The STEP program was set up in a variable cost manner by Congress. If the project costs less than the anticipated amount, less is received. If the project costs more, more than more is paid. The money to reimburse GRT cannot be used for any other purpose, such as road, roads, schools, or wastewater treatment plants. In summary, HFA's heart was in the right place. HFA wanted to maximize the fixing of homes. To meet this goal, HFA required the itemizing of GRT. The passing of this bill will allow AECOM to reimburse and make whole GRT paid by contractors, including local contractors. Your consideration of this bill is appreciated. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, next, let's have Mr. Grant, John Grant. Thank you. The Honourable Kurt VLA Chairman, the Honourable Donna Fred Gregory, Vice Chair, and members of the 34th Legislature Finance Committee. I am John Grant, Chief Financial Officer of Aptim Corp. Aptim respectfully submits this statement in support of Bill 340197, which would update Title 33, Virgin Islands Code, Section 43E, to remove the prohibition against itemization of U.S. Virgin Islands gross receipts tax. Biden's, Senator Biden's raising his hand. No. Good to continue. Thank yes, you, Senator. Uh, gross receipts tax One. on invoices submitted by by contractors performing certain federally funded projects. Aptim is proud to have been selected to perform a number of projects for the benefit of residents of the USVI, including Mr. recent work constructing and or renovating facilities committed to education Mr. and health care and me, work bringing thousands of homes. Mr. Grant, give me one condition. minute. Mr. Grant, give me uh, one second. I'm going to allow you to continue, but let me just... Um, quickly take a one minute recess. Just give me one minute. The committee stands at recess for one minute.
The Committee of Finance is back on the record. Mr. Grant, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chairman. Aptim is proud to have been selected to perform a number of projects for the benefit of residents of the USVI, including recent work constructing and are renovating facilities committed to education and healthcare and work bringing thousands of homes back to a livable condition. As a highly experienced and well-respected provider of disaster recovery and resiliency services to federal, state, territorial, and local governments, we understand the difficulties presented by the host of federal regulations and their interplay with local laws. This interplay sometimes reveals anomalies that create unintended consequences. One such anomaly, the one that Bill 34-0197 will remedy, is the unnecessary conflict between, on one hand, federal regulations that rightly require sufficient transparency in contractor invoicing to allow federal auditors to trace funds expended, and Title 33 Virgin's Island Code, Section 43E, which is strictly applied, prohibits itemization of GRT on contractor invoices, even for purposes of receiving appropriate reimbursement from a federal funding source. We do not imagine the drafters of the code intended this situation, and there is good reason to remedy it now in advance of the next storm season and in advance of what may be a significant set of federal expenditures under the upcoming infrastructure package. Consider, for example, the practical implications of a contractor bidding this work. On one hand, if the contractor understands the implications of Section 43E, an amount equal to the estimated GRT will have to be placed somewhere in a bid in a non-transparent manner in order to recover this actual cost of performing the work. This is of no benefit to anyone, and in fact will cause line items on contractor bid sheets to be skewed in various and inconsistent ways, such that they become less easily comparable. This is not a procurement best practice. On the other hand, a contractor that does not account for the implications of Section 43E may transparently include a line item for recovery of GRT on its bid submission and then in its invoices. This contractor, having acted transparently and according to the normal rules by which a federal agency will reimburse a contractor for customary and reasonable taxes incurred in performance of the work, will find that the GRT is deemed non-reimbursable by the local agency solely because A, it is itemized in a transparent manner, and B, this itemization is currently disallowed under local law alone. This contractor will pay the GRT as it must, but the GRT amount will not be passed along by the local agency for reimbursement by the federal payer. This is the situation for Aptim. We are accustomed to transparently itemizing and invoicing required taxes including GRT-type taxes on federally reimbursable projects. We therefore did not spread this cost throughout our bid in order to avoid the inconsistency between our, what our contract allows and what Section 43E disallows. As is made clear by our contract language, which specifically allows recovery of GRT, Section 43E sets up a wholly unnecessary restriction, not in the best interests of the territory, the contractor, or the federal agency. The federal agency, after all, intended to fairly reimburse its contractors and their subcontractors, generally including small business subcontractors, the costs of doing the work, including local taxes. Thus, a contractor who, for example, incurs $1,000 in actual costs will only be reimbursed $950, which does not cover the costs incurred to perform the work. This is an unfair result likely not intended by the drafters of the USBI legislation, and it is to no one's advantage. Fortunately, this anomaly is easily remedied. The US Virgin Islands has incurred, and unfortunately will continue to incur, damages caused by natural disasters. When this happens, FEMA and other federal agencies are bound upon presidential declaration to provide aid for recovery and to improve the resiliency of the territory. Further increased federal infrastructure spending is likely incoming in the near term. When these highly regulated federal dollars are in play, Aptim hopes to continue serving the people of the territory. And we would, on behalf of the contracting community, very much appreciate the ability to transparently bid and invoice actual costs, including GRT, in furtherance of this work. 
USBI procurement officials also deserve to see the GRT line item in bids submitted by various contractors so that they can know with greater confidence that the remaining bid sheet line items are truly comparable. This will help them to select the contractor that offers the best value to the people of the VSEI. In our view, transparency is always the right outcome. Captain very much appreciates the opportunity to submit this statement in support of bill number 34-0197. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to have, um, Zaria was distracted for, for one second. Uh, next, we'll have Ms. Geraldine mcgrath Holland. Good afternoon, Committee Chair, Honorable Senator Kurt Villay, and Vice Chair, Honorable Senator Donna Freight Gregory, members of the Committee on Finance, fellow testifiers, and members of the viewing and listening audience. My name is Jerry McGrath Holland, and I'm here today representing Falcon USBI in support of Bill Number 34-0197, the legislation to amend the GRT law. St. Thomas is my home. I was born and raised here, and my family has been here for generations. Falcon USBI was established in the Virgin Islands on St. Croix and on St. Thomas in the aftermath of Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Falcon provided support to protect personal, pers personnel, assets, facilities, and to ensure the well being of all rehabilitation professionals, as well as support efforts to fortify the infrastructure, development, and security of the Virgin Islands. Falcon is a small local company hiring residents of the Virgin Islands. I am here today in support of this bill, which will move Falcon closer to getting full payment for some of the work that was done prior to the end of the program. This has not been an easy road and it has taken a toll on Falcon financially as we are a small company. Note that although Falcon is still awaiting payment for work which concluded in 2019, we made it our business to ensure all of our employees and our vendors were paid timely. Falcon is current with gross receipts tax payments. Falcon USVI has a valid contract, and from the definitions of this contract, taxes should be recovered. We are asking you to consider passing this bill so that Falcon USVI and all subcontractors can be made whole as agreed to in the terms of our contract. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Ms. McGrath Allen, Mr. Shark Hawkins, you're next. Good afternoon, Com Committee Chair Honorable Senator Kurt Vialet and Vice Chair Honorable Senator Donna Freck Gregory, members of the Committee on Finance, fellow testifiers, and members of the viewing and listening audience. I am Shaq Hawkins. I come today representing Polaris Engineering Incorporated. It is a privilege to be before you today to testify in support of the committee's passage of bill number 34-0197. As a resident of the U.S. Virgin Islands for more than 17 years, I have witnessed the effects of hurricanes and tropical storms on our islands. When Hurricane Irma passed over St. John and St. Thomas, I, I watched from my living room in St. Croix, imagining the travesties and hardships ahead for those islands. In the coming weeks, I watched as St. Croix became a lifeline to St. John and St. Thomas. Islanders came together to send as much cargo and care packages as we could across to the families in need. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before it was myself and my family riding out Hurricane Maria. Nothing I had imagined about Hurricane Irma was close to the reality that Maria was for St. Croix. We emerged unscathed and healthy that next morning, but the same could not be said for how St. Croix fared. Looking back now, I was physically tired and mentally exhausted after her <clears throat> the hurricane and from prepping and riding it out, but I did not feel the exhaustion until many months later. There was just too much work to do to feel tired. Neighbors needed help, my coworkers needed help, our islands needed help, and as my wife would happily tell you, my family needed help and care as well. 
I am retelling my hurricane experience to emphasize that the immediate months after the hurricanes were some of the most trying times in my per personal and professional life. I felt an obligation to help wherever we could. So the reason I'm here today to support this bill is to ask for your help in resolving a, land, a long standing issue with absolutely no resolution to date. Running a business in the U.S. Virgin Islands is hard. There's ups and downs every day. After the hurricanes, fears of what our business would actually look like were real. But through relationships and voicing our willingness to help, we were rewarded with opportunities to work. In fact, it brought more work than I thought we could manage. When the opportunity to work in the Irvy program came along, we were excited to participate because we knew the needs were great. We worked hard to negotiate a fair contract with AECOM that we believe provided the most value to the homeowners as possible. It was specifically explained to us that FEMA was going to implement a cap on each home's expenditures. Thus, we were to <clears throat> instructed to build our unit rates for the program to exclude many items that would be covered by program costs. In other words, we were trying to make sure that the homeowners benefited the most and that we could do as much work as we could while staying under the cap. To be clear, we were instructed to remove travel expenses, management labor costs, shipping, all taxes and duties, and every other item that wasn't specifically needed to build out the unit cost. All of those items were called out in our contract as a pass-through. We were to build we were to build pass-through costs separately from the physical construction work on the houses. To provide even more clarity, we were specifically instructed to remove GRT from our unit cost. It is listed as a separate pass-through cost in our contract. The Polaris team worked hard, very hard on the Irby project. We held multiple on-island job fairs, resulting in what we believe to be one of the highest concentrations of local hires of all the contractors. We completed over 1,000 homes. Our team honestly could have done more if the payments had been timely. Cash flowing the project was our greatest obstacle. It wasn't the materials, the manpower, the logistics, or the homeowners. It was strictly the cash flow. Never did I expect to be testifying to you all to try and get paid for the work we did during Irvy. With respect to the bill before you, Polaris is a taxpaying entity in the U.S. Virgin Islands. GRT is not new to us. And, we, and when we negotiated our contract, we knew that GRT was going to apply for this work. As stated earlier, contractually, we would be reimbursed for our GRT obligations, which goes back to making sure that every possible dollar could be spent for the homeowner's benefit. You won't read about us in the news. We paid our employees and our vendors. Polaris didn't cause any problems for the program, the beneficiaries, or the territory. And yet, almost five years after the storms, we still haven't been paid what is contractually due. We humbly ask for your passage of this bill so that the hardworking individuals that make up Polaris can be paid for the work we have completed and we can hopefully continue to be a contributing member of the Virgin Islands for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Mr. Miguel Quinones. You recognize? Good afternoon. Committee Chairman Curvy LA, Vice Chair Donna Brett Gregory, committee members, Senators Marvin Blyden, Dwayne Graff, Javan James Sr., and Janelle Sorol, fellows and suppliers, and members of the listening and viewing audience. My name is Miguel Quinones, and I appear before you today on behalf of Island Services Group. We support this legislation. This legislation amends the Gross Receipts Tax Law 33 VI Code Section 43E. At the onset of the recovery efforts, ISG recognized how the destruction would forever change the lives of those who experienced it. It then decided to step in to help Virgin Islands restore their quality of life as soon as possible. Starting days after the storms, ISG was among the first contractors who provided services for the Virgin Islands disaster recovery efforts. Initially, through a master agreement with AECOM to provide local support services and personnel for the assessments of hospitals, schools, airports, and government buildings. Despite the many financial challenges, ISD persisted 
completing projects in different supporting roles for projects of various scopes and scales, but always relying on local labor. ISG hired local housing inspectors, skilled crafts, and administrative personnel. ISG also partnered with other local specialty service providers to complete timely and quality projects for its clients. ISG struggled financially due to long delays between payments, but in the end, it paid all the workers on time and vendors, and most importantly, paid all taxes. The passage of Bill 34-0197 before the FEMA project closeout deadline would enable ISG to inject more operating capital into projects and hiring more local labor. ISG trajectory in the Virgin Islands goes back decades when the principals of the company made the territory their home and started working on industrial, commercial, and institutional projects. For the past five years, ISG has continued to support hurricane recovery efforts and is currently working on the Juan Luis F. Hospital Temporary Hospital Facility and is also under contract to provide materials management for the storage and disbursement of construction materials for the Envision program. ISG's local personnel continues to operate and maintain the facilities and fulfill the administrative, material handling, and equipment operations. Regarding future emergency work, ISG would not engage in contracts with pay when get pay payment terms nor plans to offer to finance work performed for the government. The proposed bill um, aligns with Act 8249 of 2019 of maximizing revenue fairly and partially by enabling the DI government to be reimbursed for the gross receipts taxes for the federally funded UCAN recovery projects. ISG did not include gross receipts taxes in the billing for this project, so there is no duplication of benefits. Bill number 34-0197 amends the Title 33 of the Virgin Islands Code, Subtitle 1, Part 1, Chapter 3, Section 43E, and it allows gross receipts taxes to be identified on in invoices as project costs. However, it does not change the requirement for gross receipts taxes to be paid on the gross receipts of businesses or impact the collection of GRT. Additionally, nothing within the bill al allows for the avoidance of paying gross receipt taxes, which will continue to be automatically deducted from all payments made to vendors like ISG. Thank you for all your efforts to make sure that we get paid. Thank you for your testimony, Dr. Rochelle Harris. Hello. Good afternoon, committee chairman, Kurt Violet, vice chair, Donna Fred Gregory, committee members, senators Marvin Blyden, Dwayne DeGraff, Javon James Sr., Janelle Cabrera, fellow testifiers, and members of the listening and viewing audience. My name is Rasha Harris. I appear before you today on behalf of Impact Construction. We are in support of this legislation to amend the gross receipts tax law 33 VI code section 43E. St. Thomas is my home. I have been here for 22 years. It has been my husband's home for many generations past and will be my children's home for many generations to come. Impact Construction, our company, has been a staple in the community since its inception in 2010. We have worked on private homes, schools, hospitals, commercial, and government buildings. When we were presented with the opportunity to be part of the STEP program after the 2017 storms, we joined efforts with AECOM without hesitation. In this program, we were primarily part of the St. Thomas inspections team with both the initial sheltering program and with the expanded roofing program as well. As lead inspectors in the Irvy Step program, our impact team was responsible for escorting the whole inspections team from one home site to the next. 
This means that every individual on my team had to have a proper vehicle for this task with full gas tanks ready every day. My guys had those things and they were ready every day. We fulfilled our duty from the first day until project closure. Our impact team did not have a single payless payday. Every single member of my team received their pay on time and in full, as did every one of our vendors. Impact itself, however, is another story. As you are all well aware, we, Impact, as well as the entire AECOM team, did not get paid for years. As a matter of fact, I sit before you today, still owed money from the program where my services were no longer needed since 2019. This has had severe financial impact on us, which brings me to why I'm here today. Impact is 100% current on all of our gross receipts tax payments. We have diligently and without delay paid 5% of all income for this project, as well as all of our other projects and earnings. We understand the importance of GRTs and as upstanding citizens of the Virgin Islands, we willingly pay our dues. In this case in particular, FEMA wants to and is willing to reimburse me for the hundreds of thousands of dollars that I have paid in GRTs to the VI Bureau of Internal Revenue. But because of the way the law is currently written, I cannot submit an invoice for GRT as a single line item. Proposed bill in hand today would allow me to do that just as it does for other provisions under Title 11, Chapter 25. No, it does not get me out of paying GRTs. No, it does not waive GRTs for federal contracts. No, it does not lessen the amount of GRT that is due. All it does is allow GRT to be billed separately as a pass-through cost on all federal contracts as a reimbursement. Since I will have to pay additional GRTs on the reimbursement monies when I receive them, this bill will actually increase the amount of GRT that the IRB can collect. To me, this is a win-win situation. There's another underlying issue at hand, in my opinion. Every weather expert was surprised at the magnitude of Irma and even more surprised to see Maria follow in path just a few days later. It is also in every weather expert's opinion that we will continue to see bigger and bigger storms. It is no longer a matter of if, but rather when. What is my little island going to do next time? How are we gonna attract top tier companies such as AECOM when this is their experience here? They are here today trying to get reimbursed for money they have already paid, money that is part of their contract and promised to them, money that FEMA is willing and expecting to reimburse. As for me and for Impact, this entire experience has been very negative. We jumped in hard and fast to help in 2017. If we are not made whole for this project, we will probably not be first in line to help next time. I'm guessing that there will be several companies, big and small, local and stateside, that will also not rush to come to our aid if they are not allowed to get the money contractually promised to them because of an outdated exclusion law. Federal government wants transparency in billing. It is in our best interest to shape our laws to be compliant with federal reimbursement regulations. Allowing us to bill GRTs as a line item on the invoices and get reimbursed for GRTs, which we have already paid, is the right thing to do. This concludes my written testimony in consideration of adopting bill number 34-0197 and amending the current gross receipts law 33 VIC section 43E. I appreciate your time and have faith you'll be guided to do the right thing. Thank you. Um, committee chairman, while I'd like to be here for question and answer sections with your permission, I'd like to be excused at the end of testimonies for a prior obligation. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, you are excused. Ms. Charisma Elian, you are next. Yep. Good day, Finance uh, Committee Chairman Senator Kurt VLA, Vice Chair Senator Donna Fred Gregory, committee members. Good day, fellow testifiers and members of the listening and viewing audience. I am Charisma Muriel Tatiny Lee. I proudly celebrated five years with AECOM delivering a better world and serving in the capacity as a disaster recovery specialist. On behalf of myself and my colleagues, we support and encourage 
the passage of Bill number 34-0197. You heard testimonies today from some of our local subcontractors who hired local employees during the course of this program. Today, together, we completed initial site inspections of over 8,500 homes. We hired local caseworkers to facilitate the processing and collection of documentation, over 10,000 applicants. We made it possible for 24,000 people in our community to safely shelter at home. It has been a long road to recovery for all of us. I personally have devoted my time and efforts from inception, working alongside, alongside our subs and my team members through the intake process, helping implement NVI step policy with VIHFA. We implemented FEMA guidance to resolve eligibility issues. I remain committed to the successful completion of this program. It has truly been a long road to recovery. And these are the subs who help to carry the load of our disaster recovery, the heartbeat of the BI STEP program. We contractors rebuilt, revitalized, created new business ventures, delivering benefits which contributed to long term development of our community to which we are all connected. Our local contractors helped our territory recover from a disaster. However, <clears throat> lack of GRT payment has created a second disaster for our contractors. I'm asking you now to please help our local contractors recover by passing this bill. The lack of GRT reimbursement to our contractors has created a large hardship upon them. For some, this has led to downsizing, layoff, and other significant impacts on businesses. They simply cannot afford it. I thank you for your time, consideration, and respectfully ask you to vote in support of bill number 34-0197 by amending the current gross receipt law 33 VIC section 43. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to go directly into a five-minute round of questioning, and we'll begin with Senator J. Van James. You recognize Good afternoon, testifiers. I hate to be placed in a situation like this where the individuals who were appointed by the governor and this body voted upon saying that they have the expertise and knowledge to move this territory forward. And then we have the private sector telling us two conflicting things. It put us in a, in a, in a real bad situation because we rely on IRB and we rely on the Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority to provide guidance. We appoint, we voted for them when, it was, when they were appointed by the governor of this Virgin Islands. And we all agree that they will do a good job. And of course, sometimes we make mistakes. But it's clear that there is no mistake here today when it comes to the things that were brought before us. My question to Director Clendenin. In your testimony, you mentioned that according to FEMA guidelines, the local law existing at the time of the declared disaster is controlling. Even though it is clear, can you just elaborate some more for the listening and viewing audience what that exactly means? Absolutely, and because I have our disaster recovery expert here as well, I'm going to ask her, um, Director Adrian Williams, to um, actually speak on that. But it is our position that, that FEMA looks at the existing law at the time. Um, I think to um, 
Actually, I'll let Director Adrian Williams speak on it. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Director Clendenin, and thank you, Senator, Senator James. You're absolutely correct. Um, and evaluating any request that's placed before them, FEMA is obligated to look at what is the prevailing policy at the time um, of the, the particular disaster or the issue that is being dealt with. Um, there is significant, significant concern with this issue. As you know, we have gone back and forth on the cost. And there's three quick things that you have to apply, FEMA's gonna do. Is it eligible? Is the cost reasonable? And has it been properly documented? And FEMA has had concerns from even a time when I was working at FEMA about the cost reasonableness, and we spent years on whether this cost is reasonable. And the prevailing factor here is that we must ensure that at the time of the disaster, when everything is being submitted, that the current rules prevail. For us to go back retroactive, it is of significant concern. And for us to retroact the cost associated with what we've already presented to FEMA, as this is the cost for this project now, is problematic. And I'm requesting this through the chair. Can you send to, this, uh, to the committee members those specific FEMA guidelines that you made mention of and share it with us so we can review it, please? Absolutely. And Director Clendon, and you also made mention that there is no written rule or regulation or letter guaranteeing that the Federal Emergency Management Agency would authorize such reimbursement provided by this proposed bill. I really hope that we can have those conversations because if we really had a documentation saying that there is some level of guarantee, I would have definitely support it. And like I said, we, we're, not, we're, not, we're in a serious situation here when we have the private sector crying to us and I hear the concerns and don't feel like we're, we're not listening and we're insensitive. But at the same time, we have to rely on the subject matter experts within the executive branch who has been doing this for, for the past three to four years. And they have been in constant dialogue and conversation. We, do, we are not privy to most of those information because of separation of powers. So I'm relying on the expertise of the, the individuals who represent the various entities before us today. But um, as is, I really wish we had some letter saying that there will be some guarantee. And it's not too late. Um, I, I don't know if there's a, a sense of urgency to get this bill passed today, like is, it will be doom and gloom. But I think the conversations need to be had with FEMA and the federal government to find out how can we get some guarantee from them on paper by the passage of this bill, the government of the Virgin Islands will be able to be, um, or the individuals will be able to be reimbursed. My, my question though is to Director Octillian Williams, can, can you let us know, because as, as, we, as we know, there are some lessons learned, some hurricanes, Oma Maria, we need to actually have a book or some report based on the lessons learned. This is a lesson learned. But my, my question is, is, is anyone here aware of when the bidding took place about individuals letting the companies know exactly what they were getting themselves into. We, we had those conversations, you know, of anything that transpired. I know they had a change in administration. Right. Your excellent line of question then, Senator James. The, the fact that this really is probably the only contract that I'm aware of that has this level of ambiguity in the, the language that would lead the contractor to believe that the law that requires gross receipts taxes to not be itemized um, is not the intent of the, of the contract. The particular contract here is all other, all other contracts um, do not have this issue. The GRT is taken out um, and it's paid one of the, the, the lessons learned as you asked was to ensure that it's all of the contracts specifically line items, not just only for the main contractor, but also for the subs to understand that the GRT um, is a required payment um, and it will be taken out prior to receiving, receiving the amounts that's due. So that has been implemented again so that we can 
close any loops on any other problems that we're seeing here. And if, and if I may quickly, I just want to outline one thing. The cost must be reasonable. Whether or not the, the CFR 200.404 Section E says that whether the non-federal entity significantly deviates from its established practices and policies regarding the incurrence of costs, which may unjustifiably increase the federal awards costs. So we cannot have a law for federal funds and a law for local funds. It's kind of like when you have food stamp and you have a food stamp card and you go to the store and you say, you know what? If you're buying this bag of rice with food stamp, then it's $10. But if you're not using food stamp, then it's $8. We must have standard practices across the federal government for the federal funds. This is just not about FEMA. If you pass a law that speaks to federal funds, then it impacts all of the federal funds that comes into the territory. Thank you for placing that on the record. I don't want to abuse my time, but I know my colleagues will drill down some more. But um, in, in this case, I definitely have to, to rely heavily on the, those individuals who are in the everyday conversations. And like I said, to those in the private sector, I feel your pain. I'm not sure if this bill is, is some level of urgency where if it's not passed today that the world's going to end. I think we need to take our time and make sure we have those necessary conversations with the federal government to find out if there's a way moving forward where we can have something in writing saying that by the passage of this bill, the individuals will be reimbursed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, uh, Senator James. M Ms. Williams, in your response... Mm -hmm. is, uh, do you see a part of this bill saying that you're not going to collect the gross receipt upfront? Because you're still going to collect it upfront. So I, what I see in this bill is that it says that it only applies to federal funds. Correct, but the collection... Is, we're the, not establishing a policy across the board. The, the collection of gross receipts, it is the general practice of the government to take it out of the payment. The bills just speak to the reporting um, as to how the invoice will be prepared, but it doesn't say in any way that the government of the Virgin Islands will not collect the gross receipts upfront. Oh, you're absolutely right. That is not. I have. I don't have okay. any um, any issues with that. The, the fact of the matter is the premise under which we are establishing that the federal government will now pay for these okay. costs. Okay. is what's flawed. Well, I just wanted to make sure that it is clear to the public that this is not giving anybody any tax break and that the upfront requirement is still in place. Uh, Ms. Clendon, right. well, before I... I just, can I, I just one thing, Senator. What it is saying, though, is that the contractor doesn't have to pay the taxes. The federal government will. That's the difference. Well, it, it, and what it's saying is that the federal government will reimburse the cost of the contractor, they, and then we will be tomato, able... Tomato. We will be... No, in tomato, yeah. no, it's, it's totally yeah. different. They have to pay the gross receipts. I want to be clear, because Court Anthony Vela won't support any bill in which any contractor don't have to pay gross receipts. They must pay the gross receipts, but they could seek reimbursement from the federal government, not from us, and then so that reimbursement that they receive, we can also charge gross receipts on that particular reimbursement. But Ms. Clinton, then before I go to the next um, senator, in your testimony on the third page, you said GRT was not explicitly mentioned in the solicitation documents of the final step contracts, although the reimbursement of taxes was included. What reimbursement of taxes are they speaking about in that particular contract? Well, I'll, I'll pull a contract and I'll give you that more specifically, but I did hear the gentleman talk earlier about some other um, some other uh, taxes, et cetera. They were asked to exclude or line item in their contracts, which we know um, uh, is not allowed pursuant to the existing law. But I want to um, go back just quickly, and I'm getting that information for you, where you talked about um, not being able to pay gross receipts or the bill doesn't state not paying gross receipts. The, it says, yes, they'll pay their gross receipt, but then it's reimbursed. Is that not um, semantics at this point? They haven't paid their gross receipts because they're getting reimbursed for that. And I further want to state I agree with... Um, uh -huh. 
uh, Director Williams in the sense of us treating federal funds separate and apart from that of um, local funds. But I, I'm getting I, you I, the information. I hear, yes. I, I hear you, but um, we need to read the contract language. And we need to make the determination as to what contract the government of the Virgin Islands um, have entered into. Senator Donna Fred Gregory, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to my colleagues and good afternoon to the testifiers. And the last statement that the um, chair in mentioned is a good segue for my conversation. So. We're talking about a contract. So if we're talking about a contract, I am not certain why as legislators we are asked to change our laws to address a contract. So clearly there was a botch contract and now the Senate is being asked to address a botch contract. That is a matter for the courts, senators. That's a matter for the courts, not to change our tax laws to address an issue that's occurring with a particular contract or two contracts. Also, as I sat here this afternoon, I'm, 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 I'm concerned because I've listened to our subcontractors and it seems that whomever has been talking to them have done an excellent job of bamboozling them. And I'm going to say why. Because the relationship that they have is not with the GVI. The relationship that they have is with Aptim and ACOM. So when Aptim and ACOM pay them, they cannot turn around and say, uh, we're going to get reimbursed from the federal government of, from, for, the, um, for the taxes the grocery seat taxes that they've already paid. So I need for those subcontractors to understand that. That information is not accurate as far as what was um, shared with us today in the testimony from these subcontractors. And yes, I agree that they're owed, I don't know if it's millions or how much of a dollars because we've had this conversation back in the 33rd legislature. And interestingly, interestingly enough, this matter never came forward. But um, ACOM and Aptim are the responsible persons to pay their subcontractors. While it's, this is an emotional conversation as it relates to our subs, we cannot tie our subs to this overarching issue with ACOM and Aptim. And we cannot change our law to accommodate ACOM and Aptim. It is wrong. Now, um, it's just so much information. I've heard uh, that today from Mr. John Grant that our legislation is flawed. Mr. Grant, I'm here to report to you that the legislature's legislation is not flawed. I am a Virgin Islander born and bred here. And I have been back home from 1987. I've experienced Hurricane Hugo, Hurricane Maryland, all the other ancillary storms in the territory, and we've never had this issue. So our legislation is not flawed. And I happen, my background happens to be finance. So this is why this conversation is, is, is very concerning to me. I also heard today that FEMA is anticipating GRT invoices. And I'm going to ask Adrian Williams, because all of this information is coming from the contractors and I'm not hearing that coming from the government side. So I think Mr. Edelman indicated that FEMA is anticipating GRT invoices. But before you answer um, uh, Williams, Octolin, let me ask the director of IRB a question. Do other states have a GRT tax or do they have a state tax? Because we are having a apples and oranges conversation today. But I want to hear from the um, the Internal Revenue Director as far as GRT, GRT, gross receipt taxes in other states. And what does that mean as it relates to state taxes when it comes to the Virgin Islands and how we're doing business here as it relates to our disaster? 
Good day, Senator. I'm Joel Lee, Director of um, Bureau of Internal Revenue. Yes, other states do have that tax, um, gross receipts or, or sales tax. The difference is- Other states have what? I can't hear you. Gross receipts you speak up? and or sales tax. Or sales tax. The difference is they are allowed to separately show it on a receipt. So as far as the Fed's concerned, it's business as usual. Um, as what Director Williams is referring to, our laws um, explicitly say we cannot um, separate it. So a change will then deviate from our normal practices, which is what she's trying to say we will then now be in violation of. Um, the, the laws that are in place is what FEMA, the feds, respect at the time of the contract. Now, us making a change that solely affects them is a problem. Attorney, Octa, uh, Director Octon, do you want to follow up on that? Uh, that again, as, as stated before, it is critical that in determining whether or not costs are reasonable, we utilize our standard our standard practices across the board should not have any practice that creates a separate process for federal funding as opposed to our local funded just to increase the amount of the benefit from the federal funds um, the question that you asked before senator gregory about fema expecting additional invoices the the request that we've had on Numerous occasions were for us to submit all of the invoices. FEMA gave us deadlines to submit every single invoice um, so that they can make their determination on whether or not the costs associated with the EHRVI to the STEP program were reasonable. We've submitted all of the invoices. FEMA is not expecting us to submit additional invoices Time. with additional costs. We have paid GRT already. So for FEMA to for us, FEMA to expect that we're going to send additional invoices with GRT costs. Thank you. I, okay. I have to, yes, sorry about that. So um what I'm hearing here is based on what we're trying to present today from the legislative perspective, is we want to create two separate accounting practices for the GVI. So on one end, we are reimbursed for our um the, the contractor is reimbursed for the GRT that he's, he or she is paid. And on the other end, the small contractors pay their GRT. So I am not certain what it is that we are trying to accomplish here other than to address an issue that yeah, seems yeah. to me that this is a matter for the courts. Thank you, Senator. Because Your time has been called. Much, my time has been called? Yes. I'll oh, allow you to thank you, Mr. Yes. Chair. I'm, I, I'll please allow me to wrap up. Um, Colleagues, this bill that is before you today doesn't do anything other than to serve self-interest. That's what's going on here. It doesn't do anything for the U.S. Virgin Islands and its people. And the contractor will, if this, if, if we were to make this happen, and FEMA could, it, with some magic say it will happen, what will happen is they expect to come to the U.S. Virgin Islands up, and pay no taxes. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Wrap it up. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Lee, you said that there are gross receipts and sale taxes in other states, but the state's law allow them to itemize it on the invoice. Correct. And because they're allowed to itemize on the invoice, they're able to submit um, to the federal government for reimbursement of the tax that they pay to the, to the government. Correct. But our existing law prohibits that. Correct. So if you have something that prohibits a practice that is being done in a bunch of other states, a lot of other states, what is the solution? Is the solution to tweak the law? Well, once I'm, I'm not the FEMA expert, no. um, but I, I, if, if a law prohibits something in the Virgin Islands and it's customary practice in other states, wouldn't a change in the law align the Virgin Islands with what is a customary practice in other states? If, well, I guess we have to go back to why our law was created in the first place. There must be a reason. I don't know. Correct. Um, and we're not talking about just um, regular payments. We're talking about payments related to disaster recovery. 
in which we have an opportunity. We're not talking about taking money from the general fund or the, or, or the government reimbursing anything. And I just want to remind everybody, colleagues, we're talking about, well, we can't do this, we can't do that. A week and a half ago, we just changed a law to ratify an agreement for an additional 13 years. So how we can change? An agreement that was going through the lottery, mm -hmm. this body, tweak the law to ratify an additional 13 years. And then we sit here today and we say, well, we can't do nothing. And then we have the, the gall to state that Section 8 of the Revised Organic Act to use a cover that if you're supposed to do this, then we're going to challenge. But, but we got to be fair across the board. And, and th this is no special interest legislation because it's going to apply to any company that yes, is. deals with, with, with disaster recovery. Special interest legislation is what we passed before. For one entity, 13 years. So let, 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 let's be truthful when we're coming up with these with, with these arguments. If, if, it's, if it's not, it's not. But, but don't try to twist and turn an argument because this legislation does not allow any of those companies to not pay gross receipt. They must pay the gross receipt. The complaint we're saying is already paid, but we really want them to get reimbursed. So like, no, that, that's not fair. But, I mean, we're, we're looking at a law that has been there for 25, 30 years, and we're saying we can't tweak it, but we're tweaking laws every single day to come into compliance with what is general practice across the U.S. To include all the laws that we tweak for the Lieutenant Governor Office to come into compliance so that we can become accredited. But now everything changed. Convenient. Senator DeGraff, you recognize. Senator Vinkery. Excuse me. You acknowledge me, uh, Mr. Chef? Point of inquiry? Oh, point of inquiry, Senator. Saru. Hello? Oh, thank you. Um, South Dakota has a grocery seat tax. But the point of inquiry would be to um, Mr. Edelman, because the previous senator, um, I don't know if, if it's understood whose suggestion it was to um, pass legislation to rectify the matter because our government entities failed to do so. So who was the person that issued a letter stating that legislation should be crafted to fix the matter? Who was it? Okay. Um, there wasn't a letter that was given. We had a meeting with um, Denise George, the Attorney General, in December 2021. After four years of trying to look at various administrative ways to resolve this problem, maybe they're still open. Um, in one of her comments, she said, well, the best way to resolve the conflict that exists within the contract, okay, is to amend the state statute. So it was her suggestion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you. Senator DeGraff, you're recognized. Uh, you have another point of inquiry. Uh, <laughs> from who, Mr. Senator? Chair, you have another point. Who has a point of inquiry? Mr. Chair, I have one Francis point. Heiliger. Senator Francis Heiliger, you're recognized. Francis Heiliger. Good afternoon. I am going to request again. Please could we monitor the fact that people are over in this side because I'm here begging to even get a point of inquiry as a participant in this hearing. Thank I you. I, I can't hear you, um, Senator. If I hear you, I will recognize you as soon as I hear you. If you're calling for a point of inquiry, media and St. Thomas just need to turn your mic up so I can hear you and I will recognize you immediately. You can just send me a text. Thank you so much. What I'm saying to you, it seems to be a problem with media because I made this request this morning. I am literally relying on other senators to uh, get my acknowledgement to speak on this Senate floor. Um, my point of inquiry is to IRB. There was a comment in regards to several laws across various jurisdictions. In California, there's a law that if a frog dies during a jumping contest, you can't eat it. In Connecticut, if a junk collector, you can't collect junk. At the end of the day, 
There are several laws in various jurisdictions and states that don't exist here in the territory. So I understand all of that. But what I would like to understand through the chair two IRB, if our law specifically states something here in this territory, is it an obligation that because every other state is doing it, that we are required to alter our laws to adapt to them? IRB, um, Ms. Um, Director Lee. Um, good day, Senator. This is Joe Lee, um, Director of Bureau of Internal Revenue. The answer to your question is no. Thank you. Point of inquiry. Point of, point of inquiry also. <laughs> yeah. You're next, Senator DeGraff. Point of inquiry, Senator Fred Gregory. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to make sure that we are having an apples to apples conversation when we talk about invoices. So in other in states, what we call what do you call it, the VAT or the, the sales tax is on a receipt as you hit the counter when you're doing business. That's what I mean. Let's make sure we clear, you know, the whatever gross receipt tax it is. When you, when you go up to the counter and you pay your bill for your groceries, your services, whatever it is, it's line item there. So are we saying moving forward that we are going to be line iteming at our counters in the Virgin Islands, or this is only just for to accommodate um, disaster recovery matters? That's what we're saying. I'm, I'm gonna, through the chair, I'm going to ask um, our legal counsel to please look into, actually, who made a comment? I, I think it was Mr. Chair, you know. Mr. Chair make the comment. And I want to, no, let, no, let me reverse. Just let me let, ask let, Director Lee counsel. to clear this up. Let's get legal let me ask counsel. him to clear it up. Director Lee, the, in, the sales invoices that you are referencing are what invoices? Or the, the receipts that we are talking about are what, what receipts? When we talk about GRT and sales taxes in other states, where is that information listed and what and what invoices? Mr. Lee. Um, on, on invoices and bills that are submitted at, for to show the transaction. Okay, and the transaction could be when you go up to the counter, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. I want to make sure that we clear on this. Thank you, Senator DeGraff, you recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, testifiers, all of you listening and present. Um, first of all, to the subcontractors, thank you for, for the work you're doing. I mean, the people of the territory really appreciate it. But these are some of the issues that the people of the territory are dealing with now, and presently are the ones in it. But um, thank you for your service. Um, through the chair, I'd like to ask, a legal counsel, section two of the bill. Uh, section one applies to any matters involving claims for disaster assistance that are pending before the government of the Virgin Islands on and after the effective date of this act. Is that retroactive? To the chair, legal counsel. Through the chair, the Senator de Graaf, the language in section two specifically um, speaks to any um, claims for disaster assistance that would be existing when this, if this bill were to become law and act, enacted into the law by the governor, from that date forward, that's when this would, um, this language would apply. It doesn't have retroact retroactive effect, it has prospective effect. Okay. Because it's, it's not retroactive to, it's on or after the effective date of this act. Okay, so so then th th that's what I was trying to figure out. Now, 2018, when the contract between the government of the Virgin Islands and AECOM and Aptin was made, the gross receipt taxes were removed. So in 2018, they were taken out. So Mr. Scott uh, Edelman, it, yes, yes, they were. Okay, good. Yes, they were. So the government of the Virgin Islands has that money. 
from 2018. We are clear on that. No, no. Um, as we were getting paid for invoices, 5% was being deducted, but um, the invoice for the portion of the cost for the GRT, okay, was never repaid. No, uh, wait, let me ask Director Lee. Director Lee, do, do, did IRB collect that 5% on their contract in 2018? What good day, Senator. Uh, how it mechanically works is if the VI government pays out a substantial amount of monies, they withhold 5% and remit those funds, that 5% to IRB. Right, and that's what I'm saying. So you, you got that money in 2018? We get monies that are being withheld 5% uh, on payouts by the government, yes. Yeah, of, of this contract. So I, I figure is there a yes or no of, of this contract. I, I really don't get into specific taxpayer. I am bound by law to not discuss taxpayer information. Um, you have the relevant okay. parties on the line oh, who can answer. Okay. That, that's fine. So in the contract, the government withheld the 5%. That's what we are having, the $67 million con conversation when I came to Attorney Dudley's office that we had. The government has that money. Yes. If this bill is passed, then does the government have to give that money back to you and then no. seek to get the reimbursement? No, the government never has to give us back. All we're asking is for what FEMA is anticipating in their project worksheets is to submit the invoice and they will then reimburse um, the territory with the Sankin, uh pay back the contractors. Okay, D Director Williams. Uh, are you hearing that? M Mr. Because, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. DeGraff. I, I'm, I'm so sorry, and I apologize. I just, just need, I don't know if it's a point of clarification, because something the legal counsel said that I really am just burning, if I may, please, to have it cleared up. Okay, because wait, what we wait, wait. Oh, oh, okay, uh, there, uh, I apologize to you, Director. I'd just like to get... Uh, Director Williams in, and then your question could be asked on the chair's time, if you don't mind. One minute. Because uh, I, I know my because time it's is Because it's so running. important, yeah, because it's minute. so valid to your question, though, Senator. It's valid to your uh, question uh, about the, the retroactivity. Director Clinton, then let the uh, Senator conclude, and then you'll be allowed to put it on the record. Yeah, because, I, I, again, I'm just watching my take. Uh, Director Williams. Yes. Uh, did, did you hear yes, what uh, I heard, I heard Mr. Edelman say that if we... It, we have already line item that GRT was paid out of these costs already. So for us to submit additional costs, then it will be duplicative. So, I, I, wait, okay, so you're saying for you to submit re additional costs for them to be reimbursed, right. FEMA may right. not look at that. Right, because FEMA actually, we have to send, we have to send um, documentation that we paid out the GRT. So that's part of the proof of payment that we have to provide to FEMA. So it okay, will show and, that and we paid Scott Edelman and we owe AECOM and we paid the GRT. And that's provided okay. to FEMA. Okay, and, and that, that's why I was asking, I asked the uh, sponsor of the bill if they could have had FEMA here. I, I wanted, because again, I'm doing a complete investigation. I met with uh, Attorney Dudley and her team Time. And I just wanted to hear from FEMA. He said FEMA wasn't able to be able to come. Um, so in, in wrapping up, does, uh, finally, if I may, the, did the government of the Virgin Islands give you documentation, a letter stating to stop um, adding the, the, the GRT to complete, add more houses to your state that was stated? Do you have documentation for, for that? We, that's what was told to us during the negotiation. We have documentation back that it's HFA's intent, well after this work, to pay us, written from HFA. We have written documentation from Widow Brian that was in the room during the negotiation, okay, along with me, that states GRT was not included in the prices. FEMA in their initial estimate, okay, in 2018, as a spreadsheet for all different items, GRT 5%. In 2021, just one year ago, one year ago, 
FEMA sent a new project worksheet, a new cost estimate that has a line item to pay taxes. It says gross receipts tax at 5%. HFA backing up in October of 2020 submitted the cost reasonableness report. That cost reasonableness report has items in that says the gross receipt tax, and they have another one, cost of money, will be, in essence, discussed with FEMA at a later date. That's what we're waiting on. FEMA sees that. They recognize this. They pay it. They pay it in every single other state. We do this nationwide, okay? All we have to do, the problem is not, is FEMA going to pay it? The problem is getting the invoice up to FEMA to, to reimburse. That's all. Yeah, and, and in closing, I just think that, again, that's for the discussion with FEMA and the disaster recovery versus changing a lot to accommodate it. That, that's the way I look at it. Um, see, uh, see, so, Mr. Chair, my, my, wait, my time was called, Mr. Chair, if you don't yes, mind. Yes, it was. I gave you. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, the director um, wanted to say something. Uh, Clendenin. Director Clendenin, uh, you recognize. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify something with our legal counsel. Uh, in Section 2, he indicated that on and after the effect date of this act. But when we look at the bill summary, it clearly goes to intent here as well, because it says this bill would apply to any project where closeout has not occurred with the federal government. Mm -hmm. So in this case, closeout has not occurred. We're still going through this exercise with FEMA. So what would prohibit it to say it's from this date forward, because we haven't closed out, to capture every single thing, every GRT paid uh, to, to ACOM and Aptim? So I wanted just some clarification on that as well, because it does say it would apply to projects where closed out has not yet occurred. To the chair to... Um, legal counsel. And before legal counsel answer, um, the summary is not on the enactment clause. The enactment clause is what you go with. But legal counsel, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for making the first point I was going to make. Summary is not the is not law. It is. Not in this. It, it is part of a bill to explain to to people that read the bill what the bill is doing. So the summary is not. If this bill becomes law, it would not be part of the law. Secondly, the question posed to me by Senator DeGraff spoke to whether or not Section Two is retroactive. The rules of statutory construction simply mean that if the legislature meant it to be retroactive, it would have said. This section is retroactive to whatever date the, and the legislature intended for it to be retroactive to. This provision simply says on or after the effective date of this act. So, for example, no. for instance, if this were to become law today for the purpose of discussion and the governor were to sign it into law on Monday, then as of Monday, any claim for disaster assistance that are pending as of Monday's date would be affected by this. Now, your point with respect to what the federal, the local government would have to go back and do, that's administrative. That has absolutely nothing to do with the legislature's intent with respect to retroactivity, because retroactivity is specific language, words of art, that would be included in this bill. That's not here. So, so if the entire project is pending, you're saying they can apply this okay, one, to it, one, right? One minute, because it's pending. One minute, uh, Director, you Sorry, have to request through the chair to, to have a discussion and ask a question. You ask a specific question to legal counsel, and they were able to answer. Uh, Senator Saru, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Director Lee. Does this legislation pose any harm to the government of the Virgin Islands? Um, good day, Senator. Um, my opinion, it's yes. What was the harm? Well, the fear that I have is that the language is so broad 
um, many subcontractors, known and unknown, will be seeking the same um, reimbursement provision for gross receipt taxes that they've already paid. The, the language in okay, the bill... Okay, so can... Hold a second. So can you suggest language that would provide safeguards? Honestly, Senator, as, as the tax enforcement agency, we really are not supposed to be crafting um, language in okay. bills. We're supposed to simply follow. I didn't, ask you to, I didn't ask you to craft any language. That's our job. But usually if you come down and you have an objection, you say, you know, I suggest blah, blah, blah to strengthen legislation. Now, does it do, is there any harm to the government of Virgin Islands on the financial side? Would we be losing money? Um, once again, Senator, if uh, because the language is broad, I suspect a number of contractors will come to the table and expect um, to be reimbursed. So that would put us in a situation. But if the reimbursement is coming from FEMA, how does that impact you? Let me understand this answer you're giving me. Well, the understanding that it's I'm having is that only the first tier and possibly the second tier contractors will be made um, whole. What about the third, fourth, fifth, and retailers who were um, not a part of this discussion? They... Okay, hold a second. Hold a second. Let me bounce to Mr. Edelman. Okay. Clarify, please. Okay. The, um, our belief is that your, the contract between the entity and the Virgin Islands is going to be what controls. So in our case, we have done work for the schools. It doesn't have this in. We have no right to go back for this. It has no impact at all, okay? But on the case of the STEP program, it explicitly states it inside the contract, okay? So for this to work, you would have to have it explicitly within the contract, which is what our step contract was given to us. We didn't create the, the, the contract. It was given to us. Okay. So now the implications of this would be that if this is not settled, that you can, this can be tied up in court, correct? That's correct. And our subcontractors really wouldn't be paid, correct? It would, oh, well, it'll take a long time. It would, it would go four years or five years or who knows. And then by that time, there would be no recourse to try to to get this money back from the federal government. Okay. Then there would be a liability for the territory. Good. Now let's look. Uh, I'm looking. I looked online and GRT and sales tax taxes on their female website. They are reimbursable, correct? Yes, they are. Okay. Director Williams Actelin. I don't know if we're on the same page today. You don't look so. If 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 taxes are reimbursable, and I'm looking at the FEMA website, and this is not a foreign concept anywhere, what is your objection? Several objections. One, that this we can't have a law. One I don't hear anyone speaking to that. We can't have a law that separates federal funds and local funds. Secondly. It says all federal funds. It is more than FEMA. Any other federal federal funded project, a contractor can kind of ask for the same, the same rights because it doesn't specify that it's FEMA. Thirdly, when we increase the cost of a project, we're going to have to pay match on this. So right now, the match is, is we have a problem right now that we don't have sufficient match resources. And when we pay this additional, I believe it's $67 million, that we're going to have to take the 10% match and pay the 10% match on this additional $67 million. And this is our okay, one. Hold a second. Okay, you asked oh. me that, sorry. Wait, can you go with all my time? Now, let me go back to you, Mr. Edelman. Can you clarify for me? Okay. The, when this, this uh, the STEP program falls underneath Category B work, okay, within the Stafford Act, Category B, the way that it was set up for Hurricane Irma and Maria, was 100% reimbursable, okay? So there, uh, the issue of the local match isn't there. When it did come in for the later part of the program, 
that particular piece was then fully funded by HUD through the CDBG process. So I am not aware exactly. of a single dollar, okay, mm -hmm. that has come from the Virgin Islands that the entire program has been funded by two separate federal programs coming Time. through. Okay, so Director Clennon, you just got here, and I, I'm seeing a lot of issues with VIHFA from since Christ was a child and Noah's Ark was built. Because um, this is not the only VIHFA concern that we have. So if this is the issues that we're having, what is VIHFA's obligation to address the issue? What do you believe your obligation is? With their indulgence, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator, I truly don't believe there's an issue at hand before. No, I'm asking I'm asking you what is your obligation to have everybody in the room and you are the lead agency. What do you feel your obligation is to address what's brought before you? I'm not talking about the legislation, I'm talking about this whole GRT issue. Well, Senator, to even bring anybody in the room today, we have to go back. From what I've heard today, what I've heard from before, this isn't just a rising today. This is a multi-year exercise where all the parties have come together extensively to talk about this. Um, when we look at the contract, the contract says the contractor is responsible for payment of all applicable taxes from the funds to be received under this contract. So from our perspective, this isn't really an issue. There's not an issue. The law says you're not, you can't um, separate your gross receipts. Mr. Tax. Chair, if I may just follow up. You, you may go ahead and follow up and conclude. Go okay, ahead. thank you. So... We're talking about a contract. What is FEMA's discussion with you on them reimbursing the territory for GRT? And I'm going to yield to Director um, Williams Actelin on that one. Current and quickly, the current law states it's not allowable, and we've already drawn from and been reimbursed for GRT because it's in the total contract that was submitted. Director Actelin, you're telling me about the law. I'm asking you what was your discussion with FEMA. What did FEMA tell you in conversation or email on reimbursement for GRT? Thank FEMA you, Mr. Chair. FEMA has approved what we've submitted for GR, that, that the GRT is included in the cost. It is, that is how it has been submitted to FEMA. They reviewed it and approved it, and we've made the payments. That's, that's not answering the question, but I hope you have a second round. Thank you for the leniency, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Farrow. Oh, the, the, the question, Ms. Williams, actually, is whether or not there was a discussion. Not what we submitted. Was there just a discussion about uh, the position of the contractors and FEMA position as to whether or not it is feasible? Yes. Yes. And what was the That's result? why it, all, the, all the requests for information that was when we submitted the packages, a lot of this was reviewed and it was approved based on all of the information that was submitted to them when they asked their questions and that's how it was approved. Okay, this is, this is invoices that have already been submitted to FEMA under the premise and it, exactly that we, what we're presenting here today is what was presented to FEMA and they have approved. That's why we were able to make payments. This just didn't start. This has been going on for years. And ACOM and Acton knew the territory's positions. And that's why that 10% markup is included in those costs when we were going back and forth scrubbing those invoices to get to a point where we could actually pay them. So to go back now, and say, no, we've not done this. Guess what? We have 67 more million dollars. Is this ingenuous? And it causes issues to overall to our credibility. We have very serious concern about changing our laws that, that has implications for the rest of the territory. I just need to add one more thing, about Mr. Chair, please. The period of performance has ended for, for a step. So anything that we submit now, 
is going to be subject to the 90-10 cost share. Therefore, whatever we give up, the 5% on one end, we will be paying the 10% on the other end. And when they ask about what are some of the ramifications, that's one of them. Thank you for the follow Thank you. We have two points of inquiry, Senator Fred Gregory and then Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, very quickly, um, I want to go back to the tax conversation because we continue to compare ourselves with um, other states. And I must ask, um, you know, we're, we're having a, a conversation around changing our, our, our tax structure to accommodate uh, the federally related uh, transactions, if you will, or federally related uh, construction type awards. Um, Director Lee, do you know whether or not other states have two separate tax structures to deal with federal funds and one to deal with local um, funds as far as uh, federal as far as federal grants are concerned? Good day, Senator. Um, not to my knowledge. Thank you. Senator James, you recognize? Yes, out of fairness, I'm a person, I don't pick sides when it comes to this thing, but out of fairness, the administration inherited this issue that we're discussing here today. And as we know, we have had many hurricanes in the territory, like the Madam President said, and grow up seats is nothing new under the sun. But my question is to the gentleman, I can't remember his name, but I think he's next to the attorney to the far left on St. Thomas. Sir Edelman. What's his name? Scott Edelman. Scott, Mr. Mr. Scott Edelman. Yes, Mr. Edelman. You mentioned a, a, a situation where you are aware of somebody who was going through the process and they had documentation requesting um, reimbursement to FEMA. Is that is that accurate? Yes, we get reimbursed from taxes in, in states uh, throughout the nation. That is true. So were you referring to uh, and you were referring to a stateside and, issue or a local issue? That is my that is what I want to get clarified. Now, what what we're what we're trying to do here is the way that the contract was negotiated is just get reimbursed for the money that was spent that FEMA allows reimbursement for. And and my last question, Mr. Chair. When when that took place took place stateside, that was based off of the law of the state, or that's just an agreement that took place with FEMA and, and an understanding? No, that's based off of CFR 200, uh, the Code of Federal Regulations, so it's based off of federal law. Okay, thank you for placing that on the record. Thanks. Thank you Final so inquiry. much. Uh, you, you, you are next, Senator Francis Ayala, so you may proceed. You're next. Well, I would like my point of inquiry. I've been requesting it before the you, previous two. You are next. I'm going, I've been allowing individuals to go over the time. You can go ahead and ask your questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, testifiers. Um, the first thing I want to find out is to legal counsel before I continue on. Legal counsel, in this contract, there is no definition for what a contractor is. It just says contractors. And without a set definition, is it specific to just people that are building or any contractor that has a contract before the federal government? Through the chair to legal counsel. Question. Through the chair to Senator Francis Heiliger. Um, the way this bill is is written, it's it there. You're correct. There is no definition of of contractor. What this does, it creates a, a carve out of the existing um, section 43 that requires the payment of gross receipts taxes for those contractors um, who um, are essentially are involved in federally funded. Um, contracts. So it's That's not it. limited to builders. It is it is specifically to any contractor that is before the federal government looking for reimbursement of gross receipts. That's what I'm trying to find out.
it it apply it applies to to to, to specific to your question is does not the language on its face does not limit it to building contractors. Okay. It it it, it specifically speaks to again it's a carve out um, for uh, payments to contractors um, to account for the receipt and distribution of federal assistance to okay. the Virgin Islands. Okay. So violence. could I just give you a scenario? So if I am a I am a person that has a contract with the federal government to do cleaning and I pay gross receipts, would I now be able to itemize it and then go back and request those gross receipts if I have a contract with the federal government and I'm just doing cleaning? Would it open those type of doors to everybody and not just limit it to builders? Again, it, given your scenario, because the legislation doesn't specifically speak to building contractors, it, based on the language, it is possible mm -hmm. that may be the case. I'm just looking at the language. Okay. Now, now, what would govern your relationship um, or govern your ability to go back and be able to um, um, try to obtain reimbursement would be governed by the provisions of your, your contract. Your contract. Whatever okay. your contract would provide with respect to reimbursement, in this case, of gross receipts. So Thank that's you. what would govern. Okay. So obviously, we, you, you, you have outlined a scenario but your contract is what would govern in that instance. Okay. Um, I have a question for the representatives for a ECOM. Or right. Mr. Um, when you guys negotiated the contract, first of all, you said you can do reimbursement in various states. Yes. Does every state allow you an additional 10% for administrative costs? Okay. That's negotiated per okay. state. And, and based on what she was saying, that was negotiated because of how our law structure is. I'm just I'm just repeating what was shared with us. You could dispute okay. it after. So based on what was shared, I believe Ms. Williams shared, is that they negotiated an additional 10% of administration costs, which equated to about an additional $40 million. So therefore, I'm asking you, if each state negotiates various things, my concern is, do you feel that that was in exception of this additional 5% that you had to pay? Okay. It is not an exception. There are different aspects of coming down on building anything, whether One it's minute. doors, windows. This was a line item. FEMA, with the support of HFA and ODR, specifically detailed what is inside the alternate handling fee. FEMA is very, very hard as... Um, ODR and HFA fully aware. We have to fight jointly for every single dollar. They scrutinized that and they paid it all. So that's one line item on the whole sheet. So like, for instance, they paid the windows. You could think of that as windows. Now you're going on to the next line of doors. And that's really what we're doing. It's the, the different items of coming up with the cost estimate. It was scrutinized and paid. Okay. Ms. Williams, um, Octolin Yums, are you? Yeah. I, I would like to ask you a question, please. Sure. The question I would like to ask you, based on your previous statement, because I'm hearing a contradictory re response, did you say that it was additionally negotiated for additional 10% of administrative costs due to knowing that 5% of gross receipts would have had to be paid and this was an added negotiation part of the contract? Time. The, the, the negotiation was for an additional 10%. Um, was a, what we looked at as a markup. And we're able to validate that and provide that. Okay. And it, it would stand to reason that all of all of these other costs have been included in that mark markup. For the additional 10 markup. And and that could be negotiated state by state. So not every state would have done it. Um, according to the contract has it says pass through costs may be submitted as incurred. It says pass through costs include items they said established in sections exhibit seven and other indirect costs necessary to accomplish the work performed under the contract. Pass through costs for taxes, 
um, builders, risk, insurance, policy, bid bond, performance bond, social costs. You could read it. When somebody says you may do something, does it mean you have to do it? Because if every single thing that's listed here is something you could have required as a reimbursement, or was this a situation where yeah. all these things were listed and the things that you could or may do are the things that you actually submitted for? Okay. On that, it's only the things that we actually incurred expenses on that get submitted. For instance, there was a performance bond that was in through there. Um, during negotiations, that was not done, so that wasn't billed. We had builder's risk, and we had other items. So it is only items, and then that gets passed on eventually to the federal so, government, and they review and make sure that that was a true expense. So some of the things that are listed here that you may have done didn't get billed? That's correct. Okay. So it's safe to say that you may have billed for taxes, but it's not a requirement to do so. No, no, no. It's for any any expense that we have incurred, we will bill. So the it tempers, says, yes. It says pass through costs may be submitted. I may choose to jump off a bridge, but that don't mean I have to. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just giving an example. So that's why I'm trying to understand. Understood. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I fully understand what's happening here. And I, I, I feel for this entire process because it seems like some people's negotiating skills put people in a bind. But I'm very concerned about potentially opening up a law where how it's written and it's open to all contractors right. and all of these things. That, that's a concern for me because mm -hmm. I have to not only think about what losses your company might feel you're incurring, but I have to think about the entire territory. Sure. So that's where I'm very concerned about how this piece of legislation is. Sure. So trust okay. me, it's nothing Rep personal. Senator. Believe me, because I would love R for our local... Senator, I wrap it up. I but gave understand you, me. Senator, you need to yes, wrap sir? it up. I gave you an additional two and a half minutes and you're not wrapping up. Oh, you did? Of Look course, of course, I know that that's, you heard. That's nice time. of you. <laughs> well, thank you well, so much. I had I had a quite a bit of questions, but... Um, I do thank you guys for answering the ones that I did ask. I, I, thank I you. appreciate it. We'd be it. willing to sit down with you at any point in time. Well, see, okay. Nobody spoke Section to two of the question. bill. Section two of the bill says involving claims for disaster assistance. It doesn't say for any federal monies. It says involving claims for disaster assistance. So um, that that language is clear there as, as to whether or not there needs to be additional language, but I just wanted to make sure that I point that out. Uh, Senator Whitaker, you are recognized. Good, good evening, Chair. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening. Good evening, colleagues. Good evening to the testifiers. Good evening to the listening viewing audience, to all our staff here. Um, I want to first off just really state that um, it's really important that I really support this measure because I've heard from all sides. And um, it is really important that we go beyond reading it, like going beyond what the reading is and really focusing on what the legislation says. To Director Williams Octolane, um, you served in a previous capacity within FEMA. In your previous capacity or your awareness within your position, were there any laws that, that FEMA recommended be amended as one of the things that FEMA has pushed for in the Virgin Islands is that we update our laws to make it congruent also so that we can receive disaster assistance? Can you please speak to what, if any, recommended changes did FEMA ever make regarding our, our laws on the, procurement? FEMA, FEMA won, all, all the rec recommendations that FEMA made was an effort really early on. I remember participating in um, procurement training and providing procurement training to the territory during my, my time with FEMA. And it was always to ensure that whatever our local laws are, that it is in compliance with the federal law. Um, and Senator, I think it's important to note that the concern here is that the law, we're creating a separate law that 
one for local laws and one for federal laws. We have the right to make any changes to our new laws. What FEMA looks for is that we apply our local law. They test to check if the local law was, was, was adhered to and whether or not um, it is not in contradiction with the federal law. Director Williams, Octoline, where do you read, which, can you give a, a, a line item of where do you read that this would include a separate carve out for the local? Where, where is there any mention of, the lo, of local In the contractors? legislation? Correct. So this line? this which legislation line, is changing the way how we deal with but I'm asking federally which, 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 recovery which, funded projects as opposed to it does not, this, this law, this legislation is not being applied across the board. It's just being applied to recovery funds. And I need to make a point of information. The recovery funds is not FEMA only, you know. We have a plethora of other federal funds. And you can check on our website. It's not just FEMA. So okay, the well, implications th are not only th for thank FEMA you, funds. Thank you, Dr. Williams, Dr. Lane. To Interim Director uh, Clendenin. As you work with um, FEMA and address, because we had a visit recently, right, by the um, HUD secretary, Marsha Fudge, um, concerning our slow progress, right, of, of the slow progress. Were any directives given to you? Did, what advice, if anything, did, did, did the secretary pass to you with respect to our slow progress and an ability to fulfill contracts? Um. When the secretary came, we talked um, a little bit just about spending. Um, also, she talked about our use with uh, the nonprofit organizations, but we did not have a conversation about contracts. We did not have a conversation about changing the GRT to line item. We just did not have that specifically. One minute. I was going to, I'm going to go ahead and turn to to Mr. Edelman. Um, the question I have concerns, uh, as you know, as you outlined that subcontractors will be impacted by our lack of progress, lack of the issues surrounding how the, the contract was as, as being delivered. What, uh, if any, relationships have you engaged, uh, have, do you have with the subcontractors with respect to what is taking place today and how we're going to move forward to address the concerns raised about them not being able to collect, to lose money, um, the issues surrounding that's plaguing the timeline that is um, soon going to, the, the slowness of where, where we're moving and how it impact their businesses. Have you had those conversations and meetings with them? I, I think I understood your question. If I don't, please correct me. Um, if I can go back to the beginning, it was the intent of both parties, HFA and AECOM, to try to, in essence, um, when we did the contract was developed. If there's a provision in the contract that is in conflict with something else within the contract, or in this case, the state statute, the parties are supposed to work together to try to resolve the, that that issue. Um, we have tried uh, for four years trying to do this. Maybe it can happen soon through an administrative manner. So, for instance, uh, we were told, let's go ahead and try to submit your invoice with just saying taxes instead of gross receipts tax, because the statute says you can't submit gross receipts tax, but if we submit an invoice, it should say taxes. It could go through. That Time. didn't. Somebody else said no. Then we went through and said, well, take the letter that we get from finance that says 5% was deducted off. Take that and submit that to FEMA. Okay. That is not an invoice from any of our con uh, the contractors, but that is something from finance. And the statute only applies to private firms, not to the government agency. So we think that's still on the table that could be done, okay, to, to resolve this, okay? But that said, no, we don't want to do that. Then we said, all right, we came in and we met with Denise George, like I said, in December, and we said, all right, 
in December, there's federal preemption. In essence, CFR 200 says, well, in essence, you have to be transparent and open and itemized. Our contract says to be transparent, open, and itemized. Let's not come up with a new law. Let's just use that as a way to, in essence, get the, you want to call it a bill or whatever you want to call it, into FEMA to be reimbursed. And um, the attorney general had asked for additional information. We provided at the end of December. We haven't heard back on her decision on that, but it's um, uh, that's another option on the table. We were trying to be, it was cl the clear intent of the parties to try to make all the subcontractors and contractors whole. And we've been trying. And in essence, the only recommendation that we've gotten so far is perhaps the statute should be changed. And honestly, that's why we're here right now is, is because of that. But I am open to sit down um, you know, to talk with anyone to see if there is a creative way, perhaps we can get us a lot of good smart minds in the room to figure out how to deal with the intent that's now of the contract, okay, and the parties at the time that's conflicting with the state statute so we can't reimburse, get the money reimbursed from FEMA. Did I answer your question, Senator? Thank you, and I have just one last follow-up to Director Lee. I know you you, ha you go throughout the country, you have your conferences, and you should be rather familiar with other state statutes. What other place, jurisdiction in the entire country, other territories, has the same statute like ours, where f forcing, um, where they have, in their local statutes, state that they cannot separate the gross receipts. Where have you ever heard that? Any of your colleagues throughout the country, other territories, where? Well, good day, Senator. Once again, Joel Lee, Director of Bureau of Internal Revenue. I am not familiar with any other jurisdiction that restricts uh, gross receipt sales tax separately. I, 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 to be honest, our territory is the only one I've seen. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but in my experience, I've only seen that in the Virgin Islands. And would you like to see that changed? Um, we've always discussed that. There's some mechanics that is going to be a problem. Um, once again, for example, a sales tax is only charged on the consumer level. Our gross receipts mechanism, uh, you know, charges along each, each transaction. So there's going to be an impact of funds. And our bond covenants, quite frankly, restrict changing it you know as as we feel so thank you for that and i just that just is a reminder of the work we have to do we have to several provisions and codes but i want us to focus in on today's discussion on making people whole because it would really not be right for us to sit here and allow person that's to get paid the prime the subs and and that is the um, concern here today that persons have performed work and they may not get paid. And that's, that's a major concern. That should be to all of us. Um, yeah, you're correct, Senator. But once again, um, the, the, the talk in IRB is everyone is a taxpayer. And unfortunately, this bill only addresses federal contractor, you know, contractors. I'm going to be faced with a whole lot of co other contractors who are going to say, well, why, didn't, why aren't we able to get it? Um, reimburse, and then I have to go into an explanation to say, well, you, you didn't, you weren't a part of the federal recovery process. You know, I'm sorry. So that's really my inherent fear. And then, then there's possible litigation. Of, well, that's not fair. I, I, I should be deserving. I'm a VI resident. Why did I not get? Well, why didn't a law change to, to to take care of me? That's the bottom line. My true fear of this process. You're finished, Senator? Okay. The, the bill is not to become a local obligation. So I, I think there, there, there's not a comparison because it's not, it's not a waiver on, on gross receipt taxes. And if um, somebody's paying gross receipt and then they say, well, I want it back, but it's not a source independent of the, of the government of GVI to give back those monies, then um, that that comparison can be made. This is not monies that we 
are going to be given out from the GPI. These are federal funds that are going to be reimbursed, and they might and they might not. They might say no, but they also might. And if they are supposed to say, okay, well, you are going to be reimbursed for those monies. Those monies that are reimbursed, aren't we going to charge them a next gross receipt and the monies they get back? Won't they have to pay a gross receipt tax and those monies? Say it, say it into the... One minute. Yeah, go ahead. It's still not coming in. Sure again. No, not not and sure. I can't hear yes. What's the question? I'm I'm sorry. If it's a question. The the, the question oh. is, if you're supposed to receive a reimbursement from federal funds. Can the government of the Virgin Islands tax you on those funds and collect gross receipts off of those funds that you receive? Okay. It would appear to be so. It yes. Be, yes. Okay. Point of inquiry. I'm going to go to Senator Joseph in, in, in one minute, and thank you, Senator Joseph, for um, joining us. We're talking disaster recovery, but in a minute, Senator. We're talking disaster recovery, but a lot has changed with this recent two Category 5 hurricanes that hit the Virgin Islands. Prior to Irma Maria, we were only allowed to rebuild to what we had before. That was correct, Ms. Actually. <laughs> The, the, the Safford Act only allowed us to rebuild to what we presently had before, what we previously had before? Correct, yes. Congress changed that law. And then Congress changed that law after a delegation from the Virgin Islands went to Washington in November. I was a part of that delegation. And we walked the halls of Congress and the Senate, and we fought for changes to the Stafford Act that would allow the Virgin Islands to rebuild brand new, to be able to fortify schools, hospitals, to move to a different level and not to just build back to the state that you were. And as a result, Congress changed the law. Change, you know, keyword, change. Change the stuff that came up with a budget bipartisan act. They changed and said, hey, Virgin Islands, you can rebuild. Thank God Congress ain't got the attitude we have here today. We were saying we can't change anything because we'd have been back to where we were before, which we couldn't, couldn't improve or receive the amount of monies that we presently have access to now. So because of the changes in the federal law, we have access to more federal dollars than we ever had. The same after Hurricane Hugo, where it was limited, we have access to a tremendous amount of federal dollars. This government signed a contract with a company with specific language in the contract. So the overarching question is whether or not this government can impair the contract. And if an impairment of the contract takes place, and God forbid a lawsuit is filed, and we lose the lawsuit, who's going to be left holding the bag is the GVI. Not the federal government, no, because we didn't submit anything to them. So they're not going to be left holding the bag. We are going to be left holding the bag because of our lack of submission. But if we submit and they deny it, we tried. We're not left holding the bag. It's pontification. And you could talk whatever you want with your pontification, but you do have some up meetings the last <laughs> eight or nine hours and talk forever and ever. So I need to be able to explain uh, my, my particular point. And um, media, if we're going to have senators interrupting senators when they're speaking, if you can just cut their mic so that they're not able to speak on the record and interrupt other senators. It's only basic respect. Senator Donna Fred Gregory, you're recognized for a point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a um, point of inquiry I would like to ask um, both of the representatives 
of uh, both ACOM and um, Aptim. So you came to the Virgin Islands to do business. Um, when you came to the Virgin Islands, you guys, your, your companies are global companies, I. Yes. My goodness, sorry, my, my, my thing went on mute. Mr. Mr. Chair will be mute me just though. Um, so you came to the Virgin Islands to do business, yourself. and of course, the Virgin Islands has um, their tax structure, which requires that anybody that does business in the United States Virgin Islands has to pay gross receipt taxes. So um, to Director Octolane's uh, point, um, there was a 10% markup on your um, your contract, if you will, just for the sake of what I'm trying to explain. So now, um, is it the expectation that you don't expect to pay any taxes in the Virgin Islands as far as gross receipt taxes? Because that's what I'm gathering from this discussion because you're paying, and, and don't, don't say to me that you're paying it on the front end because if for some magical reason to the point of the chair, we, you were able to, we were able to get this done then those funds come back and then you get reimbursed. So it means that you walk away with everything. So what is the expectation when you come into a city, a state, you don't expect to pay taxes? Okay. Let me go ahead and answer. can go second. Okay. Um, we pay taxes. We'll always pay taxes. We will continue to pay taxes. There's nothing in here that we're trying to get out of paying taxes. Our contract says we will pay all taxes. We pay taxes. Uh, sir? The sir, only thing is we want to reimburse. I'm sir, sorry. you want it reimbursed? Who is going to get the reimbursement? That's the okay. question I'm asking. Con Adrian, conclude your point. Who is going to get the reimbursement? Conclude your point. Okay. The reimbursement this comes so back to the, the people head. who did the work. It, to the companies who did the work. Exactly. Okay, thank you. So then, so then at the end of the day, thank, no thank you, Senator. I allowed you to ask a question. I allowed you to ask a question. Right thank you. That's the third thank point you, of Mr. inquiry. Chair. Thank you for asking the question. You asked the question and answered your own question. So thank you for asking the question, Senator Carla Joseph. You recognize. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate the recognition and a pleasant good afternoon to you, uh, members of the Finance Committee, our listening and viewing audience. I am not a member of the Finance Committee, but I thought it would be a good time for me to come here and ask some very pointed question relative to uh, this legislation since it impacts uh, federal grants that we receive, knowing that I have had the opportunity of managing federal grants for over a decade. So, and I and I must say, they were managed well and within budget. I, I have some questions that I jotted down here because they, it's really concerning. I'm really concerned about this for this legislation and its far reaching implications relative to federal funds that we receive here in the Virgin Islands and how it could be perceived if we actually implemented and enact this legislation. Uh, I have a question here for uh, Mr. Elderman. Uh, who was involved in preparing your bid documents? Because this seems to be, you're just here. I don't know if any other contractor uh, with the government, whether they have issues, but who was involved with preparing the bid documents for in answer of these storms? Okay. Was you were involved? I personally was involved. I was here a couple of days after Irma, stayed here through the whole thing. I was in the room when the contracts were negotiated. Okay. And so you when when you negotiated the contracts, did you also take into consider consideration the gross receipt taxes? Absolutely. Back in October 2017, we actually sent okay. a letter to Governor Mapps saying this issue has to be resolved for all disaster 
projects coming up. We're fully aware of GRT. Okay, good. So you are aware of that? Were you in that letter indicating that this law would need to change at that point in time so that you can get reimbursed from FEMA? No, what that letter said is you need to set a firm policy on how it's to be treated on projects. That wasn't done. And when we came into the step contract to negotiate it, that is when FEMA, in their guidance to set up the program, set up two buckets and to maximize the number of homes, they moved everything as far as out of hard construction at a $25,000 per cap per home. So they put travel, you know, uh, moving of materials, taxes into one. And that's when we were told to take us and we were sat down and negotiated. They said, go back that night. And our contractors were in the office that night. Make sure the contractors do not, do not have GRT inside their unit prices. Okay, because the GRT should have been separated. That's right, because then you could have, then more homes were able to be repaired, and the heart was in the, in the right okay. spot. Okay, Mr. Yeah. Elderman, I'm good with that. Now, um, Ms. Williams Octoline, would if this measure should pass, would it increase the cost? of the federal funds that we are expecting, one. Yes, it would increase the overall cost for the project. Okay, and then we would also have this cost to uh, provide the 10% match? Yes, so so okay. in addition, if I said, go ahead. No, you go ahead. So, so if I increase, if I if it's increased by sixty-seven million, then I would have to pay the ten percent match on the sixty-seven. No, what? Thank minute. you. Now, the key with this um, piece of legislation, if they, if it was to pass, who would the reimbursement for the gross receipt taxes go to? Would this reimbursement go directly to the contractor, or would it go directly to the government, and then the government, just in the process, uh, would then? Uh, send out that reimbursement? How does that flow? So the amount that would be reimbursed, uh, we've already we've already paid gross receipts taxes to IRB on your payments. If this is submitted as just GRT and they should be reimbursed, then it would go to is it going to be paid? Is going to go payable to the contractor? Is is a check going to be issued from the federal government to the contractor? No. Not the federal government. It would be from the local government. The local government would now issue a check to um, the the contractor for gross receipts that were already paid to the local government. Is that it? So uh, then based on fact, how this is structured. How is it structured? So said, in fact, it, it looks, it gives, right, it, it gives the impression that they are not paying any gross receipt taxes. I mean, I have they, managed federal, hmm? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I have managed a number of federal <clears throat> programs from various federal sources, and they usually operate under standard operating practices. And when this is a standard as is in our law, when they see diversions, it usually raises a red flag if it's specific for one uh, entity or one source of funds. It, 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 it looks kind of queer to them and it's a red flag. I'm a little bit concerned because I don't want us to have to pay back any money. You will you will be gone, and I know your attorney is shaking her head, but I'm telling you, you do not make the final call in here. It's FEMA, and we have to be able to protect ourselves. The government, and I keep stressing it, even at every Time. disaster recovery meeting that we have, that we don't have sufficient money here to pay back any money. We need to manage this money well. And anything that is going to place us in a position wherein we have to 
pay back money or have us liable, then that's a problem. Um, wrap, I have wrap those it up, concerns. Senator, your and time like has a previous been I'm going to wrap up, Mr. Chairman. And just allow me. You should just um, request. I just think that we should just to request have some additional here and time. See how it would be treated. Thank you kindly, Mr. Chairman, for the leeway. I appreciate your patience and your grace. Thank you, Senator Joseph. I mean, I've been giving everybody additional time, and it's just courtesy when time has been called to say, um, can I wrap up? And then I allow you to continue. I have some follow-up questions, and I allow you um, to continue. Senator James, point. After Senator James, Senator Francis Heiliger. My point is a point of inquiry. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. My, my question to, to the Office of Disaster Recovery. I know it was kind of like incorrect with the last, one of my, the last, the previous speaker made mention about we having to owe. Based on my understanding, we are gonna still collect the gross receipts taxes. It's just that the company wants to be reimbursed. So we're having a different conversation. So my, my question is, I know in the testimony of the Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority, it mentioned that there is no written rule or regulation or letter guaranteeing that the Federal Emergency Management Agency will reimburse these funds if the bill is passed. So my question to the Office of Disaster Recovery, what would be the worst case scenario? Just, just for the public, I know, but I just wanted to say to the public, Worst case scenario, the bill is passed, and then we're trying to ask FEMA to have them be reimbursed. So we, we are no longer on manual draw, so we would draw the funds on our own. We would then, so let's say I pay out this $67 million, we draw it down, we pay it out. When it goes to close up, FEMA would say, um, this is a violation, we have not demonstrated cost reasonableness, and they can ask us, Claw, claw back the funds and ask us to be ask the government of the Virgin Islands to repay it. And my last question: What stops any one of us from sitting down with FEMA to have this conversation to make sure that if we move forward with a bill, it is good? Because I I, I try to understand what is stopping any one of us, especially the proponents of the measure, from sitting down with FEMA to find out if this is even reasonable. But I, I just want to place that on the record. You answer the question, it's not for you to answer. I just state in that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, um, Senator James. And you would not reimburse anything unless it's approved. We would be foolish to reimburse $67 million and it's not approved by FEMA, and then it's going to be clawed back. We, we would not do that. That, that. that doesn't make sense. You would have to go through the process of seeing whether or not it is approved, and you would have to have written approval before you do anything. You can't just go and say, yes, we're going to do this, and FEMA and give us a reimbursement. Senator, we have already have the, if I, Mr. Chair, if I could just share a little bit. Um, we have the funds, once the funds are obligated, um, we, we, we draw the funds down. And why would you draw so, down funds if unless, it's not approved? That, that's my, my question is, why would you draw funds down if it's not approved? You, you draw them down. Why would we pay if it's not approved? Why would the GVI pay anything that's not approved and not given the okay by FEMA? So, again, if, unless you're saying that this is, we, we're not clear whether or not this is eligible, therefore we should get pre-approval from FEMA. Correct. Because that's not our... We fought to be able to make those decisions on our own yeah. and not have payments go through FEMA. But we're not, so if, if I'm, I'm understanding not, you correctly, we just want to make sure that for this particular request that we get, we send it to FEMA to correct. make sure that it's okay. Correct. We're not going, to, in no way is this legislation saying that we are supposed to pay anything without approval and then um, we, we, we have a red flag. It's saying that you have the discussion and the question was asked before us, so whether or not there, there was a discussion um, on this particular issue. And if there was, and, and FEMA said X, Y, and Z, then that's it. But, but at the very least, a discussion should be had with, 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 with all the eligible parties. Senator Francis Heilager, you recognize. Thank you so much. 
Um, good afternoon again. Through the chair to Ms. Octolin. Um, the question I want to ask is a, a quick scenario for my own knowledge and understanding. If the territory is awarded $100 and, for example, a, a payout goes out for the full amount for $100, well, let me use $1,000. And a company is awarded a contract for $100. When it's time to pay out, we keep the $5 and we give them the $95. So that $5 is the gross receipts. So if this bill were to pass and we now take that itemized invoice and they submit it to get back that $5, is that coming from a separate pool of money or is it going to reduce the $1,000 that we were initially awarded? It is going to reduce it is all it is all in the obligated cost so whatever cost we're paying if we're going to give it back then it will come from the total obligated cost project cost so so at the total obligated cost when they get the five dollars and it's turned over for for gross receipt taxes and then they come back for it they're taking out another five dollars out of the thousand that's what you're saying is going to happen so we take we're gonna take out the five we're gonna take out the five dollars and they're going to we're gonna take out the five dollars and and pay it out um, and then they will have hmm, we're gonna take out the five dollars right so it's it's that we, and we and we'd have to use the money from the PW again to pay them out okay. So basically, Colleagues, okay, wait, you, that, that's, your third one, that, that's your third point I allowed you. We're going to go to a okay, quick two-minute round. So um, senators, a quick two-minute uh, closeout round. If you have any questions, um, be concise. Senator James, you recognize. Yes. I have the other um, response, response. I need to speak, please. Oh, I, I have, I, I have I'm my, so my sorry, um, Senator Blyden. There have been so many points and so many everything. I need to speak, please. Thank I, you. I am so sorry, Senator Blyden. You are recognized. You are so correct. You have been so quiet. I've never seen this in my you. life. For real. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Colleagues, colleagues, listen, right? I've heard some statements here today and... I've been up this my four term, and I don't play them games, okay? Special interest legislation, blighting. You know what it is? Because the people of this territory are my interest, and they're special to me. So yes, it is special interest. The coffers of the government is special to me. Yes, it is special interest. So let's get it correct. Now, the reason why I sign on and sponsor this bill, I have nothing to lose, you know. I have about the people and doing things the right way. You understand? Anything controversial is right, I go do it. I have no qualms, no issue, no fear, none. Let me ask. Even if we, even not continuing what we're facing right now, based on what we know, it's like, it's, it's positive for the territory moving forward based on what has occurred, based on why we are here. Forget after an ACOM. Let's think about what the bill intent is in terms of our small local contractors and any company that comes in here to assist with matters involving disaster assistance. That's what Section 2 states. It's not any federal contract. It is clear in the bill. So let's, 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 let's keep it real and be, be, be clear moving forward. When it comes to the gross receipt tax, it was asked several times to Director Lee and others in respect to any other states. South Dakota, I believe, have a gross receipt tax, and they also have taxes, I mean, sales tax. And let me ask, since the two companies here, I believe ACAM, you do bid, you say you do bid it in all of the states, correct? The different states, correct? Yes. So I want to ask you, since you have done it, right, um, how do they separate um, and itemize uh, the receipts when it comes to federal disaster funds? That's my question. Okay. We itemize it on our invoices. You can hit a mic, please, so folks can hear. It, it's itemized on our invoice. 
and it's reimbursed by the federal government. So that's how it works. Yes. And we have gross receipts here. And my colleague made an excellent point. I was there also when we, we, we went and, and, and basically was advocating on behalf of the Virgin Islands when it came to the, the, um, the disaster with Marilyn and um, Irma. And I was part of that delegation. And they changed the law because of our advocacy. So change is part of life. And if you have an issue and you need change in laws like we do here in this body every single day, that's why we are here, we do so accordingly. So I do not understand why, you know, it's like we, are, we cannot do it. Of course we can. We just need to do it the right way. You know, so how the law is written is the reason why we are here. The law needs to be changed. And it's not a blanket statement that all federal dollars, you know, is going to be reimbursable. It's just disaster assistance. Matters including disaster assistance. So my thing is, I am just listening. And I'm, 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 I'm honestly disappointed in some of the comments. Everyone have their own mindset, and, and they can say what they want. Yes, but just based on some of the comments, I expect us to be open-minded and see how we can make this thing work for all of us, for our people, for our small contractors. It's not about no company, none. Because any company can come in here and bid on contracts. The point is we want our fair share. We want to be on a level playing field with other states. That's what it's about. That's why we are here, to look out for the best interest of our people, our hardworking, smart contractors. So that's what it's all about, colleagues. It's not about no individual company. Now, when it comes to FEMA and reimbursing these federal dollars, that's flowing through this, this territory, billions. Are we saying that we are not going to do anything? That's what we are saying here today. We are not going to do nothing. We have none to lose. One minute. The team said no, well, they said no, but well, at least we tried. At least we tried. We must try. That's why our representatives said us had to fight on their behalf. We just can't say, well, we can't do nothing. Since when? Since when? I've never heard of another my colleague before, ever. Since when? We don't have a way that are wrong here. We are resilient people. So we need to stop it. For real. We need to stop it. Special interests? Really? Come on, guys. Come on. Non talk or so. Listen, um, let me ask. Let me talk to a small contractor. What's your name, young lady? I forgot. I know it's Harris or Seppo Impact Factor. What's the name of your company? Uh, it's Falcon USVI. My name is Jerry McGrath Holland. Good afternoon, Miss. Your name is McGrath. Tell me, based on what you're hearing, and what is your what is your opinion in terms of this legislation, and how has it impacted your company in respect to the contract and it not being fulfill the way it should have, been, should have been fulfilled in terms of your company and your reimbursement? Well, it has, it has posed a, a hardship on the company overall. Um, we have downsized quite a bit. Uh, it's just, it's hard. We're just trying to, you know, make it. So people, will you lose jobs? Mr. Chair, can I wrap up, please? Can I consult, uh, please? Mr. Chair? Yes, you can wrap up. I, I would say no, because we have other work currently, but um, we still have a lot of money out, a lot of loans to pay and so forth on. So it, it's, 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 it's hard. I understand that most of my friends are contractors and that are going to remain with why I sponsor this piece of legislation. I understand being there, done that. And that's why we are here. We're going to do everything possible to see that we do the right thing by you and by the government of the Virgin Islands. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you so much, Senator Blyden. Before we go to our second round, we are going to take a two minutes recess, a restroom break for everyone. 
and then we're going to come back and conclude. This committee stands in recess for two minutes.
The Committee of Finance is uh, back in the record. If we can have the testifiers uh, go back uh, to their seats so that we can begin a discussion uh, for the second round. Each senator will be allotted uh, two minutes. We, I'm still seeing one um, testifier. Before I go to the second round, um, I want to allow um, Attorney Dudley. You wanted to uh, put something on the record. I will proceed and allow you to go ahead and speak. Sure. Me? Yes, Attorney Dudley, you wanted to put something on the record. Mike, yes. You may proceed. Thank you very much. Um, Chair Viele, I think we've gotten a little too far afield. We're only talking about a very narrow class of individuals and entities that are affected here. The reason why the bill has to be, this bill needs to be passed is because there is a contract that provides all of the costs of doing this project. Typically, the costs of a project, including taxes, are bundled into the project. It's there. It's buried in the overhead. But in this case, because there was a distinct set-aside sum of money purely to help homeowners shelter in place, we were told specifically, back out all of these other costs. We only want the bare minimum cost in here. We want the labor and the materials and so forth. But all these other things, these soft, so-called soft costs, and taxes were expressly included. The issue is that BIHFA, because it is constrained by the law as it is, will not submit invoices for GRT paid by all of these contractors. Because even though it's an essential component of the contract, it's like I contracted for a dollar, I'm supposed to get a dollar, but I only got 95 cents. They have to be made whole. We're, obviously the multiplication involved for my single dollar is huge, but it's simple. The only difference between this set of contractors and an ordinary group of contractors dealing with the government is that they were involved in a special program with a special contract that had special requirements that everyone had to meet. One of those requirements was, as I said, to maximize the benefits of the program for the homeowners eligible, and some of whom may have been neglected, I candidly concede. But the costs were backed out for a reason, for the Virgin Islands homeowners. They weren't backed out because somebody felt like it. That's the way it was going to be in order for this program to work. These contractors entered into this contract expecting that their cost like in any other contract, would all be paid. They weren't. All the other costs were paid, but not GRT. Because despite the fact that VIHFA signed an agreement that says break out GRT, and I have no, I'm not making any, casting any aspersions on VIHFA, they were doing what the program required. We are now reluctant says EIHFA, ODR, and everybody else, despite the instruction from Whit O'Brien, specifically authorized by VHA, VIHFA, in a letter signed by then director, Daryl Griffith, to be the exclusive representative of VIHFA in the negotiations. We have in writing from Whit O'Brien, 
C-I-H-F-A will submit invoices and you will be reimbursed all of your costs, including gross receipts taxes. Don't think anybody was hiding this under a barrel. From day one, two days after the hurricane, when everybody arrived and I was there at the table, we said, what do we do about this? You have this requirement to put it here. What are we going to do? And I explained the conundrum. Oh, no worry. We'll handle it. We'll discuss it. We'll take care of it. Here we are four years later. Everybody is sitting here waiting for their money. It's not like it's a bonus. This is the same money they'd be entitled to, like they're entitled to pay for the rental cars, or they're entitled to pay for moving something, if they're entitled to pay for raising a property, whatever the work was, carpentry, plumbing, whatever it was, it's just like that, all laid out. You cannot separate it. Now you're saying we can't do it? Now when we all made this agreement? That's not right. And VIHFA feels constrained because there's a law in the books that says we're not supposed to let you do that, so we cannot submit an invoice for that. The only reason for this amendment is to make sure that contractors subject to this contract are made whole. And in the future, because there's a lot of money, I can't even begin to estimate it, but a lot of money coming down the pike to the Virgin Islands, which unlike any other jurisdiction, has a law that says, you can't break out one of your costs. Okay, but you want us to hide it when we're required to be transparent? No, not every contract says you have to do this. This one was special. We may or may not get another special one, but we need to be prepared for that. Please, I implore you, we are not talking about the floodgates here. We're talking about doing what a contract requires and amending a statute to permit that to happen in cases where the contract requires it to happen, not just any old body, any old time. That's the wrong impression completely. If the contract so requires it, it can be done. And all of the cost, all of them can be paid to the people who did the work. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Dudley. And um, testify as before you answer any additional question, we have a new recorder, so please put your name on the record. Senator James, we're going to go two minutes wrong, um, colleagues, and then we're going to wrap this up. Two minutes. Yes, thank you, thank you so Mr. Much. Chair, for the time. To Mr. Hellman, I think it's, oh, Hellman, Hellman, Hellman. Hello. Earlier, you mentioned CFR 200, but CFR 200 is very broad, and I was going through the different sections. Can you speak to which section you were referring to, the specific section in CFR 200? Sure. It, uh, um, let me just pull it on up here. So while you're looking for that, my question to Director Williams we had hurricanes Hugo, hurricanes Marilyn, and several tropical storms and what have you in the territory. What what is so different with the hurricane with hurricanes Irma Maria compared to the hurricanes in the past? I'm trying to find out did we do something wrong in the past? Like what what's happening here? Can you explain to us? Sorry, I, no, this I can narrow it down to one point. This contract was not as clear as it should be. We don't have this issue with any other contractors. So that's it, it, this. This doesn't apply to any other contracts. It's just these two contracts with HFE. So we we're fixing a problem that doesn't exist. Okay, thank you. And my question to Director Clendenin. Um, I know you recently um, were appointed to that position. And during the transition, had you had an opportunity to transition, have a transitional or a conversation with the director who was there before regarding what we have here before us and uh, what, were the, what were those discussions like regarding the subject matter um, here? Yes, 
And again, I think most of the conversation, it will you'll see that's outlined in the testimony. Um, in the contract, it states the contractor is responsible for taxes and they have to pay the applicable taxes. So that is the conversation I have had um, with Mr. Griffith that there was like, that there was no um, expectation that the company would not be a common aptim would not be responsible for paying their gross receipt taxes. Time. And Mr. Chair, if you can also allow the gentleman to answer the question that I asked before regarding CFR 200. Sure. Yes, yeah, CFR 200.470. That for us, Ernie. All right, thank you so much. I don't Scott want to, I don't I'm want sorry, to... I forgot to say my name again. Sorry. No problem. I'm not going to abuse my time because my mind is already made up. It does so, so, for, so unfortunate that um, we have these individuals who came down here to help the territory and they're facing this situation. But um, I know how, how I will vote and um, I, I feel like the bill will pass. I think they have the numbers. But um, we still have time to, to vet the bill in the Committee on Rules and Judiciary and in the full body. So it is what it is. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator James. I'm just trying to be clear again that this bill does not seek to waive any gross receipt taxes for any of these companies. The gross receipt taxes are taken out the top. It doesn't stop that from happening. Senator Fred Gregory. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I always have to segue on you because you always talk before me. Mm -hmm. um, it does waive the gross receipt taxes because the contractors will be reimbursed. So it does. So let's make sure we put that on the record. And I know that we spoke about the contingency of Virgin Islanders or senators that went to Washington, D.C. Let's be reminded that law was changed for Puerto Rico. And we just happened to benefit from it, okay? And this situation reminds me of exactly what happened at the Virgin Islands Port Authority sometime in 2018, where they were trying to do this very same thing for Lamar Tech. And individuals lost their jobs. This matter is a matter that should be going before the courts. We should not be changing our laws to accommodate a contractor or two contractors or a contract. If you look at the testifiers today, this is a financial discussion of, regarding the government of the Virgin Islands. And we don't even have the commissioner of finance or the OMB director here. Amazing. We have HFA and disaster recovery, impactful legislation. Now, I heard the bill sponsor made a lot of comments around the, um, this particular legislation. And, you know, he talked about how it will benefit the Virgin Islands, not drilling down on exactly what that meant. Um, and I wish to remind all of us that GRT is not a pass-through expense. It is a cost of doing business in the United States Virgin Islands. We also made reference, I heard reference about South Dakota and how they deal with their um, federal federal disasters or their, their taxes. Remember, the states, all of the states that we reference here today, that we try to compare ourselves to, none of them have separate laws to address disaster. None of them. Time. What we're trying to do here is unique to the Virgin Islands. And I have nothing further. I have no more questions because I've already made up my mind. I've done my research and my background is finance. And frankly, this conversation is somewhat insulting. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your kind word, Senator Fred Gregory. Senator Janelle Saru, point of information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have to make a, um, a mm -hmm. correction for the record about the law being changed because of Puerto Rico. It is quite nauseating for the president of this, for this, for the president of this institution to continue to insult the work of the body and what the body did in the 32nd. When we went to DC, you weren't there. You didn't sit with us 
and the and HUD. You didn't sit with us and members of Congress. You didn't sit with us and members of the, the, the Senate and the House of Representatives when we lobbied for $8 billion for this territory and change in the Stafford Act. We were there from sunup to sundown in meetings fighting for this territory. So don't sit and say that it was changed for Puerto Rico. The representatives of this territory worked hard on behalf of the people. We cannot continue to downplay the work of those that came before us. Do not do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, <coughs> Senator General Saru. I think that through um, the last two hurricanes, if we really go back in history, we know that the relationship that the former president had with Puerto Rico, especially the mayor of San Juan, and it was not a good relationship, and they had quite a lot of difficulty uh, moving forward. So um, our lobbying in, in Washington paid off. And the former delegate to Congress did an excellent job in setting up key meetings that we attended for a period of days. And I know that the recommendation is that this is a matter that should be, that should go to the court and be settled in court. Well, this legislature just ratified an agreement that was in court. We call it a settlement agreement. So we can't have it both ways. We have an agreement that was in court, we bring it before the legislature, and we say we're going to settle it and give them the opportunity to go back to court if they want, if we make certain moves. And then with this one, everything has just changed and everything is just bad and everything is, oh, we, we, we're giving it away. There is nothing in this bill that is going to stop these companies from paying the gross receipt. They must pay it. No reimbursement is coming back from the general fund of the government of the Virgin Islands. It is allowable costs that have been reimbursed for federal contracts across the nation. Oh, it's, it's really not fair to say, oh, they're not paying, we're giving them away everything. Because that is not the intent. But I know that that is the intent that is going to be, um, that individuals are going to try to paint because it is what it is. Senator, a quick point and after, Okay, everybody only get one more point. So this is Senator James' last point, and everybody only get one more if they want it because we got to conclude. Um, and, and just yes. one question, a follow-up. Go ahead. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. At, at some point before this, uh, we take the vote, I would also like to uh, request through the chair if you could give um, our legal counsel some time to interpret CFR Section 200-470 regarding taxes and... Um, just, just to get his okay. interpretation and how... Tell him the section again. Uh, Code of Federal Regulations, two, section 200-470 regarding taxes. Um, before we wrap up and take the vote, I just want our legal counsel to, to, to express to this body his interpretation of that section regarding the taxes and how we can apply it to U.S. territories. Thank you. Thank you so much. Senator DeGraff, you recognize. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to stick to the matter at hand. Again, for me, does subcontractors, do you have your contract is with AECOM and Aptin or with the government of the Virgin Islands? AECOM and Aptin, you could put it on the record, please. Yeah, share your name. Yeah. My name is Miguel Quinones with Allen Services Group. Our con my our contract is with AECOM and Aptin. Okay, in your contract states that you'll be reimbursed for grocery taxes? The contract doesn't um, specify the reimbursement. It, it was just an agreement that taxes would be billed uh, separately, we were not to be included in the unit cost or or the rates that okay. we provided. So, so payroll taxes and other taxes uh, separately or yeah. as a part too. No, um, payroll taxes are not not included in that conversation. Okay, okay. So, so again, okay. So now, 
ACOM and Aptin, your contract is with the government of the Virgin Islands to Housing Finance Authority? Yes. Right. Okay. For based on, on what we've heard through the chair to legal counsel, have we heard a breach of a contract? I need to be recognized by this yeah. chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, he was waiting on you. Through the chair to legal counsel, you may proceed. Uh, I'm sen uh, through the chair to Senator DeGraff. I apologize, Senator. I was in the middle of doing the research for Senator James. So um, I, I didn't hear the full context of the, of the question that you posed to our yes, I, testimony. Yes, I, I was stating that the subcontractor's contract is with AECOM and Aptin. They don't have a contract with BI Housing Finance Authority, the BI government. AE Common Aptin has a contract with the Bernal's government, and you've sat here, you've heard the discussions back and forth. It, again, you're not going to make the determination, but do we sound like we have a breach of a contract somewhere? If, if, and the determination of a breach of contract is made by the courts, but yeah. to, to the extent that a contract provides for a, a certain right of a contractor, in this case, um, so, um, expenses, cost of doing business, we're specific talking about gross receipts tax to be reimbursed, um, and that is not done. Time. Again, I have not seen the contract, so right. I can't speak specifically to the contract, but to the extent that there's certain elements of a contract that have been agreed to um, in, this, in, in that particular instance, um, yes, they can make an argument that contract is being breached. I say that that's just a very general statement without having reviewed right. okay. the contract. And, and in closing, Mr. Chair, if I may. You may go ahead, close. Okay, ju ju just to wrap up, and, and that's why <clears throat> the way I'm looking at it is to change a law to address issues that I think are of contractual nature. I think that becomes uh, an issue for me. I speak for me. And that becomes an issue. If there's a, a, a legal uh, binding contract between everyone that has not been adhered to, then I think it should be addressed. And there's a, a, a process to, to address that particular thing versus coming to have the law change. Uh, thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. You just gave Wait, a good Mr. Chair, to the legal counsel. One, repeat what you said, Senator. Point of inquiry to, to through the chair to legal counsel. Everyone is allowed one. This is your one. You may proceed. Yes, sir. Uh, to the chair, legal counsel, while you're looking for C the CFR for Senator James, can you please also look up CFR 200.302? Okay, thank you so much, legal counsel. You have two. When you're ready to report on them, let me know. Senator Saro, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this legislation is before us. We we have minimized it to a company and a contract. And I believe that the legislation is far reaching. So um, I guess to Mr. Edelman, Mr. Aptim, tell me your name. John Grant. Mr. Grant, Mr. Shack over there, um, and the other testifiers. If you can tell me how does this impact the territory moving forward insofar as all of our recovery funds? Okay. Go ahead. Would you like me to take that? Yeah, sure. I'd like for more than one person to take it. John Grant from Aptim. Uh, for us, I think one of the uh, real downsides, if this isn't resolved, the territory is as and when the next disaster comes. I don't believe the territory has the capacity to deal with the response and the recovery. Uh, we're able to provide the scale and the capacity and capability, as well as providing workforce development. There are many benefits to having a company such as an Aptim and AECOM involved in a disaster recovery situation. And I think it will be extremely difficult to get large contractors or indeed any contractors to be involved 
uh, going forward if this situation isn't rectified. Edelman? Okay. This is Scott Edelman. Um, it appears that the territory is going to be getting a lot of funds, like, for instance, through the Infrastructure Job Act, maybe $7 billion, you know, coming on down through here. The, uh, in my opinion, we do work in every single state um, that the territory is working at a competitive disadvantage when you're competing against funds. What you have is different states have different ways of applying taxes, and they're open and transparent. And there are 418 different funding opportunities coming out, like the infrastructure bill coming through here. We're really only talking two here, one from FEMA and one from HUD. 418 coming down through here. Time. And in most programs, Mr. Chair, can in, you? in most programs, what, what happens is that, in essence, you could develop the cost and then items like taxes are, are added at the bottom and they're extra because if you're doing work in New York, it's different than do it in Wyoming. And that gets added in as a plus. There could be some programs coming up that you would be treated the same way in which, in essence, you would be getting extra revenue because it's not then being hidden inside your overall costs. Over. Thank you. Thank you. And is Mr. Is Mr. Um, Shaq, that's his name, Shaq? Hawkins, Shaq Hawkins. Mr. Hawkins, is he there to give a response to yes, my question, he is. please? So you may respond and then we'll move on to the next. Go ahead, Mr. Hawkins. Hi, good evening. It's Shaq Hawkins, Polaris Engineering. Um, I guess my comment would, would be both the same. Um, you know, it would be very hard to attract uh, contractors to participate uh, in future disaster recovery work, uh, especially with ambiguity and in our contracts. But second to that earlier, uh, I just wanted to mention that the, um, you know, if, if it went to the courts, it's going to take a lot of time and energy and cost from the Virgin Islands government. And the, the legal solution today, by changing a bill or by changing the law, is uh, avoids that and allows that cost to be Born by FEMA instead of born by the Virgin Islands government, and if the if the courts decide against the Virgin Islands government many years from now, that cost will not be borne by FEMA. It will be borne by the Virgin Islands government. And so, you know, what the body can do here for the contractors, whether it's AECOM, Aptum, Polaris, or all the litany of other contractors that participate in this program, um, it would be, you know, it would be to avoid the long uh, you know, litigation process in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Francis Ayelaga. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My first set of question is to AECOM and Apton. Um, based on the contract that you currently have, do you have a legal obligation if this were to happen to refund any of those gross receipts based on any written contract to refund any of those monies to the subcontractors. Okay. Scott Edelman, our contract explicitly states that when the money comes down, then we would get it, we would go and uh, pay our subcontractors. If we did not, we would be in breach of contract. Okay. If we did not. So it's written inside of the contract. It is explicitly okay. written. Yes, it is. And based on the contract that you guys signed, it's is that also written into your contract that you guys would get this reimbursement from Aptim and AECOM, the local contractors? No. Yes, I'll put your name on the record first. Engineering. Uh, Jack Hawkins, Polaris Engineer again. Um, it is in our contract that, you know, if we, if, if AECOM is paid for any invoice that we have submitted to them, they have a certain amount of days, I can't remember exactly, but it's like three to five. It's a pretty short time frame from when they receive the money from via HFA to pay us. And they've been consistent with that since the beginning of the program. It's, it's just any invoice whatsoever. So based on what I'm hearing, if they're saying they could get reimbursed, then you guys would turn around and then invoice them to get back 
your 5%. We have that, already that invoiced them for the GRT that was applicable to our program uh, or to Did our that cost. Five day limit, has that five-day limit expired since then? Because you said the contract said it's limited to about five days. It's only when they've received the money uh, that okay. was paid for that invoice. Time. Okay, thank you. Um, may I ask another question, please? You may conclude. One question. Thank you very much, sir. Um, the second question is to Ms. Octolane. One of the questions that I had asked previously in regards to the payment of gross receipts and the reimbursement and coming back to, to have that 5% be taken out of the overall grant award. Do you see, for example, if you have 20 contractors and all 20 of them come back and all have a 5% reimbursement, do you see any kind of issues where that could be a significant reduction in the overall use of capital that could be utilized in regards to these contracts? Because I am very at odds with how this conversation is going. I want to make whole those that want to, that need to get their money back. But I'm, I feel like I'm in a rock and a hard place by trying to alter a, con, a, a, a law to make somebody whole, but then it opens up the door to other things. And that's where my concern is. So Ms. Octolin, could you answer? respond to that? And then um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, name on the record and then answer, please. Adrian Williams, Octolin, Director Office of Disaster Recovery. Uh, there's there's several implications. Yes, it, it one it drives up the cost of the recovery uh, because we're invoicing actually more than um, so that it can be reimbursed. Two, we have to pay uh, the match on any additional amounts that has been obligated to the territory. It it is then the option for any other disaster recovery contractor to expect the same thing. So we're we're seeing a multi uh, there's a multiplier effect that will come from it. Thank you so much, Senator Joseph. You recognize? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Pleasant good evening to everyone. Uh, this these questions are in a technical nature, so I'm going to address them to Ms. Williams Octolin. Uh, your forms are for payment and the like, it's uh, submitted and your budgets, you typically have them on the FF424A form, correct? Because that's a standard form. The and if you, name, right. Name first. In your, in, in your, I'm sorry, I didn't hear a response. Not, not you, the, she was trying to answer, so just telling her to put a name on the record first. Okay, again, I need to do it again? Yes, every time you answer, we have a new recorder. Oh, okay, okay. Adrian Williams, Octolin, Director, Office of Disaster Recovery. The answer to your question is these invoices are submitted. Um, they, they don't necessarily have an overall budget that we have when the PW is obligated. And then we draw down the funds, but at that point, we only need to submit specific invoices and supporting documentation. Okay. Now, just looking at the overall management of the grant, because this is grant fund, would these taxes be counted as administrative cost? No. The taxes, okay. the taxes associated would be direct project costs. Direct project costs. Okay, good. So I just wanted to get that cleared up um, because I know that the match is being used that we use for FEMA funds is HUD funds. Now, uh, this speaks to other funds that we have for disaster. What other funding sources, federal funding sources are we looking at? Uh, there's, there's recovery funds that have been provided by uh, Health and Human Services, the EPA, um, the Commerce. There's, there's a number of other federal funding sources out there that's being provided for the, that was provided for the recovery time. Okay, and so we would, Mr. Chairman, I just want to wrap up. 
And so you, you we, can conclude we would with be one question. Thank you. We would now be changing for all of those disaster funding who don't have a contracts, who don't have a problem with our law. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Joseph. Uh, colleagues, I want to thank you for a long day, um, for all the questions that you have asked. I also want to thank Senator you. Blyden, Senator Blyden, you're Senator recognized. BLA. Senator Blyden, you're Senator recognized. You skipped me. What's, what's up with that? I don't know. I really don't know. Because he's a reason, so that's why. Wow. You're, you're recognized, Senator <laughs> Blyden. we we'll give you a little extra time. OMG. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, please be succinct with your response. Um, this first it, question no. is for um, Optima Ecom. Uh, have you ever seen a VA government agency structure a contract where GRT was a pass through and not expected to be incorporated into other costs? Have you? Scott and Winner Ecom? No. John Grant, Optim? No. Okay, so let me ask um, Ms. Clendenin and or Ms. Octolin. How many um, other contracts does ACAM and APTIM have with the territory within um, disaster area when it comes to disaster work? Do we know? Average. Uh, I think uh, the ACAM and APTIM worked on the schools, those are the temporary work with the schools that's closed out. They still have an open contract with Wang F. Louis Hospital. APTIM does um, for Wang F. Louis Hospital. And, and in any of those contracts, are they seeking? Uh, any type of reimbursement on GRT? No. So the next question is then, uh, why uh, the other contracts don't have the same problem as the STEP program? Because I think I've been stating before that the, the ambiguity in the HFA contract doesn't exist anywhere else. Say that again? The ambiguity in the HFA contract does not exist. HFA contract with Optum and AECOM does not exist anywhere else in the so recovery. The question is, question is, why did HFA feel they had to go into a special contract when it comes came to the step program? I cannot answer that. Um, I think that and it that was that it was in implied. I don't think that the HFA expected my conversations with Mr. Griffith throughout trying to resolve this never expected that GRT would be included as one of those pass through costs. I think the exhibit that they represented outlined the types of costs that they want, they expected would be included in that. Time. That's the problem and hence why, hence why we are here and legislation came forward. Mr. Chair, in closing, can I have um, the young man from AECOM respond? And thank you so much for the time. Scott, I don't want to and there's been so much paperwork, you may not be aware of it, but in February 2nd, 2019, we, we we received, uh, and Scott Edelman AECOM, and there's been so much paperwork. It's four years. It, we've got 300 feet of invoices, so there's a lot. Of, so not everyone knows, but we received uh, an email from Daryl Griffith, a director at the time, on February 2nd, 2019. Quote, it is my goal to have AECOM reimbursed for GRT? GRT. You have several um, correspondence since if, then, Mr. If, Williams. One, one minute, we can't have one minute, Ms. Williams. One minute, Ms. Williams. One minute, Ms. Elliman. One minute, one minute. If somebody's recognized, you have to allow them to speak. Um, those others that are testifying can't rebut or in the middle of their conversation uh, speak. So you are allowed to speak, Ms. Williams, Dr. Lane. Let's allow Mr. Elliman to speak. You may conclude. Mr. Elliman, you may continue. Thank you, Cindy. I was basically through. I basically said that the, the entire sentence said, quote, from Director Griffith, it is my goal to have AECOM reimbursed for GRT if FEMA allows us to put it in the PW, quote. And FEMA has demonstrated in February of 2018, April 2021, that they have a line item in their mm -hmm. estimates for, P for GRT. Over. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, legal counsel, have you been able to get the information that was requested uh, from Senator James and also Senator Donna Fred Gregory? And let us know which one you're reporting on first. Yes, Mr. Chair. I can um, first speak to CFR 200.302. You may proceed. And I would, I would, thank you. I, I would ask Senators 
to the chair to send it to Jane. Is there a specific question uh, with no. respect to this section that you want me to respond to, sir? Is that the right number, Senator James? Yes. Uh, yes, my question was, Mr. Hellman, if I'm not, I think it's Hellman, made mention that there is CFR 200-470. Okay, one, one minute. I think he's prepared to answer the first one first, right, Attorney Carty? That's correct. You, 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 if I'm Senator That's um, Senator Gregory. Fred Gregory asked Fred about 200.470. No. No. Vice versa? Vice versa, yes. Okay, all right. So, I apologize, sir. So go ahead and answer the first one, 200. Sure, I, I just did it in numerical order. Uh, 200.302, it, it's entitled financial management. And the, it, it, it has a subsection A or section A and a, and a section B. Uh, the, the section A speaks to the requirement that each state must expend and account for the federal award in accordance with the state laws and procedures for expending and accounting for the state's own funds. In addition, the states and other non-federal entities, financial management systems, including records documenting compliance with federal statutes, regulations, and the terms and conditions of the federal award, must be sufficient to permit the preparation reports required by general and program-specific terms and conditions, and the tracing of funds to a level of expenditures adequate to establish that such funds have been used according to federal statutes, regulations, and the terms and conditions of the federal award. And then subsection, or I should say section B, speaks to um, the requirement that, in this case, states or non-federal entities must provide to be in compliance with section A. So I think the, the first sentence of subsection A speaks to what it appears to be the intent of this um, section that says each state must expend and account for the federal award in accordance with state laws and procedures for expending and accounting for the state's own funds. So your interpretation? So with the permission of the chair, then I'd move to, unless there's something else, I'd move to CFR 200.470. You may proceed. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, Council. Yes, I'm just pulling it up. Right, 2 CFR 200.470 um, speaks specifically to the value added tax. Um, and, and it speaks, it, it defines it um, as taxes that a governmental unit is legally required to pay or allowable, except for self -assess assessed taxes that disproportionately affect federal programs or changes in tax policies that disproportionately affect federal programs. And then the, the, that is in, in section A, one. And then two speaks to um, gasoline taxes, motor vehicle fees, and other taxes that are in effect. User fees for benefits provided to the federal government are allowable. And then A3 specifically says, this provision does not restrict the authority of the federal awarding agency to identify taxes where federal participation is inappropriate, where the identification of the amount of unallowable taxes would, re, would require an inordinate amount of effort, the cognizant agency for indirect costs may accept a reasonable approximation thereof. And then the subsection B speaks to nonprofit organizations and so forth, which I, I, it's not applicable in this instance, it's, it appears. So in layman term? Again, big pardon? In layman term, what does it mean? Okay. Well, I guess, before I say the layman term, what is the specific question with respect to point 470? Senator James? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is, uh, Mr. Hellman referenced that under CFR 20470, that they're eligible to be reimbursed for these types of programs. 
So what I'm asking the ter uh, chief legal counsel is to interpret interpret it for us and let us know that if this applies, if this section applies or goes hand in hand with the bill that is before us. The bill that is before us, based on CFR section 200.470, what is stated in this section, does it go hand in hand with the intent of this legislation that is before us? Legal counsel, should the chair to legal counsel? Does yeah, it make the gross receipt taxes applicable? Under this I, section? I, quite frankly, Yes, through the chair to Senator James. Quite frankly, I, 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 in reading, and this is a very quick review of this um, for the purposes of answering the inquiry. Reading um, CFR 200.470, I don't know that, as I read it, it necessarily applies to the question at hand. I believe, from my reading, that CFR 200.302 that I referred to earlier is more applicable to this, to, to this instance because... It, it requires that, um, as I read earlier, that there is consistency if for any reimbursement with what the state law would require. That said, to the extent that the Virgin Islands, this piece of legislation were adopted um, by this body and then enacted into law by the governor, it would then allow for the itemization of gross receipts. So as I read 200.302, that to me would, I, I am reading that, that to be, would uh, um, be consistent or allow because there is um, consonance between what the federal government would allow and if this bill were enacted into law, it would be, there would be some synergy between the two, the bill and what um, 200.302 would allow. That's it, that's it, that's it. Value added tax here, um, it basically indicates that, um, Taxes that a governmental entity is legally required to pay are allowable. So it, it again, it, to me, as I'm reading this, and, and and obviously I want to do a little more research, but just reading it as a cursory level, I don't know that that speaks specifically to what we've been discussing here this evening. I believe the first section that I read is more applicable, and assuming that our law is amended to allow for this, it would appear that it would not in any way violate to, to um, CFR 200. Point three zero two. Thank you uh, so much for that analysis. And like I said before, colleagues, I want to thank you for a very um, long day. I want to thank all uh, the testifiers for putting uh, their testimony um, on the record. I'm going to allow for Attorney Dudley, Dana Clendenin, and Adrian Williams Octoline to put and uh, Scott Elliman and Apton to put a closing statement on the record. Let's go 30 seconds, and then we're going to take a quick recess, and then we'll come back and make a motion on the bill. So let's start with um, Attorney Dudley. I'm Adrian Dudley, Dudley Rich, LLP. My closing statement is that I know that the senators are well aware of the fix that the territory has been in with respect to repair, creating resilience, rebuilding, and creating new ventures and new programs, products, and structures. And in doing that, we have to be aware that our territory must be hospitable to whatever requirements come down the road for us to receive the various funds that are being made available to us, not just disaster recovery. And as I understand from Director Williams Octolin, there is still disaster recovery money left to pay these bills and to be spent otherwise. She can correct me if I'm wrong. But the point I'm trying to make is we need to have a hospitable environment for companies to do business here, all of them. Because whenever new money comes in to do anything, it benefits our economy because there is a multiplier effect for every dollar that comes here because it circulates at least three times. Thank you. 
Thank you, Council. Mr. Edelman. Okay. Scott Edelman of AECOM. I just want to thank all the senators for your time and patience today. I want to thank uh, ODR, HFA. Uh, we've worked collaboratively together to collect hundreds of millions of dollars, and we still have a way to go yet. And uh, I know, I know, we can do it. You know, coming through here. So um, on this particular issue, I, I am open to, in essence, correcting past sins through an administrative or a legislative way. I really want to avoid legislative, but I also think that that there's a um, a potential for the future to try to get you on a better um, competitive state, competitive level with the states if this bill is passed. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Mr. Grant. Thank you, Chairman. John Grant from Apton. Apton's very proud of what we've done and achieved in supporting the territory. And we've always done the right thing. We paid many of our subs and local vendors many years before we were paid. We completed 35 roofs and houses after the end of the contract period, even recognizing that we may not get paid for the work, but it was the right thing to do. All we ask is that the government of the Virgin Islands stands behind the contract in which we're entitled to be reimbursed for these costs as any other normal cost and stand to do that for us. I worry that if this doesn't happen, then the territory will lose the opportunity to have future APTIMs, AECOMs, and others supporting the territory. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Ms. Williams, Octoline. Yeah, thank you again for the opportunity to, to, dis, to discuss this bill. Um, the territory has worked very hard to get the funds. We've been working for years to be able to pay these contractors because it was important to us. And we know that there's still uh, a long ways to go we, as we have currently have an appeal before FEMA that we're working through. But what we cannot do is create legislation that adversely affect the recovery and drive the cost of the recovery. We are struggling now to get bids and costs in that are reasonable that will allow us to utilize the funding. And anything that we do that will put us in a position that to have clawbacks is something that we cannot do. I can commit to trying to find or continue to find a resolution to this matter, but it cannot be one that will jeopardize the future and our ability to rebuild and continue the transformation that's happening in the territory. Again, thank you for the opportunity and we will continue to work collaboratively. Thank you, Director. Acting Director Clendenin. Sure. Thank you, Senator. And in the spirit of keeping it real, as Senator Blyden said earlier, this bill does not address still our Tier 3 and Tier 4 contractors who cannot benefit from this bill, who's not before you today. And as Attorney Adrian Dudley said today in her own words, this only benefits a narrow class of individuals today thereby being considered special interests. Thank you for the time. Thank you for having such an open mind. Colleagues, we're going to take a two-minute recess. Yes.
One, two. One, two. The Committee of Finance is back on the record. Uh, do I hear a motion and bill number 34 0197? Senator Blyden, motion. motion. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I move that bill number 34 0197 and act amending title 33, Virgin Islands Code, sub title 1, part 1, chapter 3, section 43, subsection E, relating to the submittal of bills or invoices that separately state go to receive taxes to account for the receipt and distribution of federal assistance to the government of the Virgin Islands and related payments to its contractors be held in this committee for further consideration. I so move. A motion made by Senator Blyden. Second. Seconded by Senator Saro. Roll call. Senator Marvin A. Blyden. Yay. Senator Blyden, yay. yay. Senator yay. Samuel Carillon. Senator yay. Carillon, absent. Senator Dwayne M. DeGraff. Yes. Senator DeGraff, yay. Senator yes. Donna A. Fred Gregory. No. Senator Fred Gregory, nay. Senator Javon <laughs> E. James Sr. Yeah. Senator James Sr., yay. Senator Janelle K. Saru. Yes. Senator Saro, yay. Senator Kurt A. Vialet. Yes. Senator Vialet, yay. Mr. Chair, you have five yays, one nay, one absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Bill number 34 0197, and I commend in Title 33, Virgin Islands Code, Subtitle 1, Part 1, Chapter 3. Section 43, subsection E, relating to the submittal of bills or invoices that separately state gross receipt taxes to account for the receipt and distribution of federal assistance to the government of the Virgin Islands and related payment to its contractors will be held in this committee until the call of the chair. Uh, colleagues, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here, individuals who have been here with us from noon testifying. Thank you for your testimony. Central staff, uh, media, who has a late Friday night, which isn't expected. We'll try to make sure this doesn't happen again on a Friday night. I want to thank uh, the members of the legislature um, who have made this meeting a reality today. The Committee of Finance is hereby adjourned.